The U.S. House began debate today on a spending bill for security and reconstruction efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan. While that was going on, the House Rules Committee was meeting to discuss amendments to the bill that the House will consider tomorrow. This first portion's a little under five hours. here for uh, consideration of H.R. 3289, the Supplemental Appropriation Bill for Defense and for the Reconstruction of Iraq and Afghanistan for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2003, and for other purposes. And uh, let me uh, begin by saying that we are um, very fortunate to have the distinguished chairman and the ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations with us today. We know that this is a, a very important piece of legislation. It's gotten a great deal of attention. I know it enjoys strong bipartisan support. And uh, we uh, uh, appreciate the fact that we've been able to obtain a unanimous consent agreement to proceed with uh, general debate uh, on the uh, House floor for the six hours that uh, we have prescribed for this. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, an amendment process, which I know will be uh, very uh, interesting. And uh, we appreciate the hard work that has been put in by uh, so many of our members. And so let me begin by uh, welcoming first the distinguished chairman of the committee and encourage you to push, encourage you to push that little button there that will turn the microphone on so that our audience will be able to uh, enjoy this. And thank you for your hard work. And please proceed as you see fit. And whatever prepared remarks you have will appear in the entirety in their record unless there is an objection, which there is none. So we'll do that. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, as usual, I appreciate the opportunity to be before this very distinguished uh, Rules Committee of the House of Representatives. Uh, today, as you point out, we're considering a supplemental appropriations bill, H.R. 3289. Uh, last week, the Committee on Appropriations ordered this legislation reported by a vote of 47 to 14. The bill recommended by the committee provides total discretionary supplemental appropriations of 86.9 billion dollars for reconstruction activities in both Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as funding for our military presence in both countries. We've had numerous hearings and briefings to better understand the President's request. We have scrubbed this request and made significant changes and what we consider to be improvements. The bill prioritizes funding for urgent needs for security, power, drinking water, health care, and infrastructure. Included in this number is $64.8 billion for national defense, our troops in the field, $18.6 billion for Iraq relief and reconstruction, and $1.2 billion for Afghanistan relief and reconstruction. I wanted to highlight a few of the differences between uh, this bill and the President's request uh, that I think the committee would be interested in. First, with regard to Iraq relief and reconstruction, there have been a number of questions about the Coalition Provisional Authority, or CPA, which is uh, administered by Ambassador Bremer. The CPA is in charge of the largest foreign assistance program since the Marshall Plan. Whether health care or electric power or water treatment or democracy building, all of these activities are under the supervision of the Coalition Provisional Authority. These are not military items. They are civil issues and foreign assistance issues relating to the reconstruction of Iraq. And I would emphasize, Mr. Chairman, that we are not reconstructing something that we destroyed during the war. We are reconstructing things that Saddam Hussein allowed to deteriorate to the detriment of his people over years and years of, of abuse and neglect. The mark provides a direct appropriation of $858 million to the CPA for their operating expenses. The request had asked that these funds be provided in the Army operation and maintenance accounts, uh, but we thought there was more accountability if we set a, a, a specific section of the bill to provide for those funds. The mark provides transfer authority for up to 1% of funds provided in the Iraqi Relief and Construction Fund for unanticipated expenses of the CPA. Uh, that would not increase the amount of money available to them 
it would just allow them to have some transfer authority within the overall number. We have not altered the reporting relationship of Ambassador Bremer to the President through the Secretary of Defense. Uh, we have prohibited funding to be administered by any official who is not answerable to Congress, another area of accountability and transparency. The bill includes a prohibition on the use of any funds in this act to be used to pay Iraq's foreign debts. All of the funds provided here are in direct grants. Uh, there's no loan authority provided for a number of reasons. A provision is also included to limit the use of non-competitive contracts in the reconstruction and relief funds for Iraq. The provision preserves the prerogative of the President to waive the requirement for full and open competition in certain circumstances as already outlined in applicable federal procurement regulations. The provision requires the executive branch to provide notice and justifications to Congress when the authority is exercised. We did not fund $50 million that had been requested for buildings, equipment, and vehicles in support of Iraq's traffic police. We did not provide $300 million for the construction of two additional new prisons at $50,000 per bed. We have provided, however, $100 million for a medium security prison. We did not provide $153 million for improving the solid waste management programs, including the procurement of 40 trash trucks at $50,000 each. We did not provide $4 million for a nationwide numbering scheme. 9 million for postal information architecture and zip codes, and or 10 million to modernize the business practices of the Iraqi television and radio industry. We did not provide 100 million to build seven new housing communities. We did not provide 150 million to initiate a new 500 million to 700 million children's hospital in Basra. However, uh, instead of uh, building one major hospital, that many Iraqis would have difficulty even getting to, we channeled these funds to modernize current medical facilities scattered throughout Iraq. We have funded $793 million for local and regional health clinics and hospitals and equipment throughout Iraq, meaning that the, the health providers would be available throughout the country rather than in one central location. We did provide $200 million requested. Uh, I, I take it back. I, we did not provide $200 million requested to create an American-Iraqi Enterprise Fund. With regard to Afghanistan relief and reconstruction, we have included $375 million above the President's request with the intent of showing tangible improvement in the security and quality of life of most Afghans by the summer of 2004. Included our funds above the request for schools and education, private sector development and power generation to assist the central government of Afghanistan, including elections and improved governance. The mark also includes $245 million for peacekeeping in Liberia that was not requested by the President at the time of, that the request was sent to Congress. We have included the bulk of the President's request for national defense, uh, with some differences. Some of the differences from the request include the following. Our mark increases funds to purchase body armor, special armor plate inserts for the clearing of unexploded ordnance and improved communications and replacement equipment. But I want to go back to the body armor. Uh, it is uh, almost a tragedy that we were sending U.S. soldiers into combat without body armor. There's no excuse for that. The Congress has provided more than adequate money. We have included additional funding uh, in this bill uh, to provide body armor. Uh, and it, 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 Mr. Chairman, in my opinion, it is just not right to send soldiers into this kind of a hostile situation and not provide the armor and the special plates that go into the armor uh, as they clear unexploded ordnance and as they provide security and try to pacify the country. The mark also provides funding for the contracting of civilian security guards to replace reservists currently performing these duties at Army installations. The Army has indicated this provision would permit the demobilization of from 7 to 10,000 Guard and Reserve component soldiers. 
And I think this is important because in many cases, our Guard and Reserve soldiers have been there longer than the active duty troops. And they uh, creating problems for the reserves, the, the, the reservists, the guardsmen, and the, their, their work, their, their employers, their businesses. And so we hope that this will help get them home quicker. In addition, we include $563 million that was not requested by the administration for recovery and repairs to military facilities damaged by Hurricane Isabel, and that also includes uh, the United States Coast Guard. Now, Mr. Chairman, you're going to decide how the House should consider this legislation. Your committee uh, will decide that and let, us, let the House work its will. I ask, however, that this committee not dramatically change the substance or the focus of this bill through the rules process. Uh, it's a good bill. It will be controversial. I urge support for it, and I urge the Rules Committee to provide a rule. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Young. We appreciate your hard work, and I want to say uh, uh, on a couple of things on a personal note. First, uh, the effort that you and uh, Beverly have put into dealing with uh, our troops who have come home and the responsibility that they face uh, in dealing with medical costs is something that uh, I greatly, greatly appreciate, and I know all of my colleagues do as well, the phenomenal leadership that you've shown there. And also, I should tell you that the, uh, the governor-elect of California enjoyed your conversation, uh, which he uh, conveyed to me and appreciated the, the call that you made to him. So with that, uh, we're happy Mr. to recognize Chairman, before you, if you just yield a second, uh, the new governor of California actually visited with Beverly and I. Uh, I know and, he did. He uh, told me about this. And participated in awarding Purple Hearts sometime, actually before he was a, even a candidate for any political office. So uh, we had a great exactly. deal of respect for his willingness to, to visit our troops and to, to be real. I mean, he was very, I know very we appreciate genuine, that. very honest, and very uh, uh, compassionate with our soldiers. And he appreciated your call. So thank you. Mr. Obi, happy to have you. Mr. Chairman, I will not mention what happened to the Cubs last night. <laughs> 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 well, I just know that we have. We thought it was pretty decent ourselves from Florida. Yeah. You know, we have an impossible St. Louis Cardinal fan here, and so I just don't want to get into it. But uh, let me get to the subject at hand. Um, we have already appropriated some seventy-nine billion dollars uh, in in prior action to deal with uh, the war on terrorism and to deal with the Iraqi war. And now we're being asked to provide $87 billion more. And the cost of this operation is being revealed to us on the installment plan. Uh, it has been conservatively estimated that by the time this operation is over, <coughs> we will have spent uh, at least $300 billion and probably more. I think when we face that kind of a prospective obligation, that the Congress has an obligation to the taxpayers and to the administration to review these requests with a fine-tooth comb so that we know that that money is being spent in uh, the context of a policy that has a reasonable chance of success and in a way which recognizes legitimate concerns of taxpayers. I didn't vote to go to war in Iraq. I voted to require the President to come back to Congress for another vote if the United Nations did not uh, sign on to his operation. But that's beside the point today. The country made the decision to go, and now we incur certain obligations, and we experience certain consequences as a result. And we can't walk away from those. We can't repeal the last five or six months. So I do not agree with those who say that the way to solve this problem is for us to just decide that uh, our obligation is over to leave. Uh, we've, we've helped to create certain conditions uh, in Iraq, and we need to uh, try to patch them up. But having said that, uh, I think uh, just because we believe in marriage 
doesn't mean that you have to offer uh, an invitation to get married to every person of the opposite sex who enters the room. And uh, just as uh, e even though we recognize the need to deal with uh, the uh, uh, problem at hand in Iraq, that doesn't mean we have to accept any financial package that's tossed on the table. We need to uh, discriminate and discern whether or not uh, the package is wired together to produce an effective result. I, pro I expect that I will, in the end, vote against the proposition before us because I feel we have not been given adequate information either about the funding <coughs> that we've provided in the past and how that's been spent. And we certainly have not been given adequate information about how, uh, how uh, our, about what the administration expects us to have to spend over the next five years. So I, uh, I regard with minimum high regard the specifics of the package before us and even uh, less regard uh, the refusal of the administration to give us uh, the full information about what we can expect to incur. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what I want to do uh, is to at least offer an amendment which says if we're hell-bent on spending 80, $87 billion, then there is probably a better way to spend it. And so I come here to ask the committee to make in order uh, an amendment to the committee bill. Now, I congratulate the committee for the changes they've made in the president's package. I note that uh, most of the uh, chairman's testimony uh, was aimed at uh, discussing the differences between the White House package and the package before us now uh, out of the committee. Uh, I welcome those changes, but the fact is that we are still asked to spend almost $97 billion on this operation by the committee bill. The amendment that I seek to offer uh, and the rule I seek from this committee uh, would give us the same opportunity to offer amendments that was afforded the minority in the Senate. And uh, if we get that opportunity, we would provide the amendment as follows. We would reduce Iraqi reconstruction funds by uh, uh, between four and a half and five billion dollars. We would use uh, those funds for other purposes. We would add $4.6 billion to the military portion of the bill to provide for needs not adequately met by the administration request. Some of those would be as follows. Uh, we would provide a quality of life initiative for the troops, for instance. Right now, 80 percent of American troops in Iraq uh, have to use putrid water. Uh, we get reports of whole units experiencing dysentery because the administration asked for enough money to provide <coughs> Uh, a, a water cleanup for only one of the nine uh, bases where, where, where uh, American troops are stationed. I think that's disgraceful. I think we ought to deal with the entire problem and we add the money to try to do that. Secondly, we would add money for, for pre-deployment health and dental screening of Guard and Reserve personnel who are called active duty. Right now, the, those, uh, those, uh, that personnel has to uh, incur those costs themselves. We don't think that's right. Thirdly, we would extend post-deployment health coverage uh, from the 60 days uh, that uh, returning troops now have to 180 days. Uh, and uh, we expand the ability of servicemen to be able to, uh, to uh, phone home uh, through uh, expansion of prepaid phone cards and a number of other uh, actions. We also uh, try to squarely face up to the cost that we will incur for reconstituting our military uh, 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 forces and units. The services will tell you that it will cost about $20 billion to repair and replace the equipment used in Iraq. Yet the administration has asked for only about $2 billion to cover those costs. We are trying to provide in our amendment uh, the full amount that the three services indicated they could use this year. 
I don't believe it's wise to leave Bradleys and tanks and a wide variety of other uh, military equipment sitting in an unusable state for the next two years because the administration is not fessing up now to the cost of fixing that, uh, that equipment. So we try to provide for, the, for that funding. Then we uh, also try to recognize that uh, the administration, frankly, if you take a look at some of the things uh, that ha uh, you have in a reconstruction package, it looks more like something put together as a term paper for, a, for an MBA candidate rather than someone with a shrewd understanding of the territory. And uh, as a result, you see a huge reliance upon huge multinational uh, corporations to provide uh, contract or contracting arrangements. If you take a look at uh, one example, uh, General uh, Petraeus was told by his engineers that it would cost $15 million to rebuild a cement plant in Iraq. After he consulted with the locals, he got it up and running for 80,000 bucks. Now, we think there are considerable savings to be uh, made if you use the knowledge of Iraqis about how to solve Iraqi problems rather than hiring big shot American, German, French, Italian, and you name it, companies to go in there offering high tech solutions to low tech problems. Um, I would point out this package will spend on a per capita basis in Iraq. 10 times as much as we spent on a per capita basis for all of the uh, people in, in, in uh, Europe under the Marshall Plan. Uh, you know, we are providing a huge percentage increase in federal aid, I mean in, in, in American aid to this country. And while I don't begrudge uh, uh, aid, I do, I do uh, resist substantially uh, the apparent efforts of some of the bureaucrats at the Pentagon to provide that aid in the most expensive possible way. So another thing we do is to, is to, uh, is to take the remaining money that's left in reconstruction, the 14 billion that's left in reconstruction after our amendment, and we divide that up 50-50, with half of it going uh, in grants, as the administration proposes, but then we try to do what Senator Hutchison uh, is trying to do in the Senate, which is to take the other half and internationalize this problem by giving this money into a special account at the World Bank to be matched uh, by three and a half billion dollars of international foreign source contributions for a total of $10 billion. <coughs> That can in turn be capitalized by the World Bank to provide four times that amount, uh, that amount of deliverable aid to Iraq at less cost to the taxpayers. There are many uh, efforts to try to convert grants to loans. I don't think that grant versus loan debate is a constructive debate. I think the question ought to be how do you minimize the impact on our taxpayers and maximize the impact in Iraq at the same time. And I think you get there by looking at how you provide a rational mix of loans and grants. So by providing this to the World Bank, as Senator Hutchison does, we, we gain one clear advantage. The World Bank has the opportunity to put its, uh, its loan at the head of the list for uh, repayment, and it provides an incentive uh, to uh, to uh, have other countries discount prior loans to Iraq uh, so that the countries who are participating in this operation with the United States will be able to, uh, to make certain that the money is eventually returned to the World Bank. Um, in addition to that, we provide um, two other items here. We, uh, uh, in terms of increased accountability, we require notification of non-competitive contracting and a GAO report on each and every non-competitive contract uh, that, uh, that is provided under this provision. And most importantly, we pay for it. And the way we pay for it is by saying to the most well-off 1% of the folks in this country 
that instead of getting the supersized jumbo tax cut that they have been provided under the President's tax package, we would scale back their tax cut so that, in effect, they would get $9,570, which is uh, roughly what, uh, what the largest tax cut would be for, e for any other American in this country. Uh, $9,000 tax cut is nothing to sneeze at. What it means is that the people in that top 1 percent are not being excluded from tax cuts. They are simply being told that they would get a tax cut no larger than anybody else got in this country. And I dare say that I think that group of uh, taxpayers is patriotic enough to say to us that they think that's the right thing to do. I don't see why we ought to pass this bill off onto, uh, onto our kids. So, uh, and then we do one more thing. General Shinseki warned us that we should not proceed to have a 12-division strategy if we have a 10-division army. We take uh, some of the money that we save from Reconstruction, and we admit candidly that we aren't going to be able to fix the screwed-up rotation schedules for Guard and Reserve Forces, and we aren't going to be able to be uh, in a state of sufficient readiness to deal with other threats to our national interest from sources such as Korea without a larger army. And so we provide the ability for the administration to expand <coughs> the army by 20,000 people. Uh, if we don't do that, we are continuing to have worldwide ambitions uh, that uh, require uh, more troops than we actually have uh, to, uh, to put in the field. And I think uh, that means we're not just trying to fool other people, we're trying to fool ourselves. So it seems to me that this is a responsible uh, way to approach the problem if you're going to provide this kind of money. And it is a way to minimize the impact on the taxpayers at the same time. So I, I, I recognize this would require a waiver uh, of several rules. The bill itself has a waiver for a number of rules. And I would ask that uh, we be provided the same opportunity that was provided the minority in the Senate. Mr. Obi, thank you very much for your remarks and thank you for your uh, compliment. Uh, I join with you in congratulating Chairman Young for the work product of the committee and the improvements that they've made on this uh, important measure. Your proposal is uh, an interesting one. Uh, part of it, as you well know, has been considered time and time again by this committee. And uh, in fact, I just was uh, looking that uh, seven out of the ten appropriations bills that we've uh, had uh, before us uh, in, in this committee have had recommendations from either you or the ranking minority member to uh, deal with the funding question as uh, you have uh, uh, once again proposed here today. And so we appreciate your consistence in uh, coming before us with that uh, innovative and thoughtful uh, approach. Um, I'm not a proponent of it, in case you were wondering, but uh, it is, uh, it is uh, an interesting one. And thank uh, you. Um, both again for taking this issue of the reconstruction of Iraq as seriously have. And thank you again, uh, Mr. Obi, for your statement that, uh, that cutting and running would not be the wise thing for us to do at this juncture. I appreciate that. Mr. Linder. Questions. Thank you both very much. Mr. Frost. Mr. Young, to uh, follow on the uh, Chairman's comments, um, you've heard Mr. Obi's uh, request for, a, uh, uh, for an alternative. Um, do you, uh, what's your view as to whether he should be able to offer his uh, proposal? And I'm not, I haven't read the amendment, but if it is a germane amendment, then I think under the open rule that you would provide. Well, as uh, you know, uh, it would require waivers just as your bill is required. Of course waivers. it would because it, uh, it also deals with taxation. Well, the gentleman uh, yield. We, we, don't, we do not have any jurisdiction in our committee for Right. Taxation. If the gentleman would yield, yeah, yeah. I, I thank my friend for yielding, and I would simply say that uh, what we would propose doing would be to simply move ahead with uh, what has been a standard open amendment process for consideration of an appropriations bill that would protect the bill, as was done when you were in the majority as well. Uh, so I just want to make it clear that that's what we're considering. But, I thank uh, my friend for yielding. And I would ask the chairman, uh, then you would uh, not make in order any uh, provision that would pay for any of this, as Mr. Obi has proposed. 
Uh, I always say to you, Mr. Frost, we don't we don't have the jurisdiction in our committee to deal with that issue. Uh, well, this, are, is a, this is an entirely different jurisdiction. Well, as the gentleman knows, there is very strong feeling that the uh, size of the deficit has gotten out of hand and that uh, I supported the military action against Iraq, but I also would like to see us pay for what we're doing, at least pay for a portion of it, uh, rather than passing the cost of this on to uh, my children and my grandchildren. And I, that's what Mr. Obie is trying to achieve, is to give us the opportunity to vote in the House on whether or not to pay for some or all of this $87 billion. I think in, in the, uh, uh, the way that Mr. Obie wants to do this, uh, I think if he wanted to introduce a separate bill, uh, he may or may not get that bill put on the floor. But Of course, uh, this is the uh, only option. Ta tax measures on an on appropriations bill just don't go. Of course, this will be the only opportunity this Congress will have to vote on whether or not to pay for all or part of this $87 billion rather than adding it to the deficit. I would suspect, to be totally honest with you, that uh, there is not going to be any offsets for this supplemental appropriations bill. Uh, this is an emergency. The President asked for it to be considered as an emergency. And you, you mentioned, Mr. Frost, uh, talking about having future generations pay for it. But let me tell you what I think this bill is and what I think that this effort in Iraq is, is to guarantee future generations <coughs> that they will not have to worry about flying on an airplane that's going to be hijacked. Or they will not have to worry about being in a building that terrorists are attacking and, and killing American citizens. I say this is a, the whole Iraqi investment is an investment in the future of our children, grandchildren, and future generations to come to live in a nation that is free from the threat of, threat of terrorism and free from living in fear. One of the basic four freedoms announced during President Roosevelt's term, freedom from fear. And that's what we're guaranteeing here with what President Bush is leading in Iraq and Afghanistan, is to eliminate the threat of fear Mr. Frost. I mean, see, if, I, if I may, and I'll be happy to yield a minute in a moment, <coughs> Mr. Obie, but Mr. Young, you're lecturing the wrong person. Uh, I voted for the use of force. Oh, I it's know my, that. It's my intention to vote for the $87 billion. I would just like to see us pay for it. Uh, I, when I visit in my own district in Texas, Republicans as well as Democrats come up to me and say, why are we running up the deficit to do this? We think this is the right thing to do, but why aren't, well, why aren't we willing to pay for it on a current basis? And that's the only thing that any of us are asking. No one is suggesting, at least I'm not suggesting, that we shouldn't have gone in there or that we shouldn't <coughs> be providing the money for the troops and for reconstruction. I'm only urging that this Congress have the opportunity to pay for this rather than passing it on to my children and grandchildren. And again, my response is uh, you're a longtime member of this committee and you know that you do not put tax measures on an appropriations bill. It just, it doesn't happen. Yeah, Mr. Obi wanted to comment on that. I thank you for the opportunity. Um, I mean, nobody needs any lectures about the need to uh, resist terrorism. Mm -hmm. We've done that across the board uh, for a long time. The question is, what is the most responsible way to do that? I want to point out that if we don't pay for it, not only are we going to be adding $87 billion to the public debt, but each and every year for the next 20 years, we will be paying at least $4 billion additional in interest payments. And to put that in perspective, since we are having a little trouble passing the Labor, Health, and Education Appropriation Bill because it short sheets education and health care, just the added interest payments that we would incur if we don't face up to this responsibility to pay for this endeavor, just those added interest payments would exceed all of the money that we spend each year for research on Alzheimer's, autism, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, diabetes, Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, multiple sclerosis, and all forms of kidney disease combined. So there are costs to not paying for this which are serious and long-term. And if we were mature and adult, we would face up to those costs now. Right now, the answer that we're getting if we don't do this is, give me my grandkids' credit card so I can say, charge it. 
Uh, Mr. Young, I have a couple of other specific questions, if I may. I think we have covered this particular subject. Um, there is an amendment uh, being sought by Mr. Stupak. Uh, this amendment, this is the summary of the amendment provided us by the majority. Uh, it requires all reconstruction funds provided under this legislation to be in the form of, a, of repayable loans, not grants, uh, with Iraqi oil revenues as collateral. Now, I know that you don't support this proposal, but would you, uh, do you have any objection to this being made in order by this committee so the entire House could express its view on this subject? Well, I'm not sure why he would need uh, a special rule for that purpose. If, if I may, uh, we, Mr. Chairman, we, I believe that this, is, uh, this would be determined to be what's called legislation in an appropriations bill, and so that it would need uh, a waiver from this committee for the House to vote on it. Well, you, you members of the Rules Committee are far more educated on that uh, than I am, but uh, so you, you'd have to make that decision. We did have several votes on that, at least one vote on that uh, in our committee markup, and the, uh, the vote was not to do that for several reasons. Number one, there, uh, there is no authority in Iraq to whom we could make that loan. Uh, and ever expect repayment. Uh, secondly, uh, there is a donors conference next week in Madrid, Spain, where we are asking other nations to come forward and contribute to the cost of, of uh, rebuilding Iraq. And uh, it would be difficult for us to use any pressure uh, on other countries to, to contribute funds for this purpose uh, if we ourselves were doing it as a loan. So I, I see several problems there, but you won't have to decide that. Uh, I asked for an open rule. Since in the five years that I've chaired this committee, I've never asked you for a closed rule. Well, and as I've you know, I've always believed that a germane amendment should be in order. As you know, an open rule is a technical description which would preclude the opportunity for members to vote on the Stupak amendment or something like that. I do have one other question. I, I recently talked to an army officer who returned from Iraq, from a visit to Iraq. Could I <clears throat> ask those who have more important business to conduct than is in this rules committee to take it outside or turn off your phones, please? I recently talked to an army officer who returned from a visit to Iraq and was told that one of the problems that our troops have is that there is no armor plating on the bottom of our, eight, our Humvees that what, the, uh, what is being done is that sandbags are being stacked up on the bottom of our Humvees, but when a Humvee runs over a landmine, the, sand, the sandbags don't protect the troops, and in fact, that's why some of our troops have been killed in just those uh, type situations. Is there anything in this bill that would provide for the armor plating on the bottom of the Humvees that's lacking right now? There is no specific direction to do that, but there is plenty of money uh, in this bill to do just that. And I would suggest, well, wait a minute, maybe I'm, maybe I'm going to be corrected here for, for that purpose. Oh, I'm advised that there's $180 million in the bill for that purpose. Uh, I knew the money was there, but I didn't know that we specifically directed that. Well, I'm, I'm pleased that that's there. My, I guess my question is, why did we send those vehicles over there in the first place? without armor plating on the bottom of them, making our troops vulnerable to being killed or maimed when they ran over a landmine? I think that question would be properly addressed to the Army. Uh, I have visited almost every soldier and Marine that has come through Walter Reed and Bethesda. Uh, I've heard these complaints. I have taken them up with the military services. Uh, the new chairman, uh, chief of staff of the Army, when I directed that issue to him, not only that issue, but the issue of, of body armor, uh, and told me that if he found an officer in his command sending troops without that kind of protection, since he took command, he'd court-martial them. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think that was a pretty strong statement, but there are other problems. One of the problems are these, these bombs that are exploding when our vehicles approach are bombs that have been planted there and are set off using cell phones. We do have the ability to jam those cell phones, but we don't have enough jammers in the region. So yeah, yeah there are some problems there. There's no doubt about that. And I would tell you, we, we learned about this and some of the other problems by sending our, our teams to Iraq. 
Chairman Colby is here. He's been in the region three times, once in Iraq when he was permitted to go to Iraq. Chairman Lewis from our defense subcommittee took 17 members uh, of uh, the appropriations committee uh, and some <clears throat> uh, not members of the appropriations committee. They divided up into three teams. They covered pretty much the whole country. They learned a lot. We did a hearing after they got back. Chairman Colby held two hearings on his issue. Chairman Nolenberg held, an, held a hearing. So we actually had four hearings, plus having all of these Codells in Iraq, in the field. So we did learn a lot about the problems. Uh, has it been a perfect operation? Well, I think we had a lot of problems. And we have a lot of kids in the hospitals that are paying for those problems. We're doing the very best we can to call attention to them and to fix them. Uh, if I may ask you about one other amendment, and then I'll, I know other members have other questions. Uh, a member of your committee, Ms. Kilpatrick, uh, has, uh, has an amendment that would uh, earmark $40.5 million to the Army Air Force Exchange Service, APHIS. APHIS is headquartered in my congressional district. And this amendment uh, would earmark the money for extraordinary expenses and to provide for necessary goods and services to soldiers, salesmen, uh, sailors, marines, and airmen in forward deployed combat areas. Um, APHIS currently has 12 PXs in Iraq. Uh, plans are uh, underway to open a number of other PXs. Um, so, so far, the Army has not provided any support uh, through appropriated funds for these extraordinary expenses. And APHIS runs those PXs at a loss. Um, uh, as you know, the money generated by APHIS goes into morale and welfare for our troops around the country uh, and around the world. And um, APHIS is being, has been asked to go into this combat area without any uh, reimbursement for losses incurred uh, during the time it's been there. And uh, this, in fact, if, if not reimbursed, will reduce the amount of money made available to our military for morale and welfare. Um, it's my understanding from staff that it is your committee's intention that some money in your bill go to APHIS, though there is no earmark, uh, specific earmark for APHIS. Uh, is that your understanding? That is my understanding, and we were, uh, we were careful to avoid earmarking uh, to the extent that we could. We wanted this bill to be a clean bill, uh, one that dealt specifically with the issues of uh, terrorism, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so, uh, uh, and that's where I thought the other issue, you talked about the uh, uh, putting the armor on the bottom yeah. of the Humvees. We put in the money, uh, but I, wasn't, uh, I was just reminded by staff that we actually specified for that purpose. Is it your understanding, I, I've been told by staff that uh, it's your committee's intention that uh, uh, $30 million uh, go to APHIS. Is that your understanding I, without not, a specific earmark? Yeah, I'm not sure about the amount. But it is your intention that there be a significant amount go to APHIS out of the money appropriate? Uh, an amount. Uh, the, uh, uh, I would only comment, and as I said, APHIS is headquartered in my congressional district. APHIS had PXs on the ground operating in Iraq before the mail was delivered and before the private contractor, Brown and Root, had mess halls. Uh, APHIS was there from the very beginning and has provided extraordinary service to the soldiers in the field. And I, I thank the gentleman for his, the committee's intention that there be some reimbursement to APHIS, and I would hope that would be as much as possible. And I thank the gentleman and would <coughs> say that uh, I appreciate his position on the overall issue. He has always been a very strong supporter of our National Defense Appropriations Bills. And although he has inquired uh, seriously uh, into some of those bills, uh, he's always been a strong supporter. I and I will be that. handling the rule on the floor on this matter tomorrow. Thank you. Mr. diaz Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I have no questions, but I am cognizant of the importance of what we're doing here today. Uh, and I um, can only imagine the amount of work that must have required to bring this uh, forth. And I want to thank the chairman uh, for uh, his hard work. Uh, and uh, have no questions at this time. Ms. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Young, Mr. Obie. It's a pleasure to have you here today on this terrible bill I think that we're talking about. Uh, Congressman Obie, I not only want to thank you for your persistence in trying to 
find a way to pay for this. I appreciate the fact that, uh, that you will come back time and time again to try to do it. It is absolutely beyond my comprehension that we would put the nation at such debt without, when we have the opportunity to pay for it and simply will not accept it. Um, I'm a member of the Coalition of the Willing to Rebuild America. Uh, and part of the legislation saying we want parity on this bill uh, to rebuild part of the United States. I really am flustered by the $20 billion. I want to do anything in the world I can for our troops. Um, and I've written letters and op-ed pieces on what I've heard from parents, that there's, their soldiers don't have enough to drink in 120 degree weather, they, uh, temperature, they don't have enough to eat. I just spoke yesterday at the airport with a young woman who works for TSA, who was former military, and had been sent over to do something at the Baghdad airport. She said she was never clear why. But she talked about how pathetic it was for the Army in particular, and that uh, she had an air-conditioned trailer, and she let some of the Army guys who were stationed working in the Bradley, which is something of a microwave, uh, who, and they were trying to sleep in there. They had no place else to go except to lie down on the sand. Um, it would let them come in in that trailer. And take, it's appalling to me. Um, I was stunned yesterday, too, at one of the things that I read in the New York Times, that there are apparently uh, caches of uh, ammunition all over the country, and we know where they are. But the fact is we don't have enough people to guard them. And the implication story yesterday was that the ammunition is now being used against our military is being dug up from some of these hidden resources and, and used against us. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, this is not the great United States uh, that won the Second World War. And to that end, I think any reference to this in the Marshall Plan is nothing but offensive to me. I may be one of the few people in the room that remember that. But uh, there's simply no comparison to it. Uh, I wanted to comment, too, on what Mr. Obi had said about the enterprising Iraqis trying to do something. I read just today that a few of them had gotten together and set up a whole cell phone industry that was going fairly well, but we shut it down. We shut it down because I think there's something like $19 billion <coughs> or something in here, so we can build one and have one of our very own. Um, it, it strikes me that it almost borders on war profiteering. I've got an amendment today. Uh, to try to uh, clarify what you said about contracting. But the idea that these are no big contracts, they're simply handed out. Uh, one that, that I absolutely, I guess one of my major favorites here is, I think it was $30 million to, treat, to teach 20,000 Iraqis for six months how to speak English. I mean, it was, I, I can't for the life of me understand where these things have come from. Obviously, we have an obligation to rebuild that country. Uh, we don't have an obligation, I don't think, to make it utopia. And since the House controls the purse strings of this federal government, and we've not even been told what the 67, 60 to 70 billion dollars we spent already, what that's been spent for, and I think it's been very difficult for us to try to ascertain what all of this is for, we have to try to explain it to our constituents, and we have to answer to them. And I feel that we've been very inadequately. I was, somebody told me today the White House said that they had briefed every one of our offices. I don't know about other members, but nobody has certainly briefed us. We've not heard anything about it. We've mostly what we've gotten, we've gotten from the newspaper and any other sources that we could scan, scrounge up on where the world this money is going. But I can tell you, as Mr. Frost has said, it's not a partisan issue back in our districts. People are really offended. In my district, the unemployment rate is going up. People are simply out of jobs, and they do not understand why, on top of the money we spend, on top of this money being asked for, and heaven knows how much more, at least a billion dollars a week into the future, we really don't, uh, don't see any end to it. And if we won't at least make an attempt to pay for it, and we're going to stick it to our progeny and descendants, uh, it really is uh, very difficult unless some changes are made in this between now and the final vote for us to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slaughter. Um, Dr. H Dr. Hastings of Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Young and Mr. Obi. I, I want to congratulate you on a product that I think uh, is very timely and one that is obviously needed. I, I didn't see the uh, whole hearing that you had, but I did see parts of it. And, uh, and, and I, I noted, in fact, what struck me with the committee hearing that you had was the 
open debate that you had on a whole variety uh, of issues. And, and, and where obviously, as is more always the case here, there's really honest differences in how this should be approached. But I want to commend you and, and the committee and, and Mr. Obi, uh, uh, although I know that uh, Mr. Obi did not support the, the final product. But nevertheless, uh, I want to congratulate you for getting this out in a timely manner. Uh, I, I noted that it passed with uh, strong bipartisan support. I think that sends a very strong message that is, that is needed not only for our men and women in uniform, but also uh, across the world as to our resolve in finishing this uh, war on terrorism. So I just want to add my, uh, my voice to congratulating you for getting a product, uh, a product out so that we can act on it, get it over to the other body, and, and uh, move on with this, uh, this process. Thank you. If I might, I'd like to thank the gentleman, my friend Doc Hastings, for watching that uh, markup. I have many times, as you well know, in our conferences, invited members to, just to come see what it is that is required to put out an appropriations bill. Uh, you got a little, you got a, this is the first time I think we've ever had a markup uh, that was uh, televised by C-SPAN uh, from start to finish. Uh, and it, it's a good example of the kind of work the committee does. And while Mr. Roby and I often agree, we often disagree. Uh, when, even when we disagree, uh, he helps sharpen our, uh, you know, the, the, the friction there helps, helps sharpen our position so that uh, he, he plays the devil's advocate uh, to our position a lot of, a lot of times. And, but it, it's, it's a working committee. It's a good committee. And I'm proud of all of them, whether they always agree with me or not. Well, I, I, I just like to say that uh, I, I, I started watching it and then I, I kept going because uh, of the way it was run. I, uh, I have to note that every member stood up and was very respectful of others. Uh, sometimes we don't do that in other committees, but you certainly did that in your committee. But uh, the, the product is what's important, and I just want to congratulate you on that. Both Mr. Hastings, I'm worried about you. Um, <laughs> if, if, if if the best use of your time that you can find is to watch the Appropriations Committee, I think I'm going to send you a list of more interesting things to do. <laughs> well, maybe it's my commitment to the whole process, but thank you for the compliment, and I'll take it as that. Thank you. Mr. McGovern. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me, let me thank Chairman Young and Ranking Member Obi for being here today and for their testimony. And, um, and let me also thank you because I think what's before us today um, is better than what the administration originally submitted um, uh, to Congress. So I, I appreciate that fact. Um, let me just also say that, like Mr. Obi, I, I was one of, I was one of uh, many members of this House who voted against uh, the resolution to authorize war in Iraq. And um, having said that, uh, I believe that uh, now that we have gone to war, that we, we have a obliga moral obligation to support our, our troops, our brave men and women who are serving this country with such great distinction. And I think we have a moral obligation uh, to help uh, the people of Iraq rebuild their country. I mean, they did not ask us to invade them. We did. And so I think there is a moral obligation that we follow through with our, with our promises. Um, now, having said that, um, I continue to have a, a number of, of, of concerns. Um, and, um, and I believe, um, you know, uh, that I should also say we, we have a moral obligation to keep faith with the American people and to ask the tough questions and to make sure we're, we're getting this right. Um, you know, our post-war policy in Iraq, uh, like our march to war, in my opinion, continues to act in isolation from a majority of the international community. And that's uh, very troublesome to me. Our, our strategy on the ground, as opposed to on paper, continues to fail to provide the security and safeguards required for reconstruction to move forward successfully. Um, if we don't get that part of it right, then all this reconstruction money is going, to, is going to be wasted. I mean, every time you build a new road, it'll be destroyed. Every time you repair a pipeline, it'll get blown up again. And I don't think the administration, in my opinion, um, quite has a strategy in place uh, to deal uh, with the security situation in Iraq. Um, but I am also concerned, and I want to echo the comments of Mr. Frost and, and Mr. Slaughter, that, uh, that the cost of this um, is, uh, of, this, uh, of this enormous undertaking uh, is not being paid for. I mean, this is a policy that has been carried out off the books. There has been no attempt on the part of this administration or the leadership of this Congress to include Iraq and Afghanistan within the regular budget, even though when the President submitted his fiscal year 2004 budget proposal, he knew we were going to war. 
And even though the Republican leadership knew when it drafted its fiscal year 2004 budget resolution that we were deep into the war and looking down the road at reconstruction needs. And I appreciate uh, Chairman Young's comment that, you know, this is an emergency situation, but the President asked for this, uh, this, uh, this additional $87 billion in a televised address before the American people on September 7th. Uh, it is now October 15th. And I can't believe that in all that time, with all the great minds in this Congress, that committees couldn't work together, that the leadership couldn't kind of coordinate a strategy, that we could come with a package here today that would be paid for. I mean, the, this funding um, is not going to come from Iraqi oil reserves, as we were reassured by the administration when Congress voted to go to war and when Congress approved the FY03 supplemental for Iraq in, in April. It's going to come from the pockets of average taxpayers and their children. We still don't even have the remotest projection of the cost to U.S. taxpayers of rebuilding Iraq over the longer term. We received the, as Mr. Obi said, we received the supplemental request piecemeal without a projection of the cost over the next three or five or seven or ten years. I mean, this whole process, in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of my constituents, has, has been a dishonest one. And Congress is still lacking the basic future year projections that we are supposed to have before making any funding decision, let alone decisions of this magnitude. Now, Ranking Member Obi has recommended that Congress pay for this supplemental by a very modest change to the current tax structure, a change that affects only those taxpayers whose income puts them in the top 1 percent of American earners. I mean, the, alter the Republican alternative is that we increase our deficit, that we increase our public debt, both of which are the largest in U.S. history, when just two and a half years ago the budget was in surplus and we were paying down the public debt. Now, I believe if you don't want to go along with Mr. Obie's recommendation, and I'm not directing this at you, Chairman Young, because this really is, a, is, a, is an issue for, the, for the, your leadership and this committee to decide, but if you don't want to go along with Mr. Obie's recommendation, then it is incumbent upon this committee and the Republican leadership to find another way to pay for the supplemental. Uh, but charging the cost of this war to our national credit card and making my kids and your kids and your grandkids pay for it is just plain wrong. I mean, it is irresponsible. The fact that this country is going deeper and deeper into debt, that's a national security issue as well. And so I would, I would hope uh, that this committee would recognize that uh, this is an extraordinary time in the history of our country. We're at, a, we're at war. And we, this committee should, should be um, allowing the maximum amount of flexibility and latitude for members of both parties who have important amendments that impact the policy direction that our country uh, deals how, and how we deal with Iraq. Um, I, I would hope that, um, that, the, uh, that the, this committee, uh, when it comes time to grant a rule, would not uh, adhere to kind of a strict uh, interpretation of the rules which would disallow Mr. Obie and others uh, uh, to be able to offer their amendments. This is too important. Um, and the stakes are too high. And uh, so having said that, I, uh, again, I, I appreciate your efforts, but uh, it, it really is the height of irresponsibility to move this package through Congress without having it paid for. And I think most of our constituents, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, are all scratching their heads wanting to know why we can't get it together. I mean, we've had over a month on this particular package. Well, we can't get it together to find a way to pay for it. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Young, I want uh, to thank you also, as other committee members have done today, to thank you and your committee, the entire committee, both Republicans and Democrats, on your hard work to look at not only the problems uh, that are inherent in winning the war and winning the peace in Iraq, but also those activities which will be required to pay for. Uh, I, in sitting through this hearing, uh, and in listening to the Armed Services uh, hearing that they held where they spoke about several issues. One thing which I have not heard today was there was a question that was related to uh, a statute or a law related to our armed forces who are hurt and in a, host in the ho in a hospital that are having to pay some piece of their money for meals. And I wondered if you could address that for me. Well, I was shocked uh, one day when I learned that uh, a soldier, Marine, uh, airman, uh, any service person wounded in battle, on the battlefield, uh, 
recuperating in a military hospital because of wounds on the battlefield, had to, was charged $8.10 a day for the food they consumed while they were in the hospital. And I thought that was a little outrageous. I thought it was insulting to the uh, trooper, and it was embarrassing to me to have to, uh, number one, admit that I'd never, would never heard of this, and number two, to think that my government uh, had, did, had done that. Uh, actually, in, uh, it was the Congress did it in 1951 uh, for officers, and in 1981, they expanded it to include uh, enlisted personnel. Uh, so as you know, uh, on the uh, Defense Appropriations Committee conference report, uh, we repealed that law. Uh, unfortunately, you can only repeal it for one year, since the appropriation bill is only good for one year. So the House passed another freestanding bill, H.R. 2998, uh, that repealed it permanently. And I'm advised that the Senate will, will uh, follow along quickly uh, to make that a permanent uh, Would repeal. the gentleman yield a moment on that? I'm sorry? Would you yield just a moment sure. to me on that? Thank you, Mr. Young. One yeah. of the questions that several of us had, we all voted for that. I think it's terribly important. That was a unanimous but vote. One of the few unanimous, unanimous votes vote. we had. So we certainly don't want to charge people who sacrifice so much the opportunity to eat. Um, but that resolution did not make it retroactive, even to the beginning of this war, I believe. Isn't that correct? It did so, not make it retroactive. I have suggested to our colleagues in the Senate that if they would like to add an amendment uh -huh. to make it retroactive and send it back here, we could probably convince the House to agree to that amendment. I think we should. I like it because I've been told of soldiers who owe five and six hundred dollars. Uh, it's not enough they lost a leg or an eye or an arm and permanently disfigured it, that we would do that is beyond belief. So I think if I appreciate they, uh, your help I, on that. I believe that if they owe the money and haven't paid it, I don't think they're going to be billed further for it. But under the people new law. who paid, though, should be reimbursed, I yeah. think. Thank you. I, you know, I, actually, I inquired about that in the, in the first place, and they said the records were, were very difficult to ascertain uh, who would receive how much. And uh, so we chose to move as quickly as we could to just repeal the law. But uh, I, uh, some of my friends in the Senate are I believe trying Sessions. to consider ways. Yeah. Uh, there, there's another issue we should be thinking about with respect to meals. Just this week, I talked to a number of servicemen and their wives, uh, people who had been in Iraq, who told me that uh, during the war, uh, a number of them only got one MRE a day, uh, that there were insufficient numbers of meals available for the troops in the field. And when some of the spouses wanted to uh, organize some complaints about it, they were told by higher ops, don't do that. I appreciate the uh, feedback from the gentleman. Uh, continuing on my time, it, it appears as though then that the chairman is going to attempt, notwithstanding the bill that we passed that we're waiting on the Senate to, but that in conference we'll make sure that that would be a part of something that would happen in a conference report if the Senate has not acted by then. I'm concerned about that we get this done, and we've heard testimony today about you know looking at it retroactively. Is that something that's on your plate, Chairman? Uh, that uh, is definitely on my plate, and if it appears now, I've I've already talked to the senators who are responsible for that, and they have advised me that that, that this bill will be passed. Good. Uh, okay. In fact, a, a, a similar bill has been introduced in the Senate by several senators. So I, I'm not concerned about that, but it, if we could make it retroactive, would be I think would be very positive. Well, uh, this member, and it seems like other members of this committee, would be supportive of that if the conference did produce that or if it uh, came back to us in that manner, uh, and we appreciate that. My, my point in bringing this matter up is we have found a good number of things through these hearings that we did not know existed in the daily life and the routines of the United States military and of these young men and women as they encounter difficulty. And I think that you have uh, done a great job along that line. I also note and wish to thank the chairman, uh, the gentleman, your staff director, Jim Dyer, uh, for quite some time uh, has been following up on an issue that was important to me. The Naval Academy, as you may know, suffered extensive damage as a result of Hurricane Isabel. And uh, I try and stay up with a number of the uh, young midshipmen that uh, are there, not only from Texas, but other parts of the country. And I want to thank you for making sure that the money would be available 
to them uh, as necessary for it being in the center of the uh, storm. Well, thank you, gentlemen. And we believe that we have, we believe we had a, a very accurate accounting of the damages, and we think we have adequately funded those. I thank the gentleman. I yield back. Mr. Hastings of Florida. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as you are allowing uh, great latitude for us, it's deeply appreciated. Chairman Young <laughs> and Ranking Member Ovi, obviously, all of us thank you and all of the committee uh, members of your staff. One of the things that I find personally interesting is the fact that many members of Congress are relegated to rubber stampism by virtue of the fact that, as my colleague Mr. McGovern so aptly pointed out, we have not, not through fault of either of yours, had an opportunity for other members of Congress uh, uh, with equal concern and patriotism as any other member of Congress, all 440 of us being that, or to have serious input. As we have been here, as you have been here, I have had handed up to me paperwork from members. I came in here, we were up to 31 potential amendments. And just as you see the young man circulating, I'm now up to 55, half of which I'm seeing for the first time. One I did take great note of, and not because he's such a thoughtful colleague, and all of us know him to be that, but one that John Spratt offered that would be in many respects similar to um, uh, what Mr. Obi offered, um, uh, but it covers some of the things that are needed. Now, a question that I put to either of you. Are in, do, do either of you really know how the $79 billion before we get to this $87 billion was spent? I voted for it. Uh, you and Mr. Obi voted for it. It left this house more or less uh, with a majority. But I don't know how that money was spent. And do you, either of you, know how it was spent? Let me simply say that um, we have been given very generalized descriptions about how the money has been spent, but we have not in any way, if any member of Congress tells you that he has a line item understanding of where that money went, uh, I think he's smoking something that ain't legal. Now I'm up to 56. Because They're we, still uh, passing out. Chairman Young, do you know how the 79 billion was spent? Uh, I would like to tell you that I do. But if well, I did, I wouldn't be telling the truth. I understand, and I understand the generalizations, but therein lies the problem. Now we are being asked for $87 billion, and all of us know every man and woman in Congress is going to do everything he and she can to support the military. But $87 billion, a substantial portion of which is being asked or to go to the military, is not all that is going to be required. Let me tell you all of, but just a figure. David is good at pointing them out. $20 billion is the authorization for all of the foreign aid of America, period. So now in Iraq, never mind about the fact we went to war in Haiti, we went to war in Bosnia, we went to war in Kosovo, we went to war in Afghanistan, we went to war in um, uh, uh, the former Yugoslavia under Clinton and under uh, President Bush. And many of those places, Haiti, uh, for example, is about to collapse right here in our hemisphere. And for whatever reason, right, wrong, or indifferent, we didn't take the attention. And I'm not quarreling with you, Chairman, because I know that you have been on the dime on many of these issues. But the fact of the matter is we didn't take the same kind of resolve for some phenomenal reason that's ostensibly going to put Iraq automatically at the heart of terrorism, then that ignores Indonesia, that ignores the bombing in Bali, that ignores al-Qaeda's tentacles that are all over the world, and in some respects may have been honed now to a view that they are better off putting some of their foreign operatives in Iraq and recruiting. Which leads me to another question. Is any money in this supplemental for recruitment and retention? Because something in my heart of hearts as an American is telling me no matter the rightness or wrongness of this war, we are going to have one hell of a time keeping kids in the military and making sure that we get new ones. 
uh, the, the, any money in this particular supplemental dealing specifically with the subject of recruitment and retention? The subject of retention has to do with uh, the morale, and retention is very high right now. Uh, specifically in the bill, I'm not aware of any uh, paragraph or section that talks about retention. Uh, we do provide in the regular bill uh, funding that is specifically uh, earmarked and set aside for recruiting for all of the services. But let me, uh, l let me respond to your other, your other comment. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but uh, I carry this to every appropriations hearing and markup, and it's a copy of the Constitution. And for a long time, administrations, Republican and Democrat, are always asking for appropriations for flexibility. They want to be able to spend as they will without a specific uh, appropriation or without coming back to Congress to get approval. And so uh, I read pretty regular to them from Article 1, Section 9 that says no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. And I've read that a lot of times to a lot of administration witnesses. And I have discussed it with the president and the vice president who sit in office today. But more, more recently, I've been reading the second half of that sentence. The second half of that sentence says, and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. Now, we don't get full compliance on this, I'll be honest with you. Yes, sir. Uh, there are still a lot of questions that we have asked uh, the previous uh, director of OMB, who I think you know he and I didn't get along very well because he wouldn't answer my questions. Uh, the new director of OMB is doing a lot better. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't think Congress is really ever going to be satisfied that the administration is doing that. I, full account. I, I, for one, think that we should have the power to make war. And like Mr. Ovi, I voted for us only to go to Iraq after we had cleared the international hurdles. And then I voted against the measure. But that, you know, that isn't the point. We are here now, and we're going to do as good Americans what we are required to do. But nobody is giving me good enough answers for why, why we haven't as good Americans done as well in Haiti, and I'm specifically interested there, as we could have done for, I might add, a paltry sum of money by comparison uh, to what we're spending. Now, now we're up to 58 amendments, which brings me to my major point, and that is that we should not be in a hurry. You don't know where the last money was spent, and I don't know where it was spent. We don't know where this is going to be spent, save the fact that um, uh, we know the amount. We don't know how long before we're going to be asked for more. We don't know how long we're going to be there. If we use as a good barometer, we could say Bosnia is eight years now. Uh, we certainly have been in Kosovo and international efforts aside and in Afghanistan. And then if we want to use an outside parameter, we could use Korea. Um, and talk about the now on to 40 plus years uh, uh, that we are there. This is troubling, and we shouldn't be in a hurry, and we shouldn't do this in the dead of night. Every member in Congress ought be permitted to introduce any measure that they want and have it discussed and voted on up or down. What is the rush? Because the administration says so, and finally, let me say that war requires sacrifice. I dare say when I do the analysis, and I intend to, I don't believe I'm going to find too many millionaires' children that are at war to read, or in Germany in the hospital, or at Bethesda. These are poor children. And it would be better for us, someone said recently, to send our old men to discuss peace than to send our young men uh, to get um, involved in activities uh, pertaining to war. And when Mr. Obi asked uh, for just general sacrifice to take place uh, by 1% of our population, there isn't a rich man or poor or, or, or woman in America that would not give up 1% of whatever this tax thing is uh, that they got. I'd give up mine. All the members of Congress would give up theirs in order that we would satisfy the troops. Uh, Mr. Young, early on, way before we got to this particular point, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, that you fought actively for the military to get the necessary funds to replenish 
the um, um, troops and equipment. I sat on that floor and listened to you and others from uh, the majority party, Duke Cunningham, Duncan Hunter, respected persons, Ike Skelton on war subjects, talking about the fact that much of the war material that we operate is being cannibalized um, uh, in order to keep the equipment running. I was in Alaska along with Newt Gingrich, and we listened to the general there talking about the number of accidents they are having because of equipment. David Obi just tells you about one thing. He talks about Humvees. He didn't tell you about helicopters. He didn't tell you about other things. And then we're not talking about how long they're going to be there, how much longer they're going to have to be reconstituted. We need to take a deep breath. And if we debate this thing until Christmas or next Christmas, uh, and know where this money is going. I, for one, can't participate in writing blank checks. Too many of my constituents want to know what it's for. And it isn't mad. Nobody in here is mad with anybody in Iraq. But how in the world can we be worried about a cellular phone system in Iraq when we don't have cellular phones and phones that work in Virginia <coughs> when it rains hard? <coughs> that doesn't make any sense. And somewhere along the lines, we're going to pay the price, all of us as politicians, Republicans and Democrats, for the wrath of Americans who are looking at us as we hurry along and say, OK, another $87 billion. Never mind about bifurcating it. Everybody knows that if we had bifurcated it, and I did not advocate and do not advocate that, but have we bifurcated and put the $20 billion on the table for Iraq, I dare say the $200 million shavings that you all did would have gone down to an awful lot of money. I can make the argument for force protection. It's necessary for our troops in order to have safe roads and good water and all of that while they're there. But it would be better for us to have a better understanding. Chairman, thank you uh, for your latitude. This is very disturbing. And if we do it at 2 or 3 o'clock AM Friday morning, we will have done America a disservice. Mr. Hastings, I would just like to make one observation. The administration is asking us to exercise our fiduciary responsibility for the taxpayers. <coughs> and in that process, give them the authority to spend $87 billion. Yet they are asking us to do that without giving us in any way any opportunity to vote on our own first preferences. We're being told, swallow it this way or no way. We're not being told what it is going to cost in the administration's own estimate over the next five years. We're not being given detailed <coughs> uh, descriptions of how the money was spent in the past. The Washington Post, I have a great deal of respect for. Uh, but they ran an editorial uh, today which boggles my mind. The Washington Post is very good at, on a regular basis, reminding members of their constitutional responsibility. And yet, if you look at that, po that, uh, that editorial today, what they say is, oh, well, uh, we know that Congress has an, uh, has an obligation to get the information that, that it needs so it can make intelligent choices. But if they don't get that information, that's not sufficient reason to vote uh, against this package. Baloney. That is the absolute bottom line reason to vote against this package. We have an obligation to know what we're doing, and we have an obligation to know what the administration is doing. And unless and until we are given, I mean, this is an administration which manipulated intelligence information on the way to war. So they have a higher obligation than most to give us the truth about the rest of the package. And it is my obligation to not provide nilly-willy the use of taxpayers' money until I get adequate explanation for past use of money, for future expectations on the uh, And that is on, a telling point. If the, chair, for how we're gonna pay if the for chairman it. of the Appropriations Committee and the Ranking Committee member tell me that they can't give me the specifics on what we already approved and I voted for it, I tell you, I don't want to do that no more. Amen. Mr. Reynolds. Uh, and Mr. Chairman. Chairman, uh, my friend from Florida, Mr. Hastings, gave me a, a lot of things to think about. And uh, obviously, I'm not going to take all the time to respond to everything that he had to say. But there will be a lot of time on the floor to debate this and learn, if you will, if you will be in the, on the House floor, in your seat, 
listening to the, to the debate. There's always, one hour has already taken place. There will be an additional five hours of general debate and then who knows how many hours there will be under the five minute rule while the amendments are being offered and, and disposed of. So there's gonna be, for any member willing to put in the time and listen to the debate, you can ask almost any question you want and you'll get a pretty decent answer uh, if there is an answer. But, but the thing that struck me with my friend, Mr. Hastings, he said, I'm, not, I'm in no hurry. This year, next year, whatever. Mr. Chairman, I'm in a hurry. I want these American troops out of Iraq at the very earliest possible opportunity. I don't want any more presence of Americans in Iraq. Where's the exit in plan, Mr. Chairman? You'll please pardon me for interrupting you, but where's the exit plan that this 87 billion is gonna get them out of Iraq? If the gentleman, I didn't interrupt the gentleman, and I just assumed he didn't interrupt me, but I want these troops out of here. Now, we, we started something in response to something. We were attacked, you know, there are those who disagree that, that Iraq had any connection with terrorism. I say they did. I say Saddam Hussein did. I say we found evidence in northern Iraq where Al-Qaeda troops or troops or terrorists were being trained. We found payments, uh, cash payments from Saddam Hussein to the families of suicide bombers. There is enough connection there. And I don't care whether they're Saudi Arabians or Egyptians or Iraqis or Iranians or whoever they are, if they are terrorists targeting the United States, they're our enemy. And it's our responsibility to secure this nation. And that's what we're doing. But we can't walk out of there today while the, the Iraqis themselves are still disrupted because they don't have an infrastructure yet. But they are building an infrastructure. Ambassador Bremer is doing a really good job in creating a police force, in creating a security force, in creating a judicial system, in creating a monetary system. The schools are open with American supplies. Kids are going to school again. The process is working. Uh, it's not gonna happen overnight. Nobody has a magic wand to make this thing happen. Many Iraqis are still scared to death that Saddam's gonna come back and they're not cooperating as well as they should. Others are praying that Saddam will come back. And of course, they're not, they're not cooperating uh, to any extent whatsoever. But let me tell you something. This has moved pretty quick in Iraq. You mentioned Bosnia. How long ago was Bosnia? When Bosnia war started, I was in the minority party. <clears throat> That's been over 10 years ago, because we've been in the majority for 10 years. We're still in Bosnia today, and we are still paying in Bosnia today. We're still in Kosovo today that was started under another administration. We're still there. There was no exit strategy. We're still there. Uh, you know, an exit strategy is easy to, to demand. And I remember when the, uh, Mr. Clinton's Secretary of State told me personally, it'll cost a billion dollars to do what we have to do in Bosnia, and we'll be out in a year. We're still there, and it's, and it's more than 10 years, and a whole lot more than a billion dollars. I don't say that to be critical of the Clinton administration, but when you're dealing with a situation like this, you, it's not black and white. It is not all lined up in a concurrency where you can see this step, that step, and the next step. Bremer is doing, I think, a really tremendous job in creating a condition where, in fact, we can bring our troops home, and that's what I want. I don't want to have to go to the hospitals anymore and visit troops. There's, well, I'm not going to discuss the, the various cases, but there's some pretty sad cases there. I want to stop. I don't want to have to do that. I want my wife to be home with my kid who is having a hard time getting through high school rather than spending five, six days a week at the hospitals providing aid and comfort that the government doesn't provide for the military and their families. So uh, this is not an easy, an easy chore, but I got to tell you something. It wasn't easy for the people that lost their lives on February 26th of 1993 in the World Trade Center bombing by terrorists. Six people lost their lives. June 25th of 96, Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia. 17 young American airmen lost their lives due to terrorism. August the 7th of 98, Kenya, Tanzania, our U.S. embassies were bombed by terrorists. 259 people lost their lives. 
October the 2nd of 00, the year 2000, an attack on the USS Cole in Yemen. 17 sailors lost their lives and many others were injured at the hands of terrorists. Then September 11th came, and everybody knows what happened on September 11th, that the Pentagon, at the World Trade Center, in a field in Pennsylvania, Americans lost their lives to terrorism. Now, we have got to fight terrorism, and I think President Bush has said it so well, so many times. You've got to fight the terrorists wherever he or she might be. You've got to provide an environment where our kids and our grandkids can grow and not have to worry about a threat of terrorism. And that's what I'm all about here today, doing the best I can to carry out that mission. Because among other things, you can't convince me in America that this $87 billion is going to stop that terrorism. May and I there's terrorism please? that occurs General. in a lot of places in the world. And the fact of the matter is that we can reasonably expect more. Homeland Security is suffering because General we are Hill. spending this money. Of course, I'll yield, Mr. Chairman. It strikes me that a significant part of this debate can be held on the floor tomorrow. And we can move on with the rules. What I'm arguing yeah. for is that it be held on the floor for a longer period of time, and certainly that the minority be given at least what the Senate minority that discussion was given. Will be held. Wait, uh, Mr. Chairman, you're right. This should be argued on the floor. But you know, I can't let this go unchallenged. Because the, the, the terrorist incidents that I just mentioned, every time, up until September 11th, every time, every one of these incidences, our response was a lot of words and a lot of threats and no action except when Kenya and Tanzania embassies were bombed, then there was a response. We fired a missile into an empty training camp in Afghanistan, and we bombed the drug manufacturing company in the Sudan. Now, every time a terrorist action against our nation took place and we didn't respond, they grew bolder. They grew more aggressive. You gotta give President Bush credit, whether you agree with him or not, whether you like it or not, he took some firm action to tell the terrorists that this is the end. We're not going to stand for this anymore. We are going to battle you wherever you might be. We are going to eliminate that threat. And if we don't do something, that threat is going to continue to grow. Mr. Chair, Mr. Hastings, I'm just looking around this room for the straw man. I don't see one. I don't know of anybody in this room or on the House floor who doesn't want to fight terrorism and who hasn't voted to fight terrorism. With respect to, uh, uh, to uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, no less authority than the President of the United States has indicated that there is not one whit of evidence that Iraq uh, was uh, participating in the attack on 9-11. Now, there may have been a lot of reasons to go after Saddam Hussein, but 9-11, in the words of the President of the United States, was not one of them. So what we ought to be talking about today, with all due respect to the, to the substance that we've talked about, I would be happy to, to have this debate on the House floor. But I want it to be, I don't want it to be just on amendments that don't matter. That's why I'm asking for my substitute, because I agree we ought to fight terrorism. I agree we've got an obligation to complete the job in Iraq now that we've undertaken it. I agree we've got a job to do in Afghanistan. I also think we need to do more on Homeland Security, and the President vetoed funding for that. But most importantly, whatever we do on that front, we ought to be imaginative enough and fair-minded enough and responsible enough to do something other than send the bill to our kids, which is why I'm asking for the same right that the minority had in the Senate, which is to offer an amendment that will pay for whatever it is we do in Iraq. That is the responsible thing to do. Mr. Reynolds. Hey, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman Young, you've got the toughest job in Congress today because First of all, there are a lot of opinions as to what the war of terrorism is, how it ought to move forward, or how we ought to get out, or whatever. As my colleagues talked about, 60 amendments that are already before us, and I'm sure there'll be many before the rules hearing closes. We have some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to double the spending. 
Some want to pay for it by new taxes. And uh, as you cited, we're going to have some pretty ample debate on the floor, just as we did when we gave the President the power to uh, go into Iraq. And I couldn't help but reflect as you outlined the attacks on America where we kind of turned the cheek, because I lost a few friends in that bombing attack in the early 90s in the World Trade Center. And we watched when disbelief as embassies in the USS Cole were attacked, and we stood standing with some rhetoric and some concern. But finally, many of us lost a lot of friends when 9-11 came, and whether it was the Pentagon or the families that lost their loved ones over Pennsylvania or the Two World Trade Center, no more as 3,000 died there. And there was great debate. We finalized with resolve and gave the President authority. Not all supported that. And so there's certainly opinions all over the lot. And you know, I'm not an expert on how to spend $87 billion, and that's a lot of money because it's almost my state of New York's budget. And I know that the Appropriations Committee, both sides of the aisle, you and the ranking member really kind of keep a pretty close eye when the administration comes in and asks for money. There's pretty ample debate, and last I knew, there was a heck of a lot of roll calls, almost as many as here, Mr. Chairman, on the minority asking for those roll call votes so that it's on the record uh, as to what the positions were with all those questions. But as I look at this, as this comes to rules and we send it to the floor, isn't it true that this emergency supplemental appropriation is really about helping our troops, protecting them, and stabilizing the country so that we can get our troops out? Isn't the bottom line that we can't stabilize the country and get our troops home till they get the money? Mr. Reynolds, you're absolutely right. They go together. Uh, they're, they're not two separate issues. Our troops aren't coming home until the nation is stabilized and is able to run its own business. We intend to make that happen as soon as it is humanly possible. And I think this President Bush and Ambassador Bremer and those who are involved are doing a really good job at getting this job done quickly, unlike what happened in Bosnia, where we stayed for, still stayed forever. So I think the gentleman makes, a, makes an excellent point. Thank you both very much. Always welcome here. Sometimes produce illumination as well as heat. Thank you, David. Thank you. Mr. Kirk, a member of the committee. Welcome. If you have prepared remarks, we're well, happy to make them without objection part of the text and welcome a summary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, two very brief amendments. They are both to strike language in the bill. Uh, they concern the contracting authority authorized under the supplemental. Uh, as requested by the authorizing committee, we have a provision which requires full competitive contracting under the supplemental. It has uh, an exception that allows uh, sole source contracting on seven days prior notice to the Congress. And then an exception to that exception, which would allow sole source contracting with seven days uh, uh, following notice to the Congress. I think that we should take Ambassador Bremer's uh, commitments to the Congress to heart, where he says that he does not intend to use any sole source contracting authority. I realize the situation in Iraq is quite dynamic. And so if there is, as the law states, an extraordinary need for something by the U.S. government, we would still allow a very limited exception, but only if the Congress is notified seven days in advance. My amendment would strike the third provision, which would allow the administration to go forward and do a, a, execute a sole source contract, only notifying the Congress afterwards. I've never met a sole source contract that I liked. And I would like, at the very least, to make sure that if any sole source contracting authority is used, it is only used with the Congress being notified seven days in advance. As someone who used to work for the State Department, I know that in advance notifications tend to terrorize the bureaucracy. Knowing that a notification will come up to the Hill uh, with significant time for people to find out about it, it largely will prevent any such notifications from coming forward. 
That will force nearly all of this authority to be used in fully competitive contracting, and I think that's the way it should go. Thank you. Mr. Hastings? I have a question to Mr. Frost? It's an interesting amendment, Mr. Kirk. Uh, will this in any way affect the uh, sole source contracts given to Brown and Root uh, already by our government in Iraq? The, the provision in the law only affects the money that is currently in this uh, supplemental appropriation going forward. So that, uh, well, let me be more specific. It's my understanding that Brown and Root is operating under a sole source contract that the Pentagon variously date, uh, dates back to 1998 or 1992. Mr. Waxman is trying to determine this right now that uh, they are operating under a sole source, source contract that was signed prior to us going to Iraq. Now, are you saying that if any of the money were to be under this supplemental were to go to that contract uh, that the uh, Pentagon is now claiming was signed prior to Iraq, would they have to notify us? They would. Under this provision, we are requiring com competition for any funds covered in this appropriation bill. I want to delete the authority which will allow them to make a sole source award only notifying us seven days afterwards. Um, I want to make sure that we are forcing as much into the light as possible. And, to, and yeah. it, it would be my overall hope to make sole source contracting part of our country's past. Mr. Kirk, yeah, you are entirely correct. And um, have you consulted the staff of this committee on the majority side or the parliamentarian's office? Do you know whether your amendment would require a waiver to be granted by this committee to be made in order? I have consulted with the parliamentarian who believes that this amendment does not need protection under the rule, unless the rule protected the section from being amended. And I would That's very interesting. Yeah, this is simply an amendment which strikes language currently in the bill. I hope that you will have the opportunity to offer your amendment on the, on the floor. It's something that should be debated and should be voted on by this body. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Mullerick. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Kirk, I like your amendment very much, and I agree with you that sole source uh, contracts should certainly be a part of the past. But we surely have learned a lesson this time. But I, I hope you get the opportunity to offer it. Sessions. I have no questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lantos, welcome to the committee. Happy to have you here. If you have any prepared remarks, they'll be made part of the record without objection, and we welcome a summary. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee. Usually, Mr. Chairman, I appear here with my good friend and colleague, Chairman Hyde, because our committee in this very turbulent and divided House of Representatives has been an island of bipartisanship. Uh, but this time, I'm coming here alone on a matter of utmost importance, because it relates to the very prerogatives of the House of Representatives. We pride ourselves, and have done so throughout our institutional history, of being equal to our colleagues on the Senate side. And what my amendment deals with, Mr. Chairman, is the right of every member of this House to a full and open dialogue on shared sacrifice in the war on Iraq. I also appear, Mr. Chairman, in my previous capacity as a professional economist. And as such, I am very mindful of the fact that Iraq's oil reserves are estimated to have a value of $7 trillion. $7 trillion. We are talking about one of the wealthiest countries on this planet, potentially. Mr. Chairman, I feel that whichever way individuals voted earlier on matters relating to Iraq, failure is clearly not an option at this stage. And the enactment of the legislation that you are considering is one key aspect of achieving stability 
both in the troubled country and in that region. Our challenge in Iraq, Mr. Chairman, is not a short-term challenge, and no one in this body should expect it to be that. There are two questions before us as members of Congress. We have shown that we are powerful, but the question now is, what is our staying power? And what reckoning will we face if we as a nation do not step up to the committed, commitment needed to ensure our success? It is in that spirit, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, that I come before you with what some of you might consider an extraordinary request. I have provided to the committee a copy of an amendment that I respectfully request you make in order under the rule for H.R. 3289. The legislation I'm introducing today with my colleagues, Mr. Smith of Washington and Mr. Bishop of New York, reduces the tax breaks given to the wealthiest 1% of Americans during the last few years to offset the cost of this supplemental spending bill. I am informed that in order to offer this amendment, your committee will have to waive certain points of order against it, and I would like to spend a few minutes talking about why you should do so. Mr. Chairman, the September 11th tragedy, the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq, should have shocked our nation into a period of shared sacrifice. And to be sure, our young servicemen and women did not hesitate to go to war to protect America's national security interests. Every morning, when our soldiers pull on their boots and head out into the streets of Iraq cities and towns and villages, they are putting their lives at risk so that the Iraqi people and ultimately the people of the entire Middle East, as well as the people of the United States, will have a secure, stable, and prosperous future. Meanwhile, Mr. Chairman, their families back home have made enormous personal and financial sacrifices. For the families of many reservists serving in Iraq, the kids have fewer back-to-school clothes, because the family income has dropped precipitously. All the parents left behind must struggle alone to make a living and to raise a family. Despite these enormous sacrifices by our men and women in uniform and by their families, we have asked our nation's richest Americans to make no sacrifice whatsoever. I think, Mr. Chairman, that is an outrage. The President proposed and this Congress granted enormous tax breaks to them. Some Americans sacrifice and serve. Others reap a windfall. Mr. Chairman, the President and members of this administration have said that we must make a generational commitment to building a stable democratic Middle East, where countries can become allies because of shared values rather than merely shared interests. But let us not foist the cost of this struggle on the next generation of Americans. Let those who can, and there are plenty who can, pay today's share in the sacrifice of this generation of Americans and pay tribute to the valorous who have fallen rather than saddle their children with more unsustainable debt. I respectfully request that the committee waive all points of order on the amendment I have submitted to the committee today and allow our body to have the same debate the other body held. And I want to underscore this, Mr. Chairman. Every single member of the Senate had a chance to debate what in essence is my amendment. I demand that every member of the House of Representatives have that same right. Mr. Chairman, as my prepared testimony explains, I will also have amendments ensuring that our funding is in the form of loans, not grants, 
reallocating some funds for Liberia towards reconstruction. A country which has reserves of $7,000 billion. That's what $7 trillion is. $7,000 billion should not get a grant from American taxpayers in the amount of $20 billion. While I hope, Mr. Chairman, that when debate takes place on my amendment, you will support it. At this time, I plead with you to approve an open rule in substance that will, that will allow my amendment in accordance with the normal rules of the House to be debated. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm happy to answer thank any you, Mr. questions Lentos, you I would have. I'd just like to point out that you may have been overstating when you said the top 1 percent were not making any sacrifices since the top 1 percent are going to pay 38 percent of all the taxes this year. Well, with all due respect, Thank Mr. You. Chairman, if I may respond to that, the top 1 percent have received incredible tax benefits from this administration and from this Congress. If we were to take only 90 billion of the special tax benefits they received out of 690 billion, this entire supplemental would be paid for. You are dealing with an economist, Mr. Chairman, and while I respect you as a chairman, as an economist, I am telling you that the major domestic problem of our society is the growing unfairness perceived by tens of millions of Americans. I just got back from my district where I spent three days. And the thing everybody's talking about is the growing presence of a class-divided society. As one of your colleagues, I think Mr. Hastings, indicated earlier, most of the people, if not all, who are wounded and are dying in Iraq do not come from the top 1%. They come from the bottom one-third in most instances. And I think to say that the top 1% cannot forego a small portion of the special tax benefits they received at a time when the country is at war, at a time when tens of thousands of our reservists and National Guardsmen and Guardswomen are struggling financially because the government has refused to pay the difference between their civilian salary and their military pay. I introduced legislation to this committee, which this mm -hmm. committee rejected, making it mandatory that our reservists and our National Guardsmen have their salaries maintained while they are serving their country in Afghanistan and Iraq. And your majority, Mr. Chairman, has chosen to reject that, that legislation also. There is a profound pattern of unfairness in the way this war is managed on the financial side and on the human sacrifice side. And I plead with you and your colleagues to allow every single one of my colleagues to openly and freely debate this amendment, which merely deals with funding this matter. It doesn't deal with the, the necessity of staying there until we prevail. It merely sees to it that the wealthiest Americans participate in the funding, and we don't push on the funding to our children and grandchildren. None of which changes the fact that the top 1% of the income earners in America will pay 38% of all the income taxes this year. Mr. Hastings? Mr. Rost. Mr. Lantos, um, you certainly have a, uh, a good proposal. I recall, uh, as a young man, during the Vietnam War in 1968, paying a 10% 10 10 income tax surcharge to pay for the cost of the Vietnam War. That was imposed by a Democratic Congress and a Democratic President. I remember who that did not want well. to pass on the cost of that war to future generations. And that was paid by everyone. That wasn't just paid by the top 1%. I didn't make very much money that year as a young man, but I remember paying that 10% surcharge. And what you are asking is much fairer than was done even then. You are asking that the top 1% of taxpayers give up a portion 
of the very generous tax breaks they have gotten from this Congress so that we don't have to pay pass on the cost of this war to our children and grandchildren. That is this correct. committee has the Republicans on this committee have no intention of making your amendment in order. And that is a tragedy. That is a very unfortunate situation for our country, both now and for future generations. I thank the gentleman for coming here today and for passionately making his case. Unfortunately, it is falling on deaf ears on the other side of the aisle. They've already indicated they're not going to do that. They are wrong, and I believe the American public will have something to say about that in November of 2004. Thank you. Ms. Myrick. Ms. Slaughter. Only to echo what Mr. Frost has said and say to all my colleagues who are sitting here so patiently, they have fat chance. Thanks. Mr. Sessions. I have no questions. Mr. McGovern. Well, I, I want to join in uh, commending my colleague from California for his very thoughtful amendment. Um, as I stated in my opening remarks, um, the, the constituents that I represent are asking the same question over and over, and that is how we're going to pay for all of this. How are we going to, how, who, you know, how are we going to afford to do this? You know, where are the offsets coming from? Um, and, and I think it is not only reasonable, but it is uh, essential that we have a debate in this Congress about how we're going to pay for it. So it's not on the back of my son or daughter or my, or, or my grandkids. I mean, that in fact, that we're, we're meeting our responsibilities. Uh, the fact is, if we do not uh, uh, pass an amendment like the one the gentleman has offered, uh, this, this, uh, this war will be paid for by the middle class and by those struggling to get in the middle. It will mean less money for education. It will lead, mean less money for health care. It will mean less money for a prescription drug benefit. Uh, it will mean less money to help stimulate uh, economic growth to create more jobs, less money for environmental cleanup for our roads and our bridges and our infrastructure. That's how we're going to pay for it. And it's wrong. And I, for the life of me, I don't understand why, uh, if you don't want to, if, if the, uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle do not want to vote to uh, have millionaires in this country give up a little bit to help finance the, the cost of this war. I mean, if, if that's, you know, if you feel you need to defend millionaires, um, well, that's fine. You can vote against it. But for a lot of us who want to be able to be responsible here um, and to respond to what our constituents are urging us to do, and that is to make sure that this is paid for, I mean, we should have this opportunity. As I said before, these are extraordinary times. We're at war. And the fact of the matter is there needs to be the widest possible latitude given uh, when we have debates like this so that all members have a chance to be heard. Uh, and um, my fear is that that's not going to happen. But I, I commend the gentleman. We're going to fight very hard on this side of the aisle to try to make his amendment in order. Thank you. Very Mr. Much. Hastings. Mr. Lantos's amendment obviously is very thoughtful. I have very little to add. I associate myself uh, with the comments of Mr. Frost, Ms. Slaughter, and my colleague, Mr. McGovern. Uh, it's a make-sense proposition, and it's something, obviously, that we could do if we so desired at the Rules Committee by making it in order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lantos. I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if I may say in conclusion, the issue you are discussing in this amendment is not the validity of my proposal. It is the equal status of the House of Representatives with that of the Senate. 100 senators had the right to debate publicly on national television the merits of my proposal. I think 435 members of the House should have that same right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Manzillo, please approach your witness stand. Welcome. I think I know what this is going to be about. Just and about the people in my congressional district that are 11.5% unemployment and suffering, and it's about the United States government buying 34,000 AK-47s from the country of Jordan for the purpose of furnishing guns to the Iraqi police force. And it's also about what Mr. Young talked about, and that is accountability of the United States Congress as to where this money is going. We've lost 3 million manufacturing jobs in this country, 93,000 in the past two months. I lost two factories yesterday, 700 people that are wondering how many more we're going to lose. And this bleeding continues. 
And no one seems to think around here that there could be some relationship between rebuilding Iraq and giving my people work. That there could be some type of relationship in at least making a statement that if we're going to spend this type of money, let's use it to put Americans to work. We paid for everything. <coughs> and I'm looking for accountability in two ways. And the first one has to do with just a statement that says, to the ex greatest extent possible, which means it's not mandatory, and imposes by American language on what we're doing to rebuild Iraq. And it says, to the greatest extent possible, Congress believes that we should acquire unmanufactured articles, materials, and supplies mined or produced in the United States, and also manufactured articles, materials, and supplies that have been manufactured in the United States. It's just a statement of policy. It's not binding. It puts this Congress on record in saying to the taxpayers who are footing this entire bill, well, a lot of them won't foot it because they're losing their jobs, and they won't be paying the taxes on it. But they have paid taxes and hopefully will in the future. It's simply saying, why not use American labor in goods and supplies to rebuild Iraq? This is so simple. The second thing it does, it says that within 60 days after the date of the enactment of the supplemental, and every day, 60 days thereafter, until all the amounts are expended, the head of each department or agency of the federal government which expends such amounts shall prepare, shall, under the Constitution, shall prepare and submit to Congress a report containing the following with respect to the expenditure of such amounts. Number one, a list of all contracts awarded during the period by the report. Number two, for each such contract, the origin of unmanufactured articles, materials, and supplies to be used under the contract. Number three, for each such contract, the origin of articles, materials, and supplies used in manufactured articles, materials, and supplies to be used under the contract. And four, for each such contract, the source of the labor performing the work of the contract. When I go home, as with Mr. Pence, if you saw the article in USA Today, when he sits down and he talks to his people and his veterans, they want accountability. They want loans. I presume that's why he's here today. That, that's reasonable. We spent all this money over there, and now we're told that, well, there won't be a loan. It's going to be a grant. When I talk to my constituents, they don't talk about the war. They hand me resumes. I said, Congressman, do you know of any jobs? And you know what I do, Mr. Chairman? I get on the phone, and I talk to my constituents, and I talk to them in person, and I try to match them up with jobs. And I spend my entire life in Congress working to get those people employed, because that's my job as United States Congressman. My dad was a master machinist, and then a master chef, and master butcher, and master carpenter and all times a master father. And we grew up in an area where we know what machine oil is, know the importance of manufacturing in this country, know the fact that according to the NAM, if we don't have a strong base in manufacturing, and if this erosion of manufacturing job continues, then the United States will become a third world nation. We're headed in that direction. And no one seems to make the connection that we can take what we're spending in Iraq and use it to save the jobs for our people. In fact, there's an article that appeared by, by Andy Grove, the chairman of Intel. It's an astounding article. And he says, U.S. is losing the leading edge in electronics and technology. And he looks at the culture, the corporate culture, which our government has adopted, that says he has torn 
between the obligation to increase shareholder value to the owners of the corporation and the obligation that he owes to the U.S. workers that made America. And he's crying out. And he says there has to be some public policy statement on that. And now Congress can step in that gap. Congress can instruct the Pentagon, you want to spend the money, you come up with an accounting every 60 days. Our small business committee, of which I'm the chairman, is having a hearing in about three weeks. I met with the 12 prime contractors involved in the reconstruction of Iraq on the civil side. That's Bechtel and the other organizations. I told them six months ago, I'm going to have an oversight hearing on where the money is going. Just two hours ago, I met with the Department of Army that spent between three and five billion dollars. I want to know how the money is being spent. Because if you can't tell me how the money is being spent, you ain't going to get it. Because you're not accountable. And that's where I am today with a heavy heart. Over 700 more families that have taken still another hit in the manufacturing sector. And all this says is that it's the intent of Congress that we buy these articles to rebuild Iraq, made in America, and that the people who spend the money be accountable for it. I would respectfully request that this amendment be made in order. Frost, Merrick, Ms. Lauder. I, I do want to comment on, on what uh, Mr. Masulo said. I, I agree with him absolutely. I hope every member of the House and the Senate and everybody else who can reads that article in the Wall Street Journal. It was an eye opener. And I think people are suddenly wondering where all these jobs went, as though we haven't watched them fritter away because the trade policies really encourage getting rid of them. I'm not only concerned about the loss of jobs, which is prodigious, but I'm also concerned about giving away our technology. Uh, and we are really, uh, we're, I think our standard of living is going to lessen. And I, like you, I have highly skilled people who worked their whole adult lives, corporations making money for them, who've just been so, to, said, sorry, we're leaving town. Um, and it is heartbreaking, and I agree with you absolutely, and I support that wholeheartedly, and hope, against hope, that they will let you offer it. Mrs. Slaughter, these, these 37,000 AK-47s that were bought for the civilian police, police force, we could have supplied them with American machine guns. Oh, well, just and no now we have a Russian-made gun assembled in Jordan with parts coming probably from, Czech, or from uh, Republic of Czech, uh, and I think Poland or Russia itself. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, and as you point out, the people who uh, paid a lot of the taxes to make that possible aren't paying taxes anymore. And we'd better pay some heed to what's going on here. It's particularly, uh, I know you and I have talked before about the necessity to get the electronics industry back in the United States. It's very important we do that. I, it's, I think it's deplorable that the Pentagon doesn't buy equipment made in the United States. I'm not sure most Americans know that all electronics used by Pentagon are bought from other countries. Um, and we are really at the mercy, in many cases, of third world countries to really provide us with what we need to, to take care of those troops. We're in, having in a Iran. hearing tomorrow on the loss of our technology edge by bringing in people who are examining the military capabilities in this country and saying we do not have the technological capabilities manufactured in America to protect our own country. Well, I want to come to that hearing. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Mr. Sessions. Good question, Mr. McGovern. Um, I, I want to thank the gentleman uh, for once again coming before the Rules Committee with this issue. Um, as he knows, uh, in my congressional district, uh, manufacturing is an important part of the economy, and uh, a lot of the same issues that you're being faced with, uh, I'm being faced with as well. So I'm very sympathetic and very supportive. And, and I would just say to the gentleman that I think that uh, you're not going to have a problem on this side of the aisle. Um, your problem is going to be on your side of the aisle, convincing some of your colleagues over there to vote to give you a waiver to offer this. Uh, I mean, I think this is a, a good amendment. I think this is something that, that should be part of this bill. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I'm supportive. If we had a chance to vote on that, I'm, I'll certainly vote for it, and we'll fight for it in committee. But, uh, again, the problem is not here. It's on the other side of the aisle, your side of the aisle. So if you can convince a couple of your members, then you may have a chance to be able to offer this. I thank him for coming before the committee. Hastings. 
Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Manzullo. I'm very supportive of your very thoughtful amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you very much for thank coming. You. Mr. Spratt. Mr. Spratt, you're next in seniority. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to our committee. Chairman, I have two amendments. I have left the committee copies of both amendments. I have two amendments, and I have left copies of both with the committee. If you look through this bill, this supplemental, the total request is $87 billion. If you look for what out of that $87 billion goes to the troops who fought the war and after the war through a lot of inventiveness and improvisation have held it country of Iraq together and account for a lot of the progress we've made so far. You don't find very much to say thank you to the troops or furthermore to say we understand the burden you're bearing and we want to lighten that burden at least to some extent. I think, Mr. Chairman, that the first title in this supplemental should be not just a military personnel title in the defense part of it but a quality of life package for our troops. And one of the amendments that I offer, the longer amendment, is a quality of life package for our troops. And I would just like to touch upon the highlights of that particular package. First of all, Mr. Chairman, hostile fire, combat pay, imminent danger pay, call it what you will. This bill increases it my particular amendment would take it up $25 more, increase it from $225 to $250 a month. That would mean that a soldier in Iraq with a family back home would get $250 for imminent danger pay and $250 for family separation pay, $500 for the ordeal of serving every day, worrying about an elusive enemy, worrying about his family back home, I don't think $500 is too much to ask for the kind of risk and service and sacrifice that that service member renders. Secondly, this amendment takes the opportunity and increases the family separation pay to $250, but makes that permanent. The supplemental before you would raise it to $250, but would only effect this increase for one fiscal year. Let's go ahead and make it permanent and say to our troops, if you're getting shot at, if you're separated from your family for a long period of time in a combat zone, this is the least we can provide you. Thirdly, the administration set up a request to allow hazardous duty pay and family separation pay to revert to their lower levels. They were increased for one year in last year's appropriation bill. But the administration would have them revert to their lower levels, and in lieu of imminent danger pay or family separation pay, they propose to provide hardship pay on a case-by-case -case or unit-by-unit -unit basis. Now, hardship pay is $300 a month now. The administration proposed to go to $600 a month, but to provide it in lieu of separation pay and imminent danger pay. Hardship pay goes to units and individuals who are in particularly miserable, abysmal circumstances, places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And it, pro it is provided division by division at the division commander's request and at the discretion of the Department of Defense. It's not automatic. It's not an entitlement. It is key to the circumstances. It could be 600. It could be 300. My particular bill would simply pick up on the, my amendment would pick up on the recommendation of the Bush administration and raise hardship duty pay on a discretionary basis from $300 to $600 a month. I think there's surely places around the world where our troops are serving in miserable, abysmal conditions that that kind of pay increment is not out of line by any means. In fact, it's highly warranted. Next, Mr. Chairman, for several years now, we've been attempting to provide on a bipartisan basis a basic allowance for housing to completely cover average out-of-pocket housing costs for military families who live off base. 
Next year would have been the last year in the increment we made to bring the level of pay up to where we could say nobody will have to pay anything out of pocket. Your base housing allowance will take care of it if you live off base and have a family. As one way of saying thank you to the families who've made a sacrifice for their troops abroad, we propose simply to accelerate the schedule for the implementation of that out-of-pocket housing cost increment by one year. Next, Mr. Chairman, there are places called family assistance centers. And reservists in particular, guardsmen and reservists, tend to have some highly individual problems. They've left a business, they've left a job, they've left a family on short notice. And these family assistance centers provide them all kinds of ad hoc help by the acknowledgement of DOD, they are underfunded now to the tune of at least $50 million. $48 million is the number that was given us. So we have provided in this bill to fund the increased demand for family assistance centers for guard and reservists to assist with problems related to deployment, $48 million. Next, Mr. Chairman, as you know, we found out by going out to visit the troops at Bethesda and Walter Reed that they were being charged $8.10 for subsistence charges while wounded service members were recuperating in those hospitals. We all agree, Democrats and Republicans, all of us, that that's unwarranted. This bill before you would dispense with that for one year. My amendment would say, let's get rid of it forever. We don't need to levy that charge. I don't know if you've been to Iraq, but uh, when we went and met with the troops, as we always do from our own uh, hometowns, and districts, one of the frequent complaints we fought, found was the lack of affordable telephone service. In some places it's good, in other places they think they're getting ripped off. That's not a good situation to have. Surely one of the things we can do is, with today's telecommunications, help young people in a foreign theater call home on a frequent basis. That's one of the ways they can keep their family from, uh, from uh, suffering while they're gone. And so we provide direct DOD to establish a system of prepaid telephone cards, government-provided telephone and internet service to military personnel in combat zones, and we build upon provisions already in the bill to that effect. Another thing that fortunately DOD is about to implement, and I think they have implemented it in a small way, and that's R&R, &R, rest and recuperative leave. The bill would, um, this amendment would authorize and add funds so that we not only would have money for the R&R, &R, but we would have a free ticket from wherever you, your duty station is to wherever your home of record is. If you live in El Paso but are serving at Fort Bragg, Fayetteville, North Carolina, you wouldn't get shipped back to Fayetteville and told to find yourself a flight home to El Paso. We would fly you, the government would fly you all the way to El Paso. I think it's a wonderful thing to do. It would have a tremendous uh, effect on morale, and that's what we're proposing here. Let's give free R&R travel all the way home to every troop who's lucky enough to get R&R. This is a minor item next, and that's campaign medals. It's our understanding that DOD is giving one campaign medal for the war against terrorism. If you've been to Afghanistan, you get one medal. If you've been to Iraq, you get the same medal. A lot of these guys and gals are serving in both theaters. And I think that uh, the risk is different enough, the situation is different enough, that we should give them each individual campaign medals. Next, Mr. Chairman, the, we've got transition for disabled service members. General King, a very, very effective chief of staff of the Army, made some very affecting testimony before our committee, the Armed Services Committee, in which he said, look, I've been out to Walter Reed, I've seen some of the servicemen who are badly injured out there, who've lost limbs, and he used a particular case and named the young man, used his name. He said he has lost his eyesight, he's lost one limb, but he said, I want to tell you something. He's not in condition to rejoin the Army, but he is in condition to rejoin society, and we're going to help him every step of the way. I think that was a wonderful statement. When Kane made it, tears welled up in my eyes. I was listening to him on uh, Rock Creek Parkway driving home. But the fact of the matter is, there's no money to assure him. The mentor, the transitional assistance, the other things. Kane said, we're going to send him to college. We're going to teach him to read again, read Braille, and we're going to send him to college. Let's do that. 
but let's back up the promise with a little bit of money. All we provide here is $50 million so that what General Kane promised can indeed be accomplished in the right way. Finally, we've got a couple of other things, and one is a long pending issue, and that's a tax deduction for reservists who have travel expenses for traveling over 100 miles to a point from where they, uh, from where they would deploy. As a tax exemption for a death gratuity, here's something again like the $8.10 that's uh, charged our troops at uh, Walter Reed. There's no reason to treat the death gratuity, $6,000, as income in respect of a decedent and have the fiduciary of the estate charge or pay taxes on that. And finally, I don't know about you, but I'm hearing from my reservist. I got one letter the other day from a reservist who owns a uh, dry cleaning, has another job on top of that. He says his wife is working 65 hours a week. The business uh, is in bad straits. We would provide some small business loans specifically for, res for reservists who can show that mobilization has been an impediment to their business. And finally, we provide some vocational de development money for reservists as well. All of these are small potatoes compared to this bill. This total bill is $87 billion. The cost of all of these proposals put together is $820 million. That's 1%, less than 1% of the total package that you've got here. Surely in this package, we can do 1% for our troops in light of what they've done for us in, in the Iraqi theater. Secondly, Mr. Chairman, and I'll, I'll, I'll close quickly, there is an accountability amendment here. The bill already has an accountability provision in it that I think Mr. Young added. Uh, Mr. Hoyer added to that in markup. We're adding some additional provisions, some of which, frankly, were taken from Mr. Stevens, Senator Stevens' markup in the, uh, in the Senate. And let me just say generally that we think we should ask for a lot of accountability here for several reasons. Number one, it's a lot of money, $87 billion. Number two, I've been here 22 years. I've never seen a bill this size move in this manner just through one committee to the floor. Ordinarily, when I came here, defense bills were barely $87 billion, the whole defense bill, and we put it through an elaborate two-step authorization appropriations process. And like the fact that we haven't done that, and we've given most of this money or are giving most of this money in broad, generic accounts. It's not earmarked to particular purposes as justification documents, as committee language, but by and large, this money is on a pretty long leash. Then we need to shorten the leash and require more reporting so we can find out where the money is going. Secondly, I wish I believed that this was the last supplemental, but it's not. There'll be more. And we need to know in the budget process what the size of these supplementals is likely to be. You cannot budget when you have a $63 billion, when you have an $80 billion supplemental in April and a nearly $90 billion, $87 billion supplemental in October. It just throws everything out of kilter. If we can get this information on a quarterly or monthly basis, as we're requesting here, we'll be in a lot better situation to estimate what the likely defense bill is going to be, supplementals plus base budgeting. In fact, I would like to see us ask DOD, insist the DOD, that they make their best estimate of what it's going to cost to be in uh, Iraq for 2005 and send it up with their budget, but that's not in here. We're just asking for some further elaboration with respect to accountability, which I think we should ask for in a bill of this magnitude and a matter of this importance. Thank you very much. Are these uh, quality of life proposals in bill form before your committee? Yes, sir. They are. Yes, sir. They certainly are indeed. And they, they, we have adapted them so they could be amended to the bill. Some of them we could go to the floor, I believe. For example, the uh, imminent danger pay. I think we could go to the floor if we brought it an offset and add $25 to the imminent danger pay. And a couple of others like that where with some crafty drafting we could take care of it. But some of them won't. We can't get them to the floor unless you'll give us the dispensation of a rule. But I think this would be a great way for the Congress to say, Democrats and Republicans alike, thank you to our troops and to their families. We're trying to help you out. Mr. Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Pratt, just to follow up on that, uh, uh, you, uh, if I heard uh, the Chairman ask you about uh, our, the, some of these proposals in bill form, the defense authorization bill is still in conference. It seems to me that would be an ideal place to uh, to put the authorizations and some of the authorizations that you mentioned here. Is that are, is that being contemplated? 
Ms. Tate's defense authorization bill has been in conference for months now, and if we loaded it down with these additional provisions, it probably never would see daylight. Uh, it's, they've already got more than they can chew and, and, uh, and digest. So I, I don't think there's much chance of my putting these recommendations in a full file and taking them over to the uh, defense conferees. Well, I, I just asked the question in the sense that, uh, that you imply that there's broad support, and I would certainly say some of these things are because we uncovered some of these issues after, of course, the conflict started uh, in Iraq. So I, th I say it uh, from that in that sense, and you're, you're of course, a very valued member of that uh, of that committee. If we had an authorization process here, and with a bill of this size, $87 billion, I really think we should have done that. But since if we had, I can almost guarantee you these provisions, almost all of them, would have been adopted in committee. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Frost. Ms. Pratt, at least one of your proposals would require a change in the tax code. That's right. And uh, this committee, in response to Mr. Lantos and in response to, uh, uh, to uh, Mr. Obie earlier in the day, uh, has indicated that they are unlikely to make in order any changes in the tax code. Uh, so I don't know what your position is on that matter. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Lantos and Mr. Obie had asked that uh, the top 1% be, uh, be required to give back, uh, top 1% of taxpayers be required to give back some of their very generous tax benefits from the last three years, and uh, the majority has, uh, is in the process of turning a cold shoulder to that. So if they're not going to permit Mr. Lantos and Mr. Obi to offer their provisions, uh, I doubt they would offer you know, let you offer your provision uh, regarding the tax code and the non-taxability of the death benefit. Well, let me point out that the tax deduction for reserve travel expenses is contained in a bill which is at the desk right now. Mm -hmm. So it has been through both houses. Slightly different bill came over from the Senate, but nevertheless, it's at the desk. All we've got to do is use this bill as a vehicle for passing it. Secondly, the other tax exemption for death gratuity is not the sort of big tax issue that requires the ways and means to sit in judgment on it and only they to exercise their jurisdiction upon it. This is a simple matter. The equity of it ought to be obvious to everybody. There's no reason in the world to tax the death gratuity. I would agree with you, but uh, if we take the uh, majority's uh, argument to its logical extreme, uh, they're not going to permit that to be offered either. Well. There's a lot more left in the package. I would hope they would put that in it, too. Maybe we can get that done in conference. Ms. Myrick. Uh, excuse me if I did not hear correctly. Yeah. Um, I support what you're trying to do, of course. But did you? S it, are you saying you're offsetting this with tax policy oh, yeah. changes? No, 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 we're off no, absolutely not. We're offsetting this with $820 million in reduction in the reconstruction and assistance package. OK. Uh, and, and we've been somewhat specific, but these are big accounts. So, I understand. So we do take it out of that, but we put it back into the uh, soldiers' pay envelope. Thanks. Ms. Slaughter? No questions, but I certainly support your amendment. Mr. McGovern. I want to thank the gentleman for both of, both his amendments. Um, certainly, you know, his amendment to, to support our troops, uh, it just seems so logical and so right that we do this, that, um, you know, to try to to uh, to hide behind some sort of procedural maneuver to deny you the opportunity to do that would seem to be a sh you know shameful given what these men and women are sacrificing uh, on behalf of our country i mean there's you know you, you you listed some of the things that need to be done but you know we have an armed forces tax fairness act that is still languishing that uh really should go to the president's desk uh i've talked to members of the national guard and reserves uh, who uh you know when they're uh, uh when they're not serving on active duty, don't have health care. I read an article the other day that 20 percent of our National Guard and 40 percent of junior uh, enlisted personnel lack health coverage when not serving on active duty. Um, you know, we, we, we have an administration that continues to tax our disabled veterans, unlike uh, disabled federal civilian retirees. Uh, we're underfunding our, our VA programs. Uh, I mean, uh, what you're advocating here just seems to me to be uh, something that both Republicans and Democrats should be able to get behind and kind of put the politics aside and just do it. I mean, it just, it's, it's the right thing to do. And on the issue, your Second Amendment, on the issue of accountability, uh, my colleague from Florida, Mr. Hastings, asked point blank the, uh, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee and the ranking Democrat on the Appropriations Committee um, if they knew how 
the $79 billion that we already approved was spent? And they both said no. So, I mean, if there's ever an argument uh, to shorten the leash so that we know how the hell all this money is being spent, so we know that the taxpayers aren't getting ripped off, so we know it's going where it should be going, uh, I think your Second Amendment is, uh, is also very, very important. And so uh, I strongly support uh, both of your amendments, and I thank you for, for being thank here. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hastings. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Spratt, in your absence, um, your amendments came uh, uh, to the members. And I spoke um, at that time very much in favor uh, in your absence. I didn't know whether you were going to be able to show up. So I won't repeat that, save the fact that um, uh, to associate myself with the uh, remarks of our colleagues, um, hopefully we would give you the dispensation or the waiver necessary in order for your amendment to be made in order. If it is not, then let me be among the first to request that I be made uh, an original co-sponsor if you introduce it as standalone and don't get it out of conference or someplace because it's uh, so desperately needed. All of us here from uh, the National Guard and the Reserve Forces, and we know uh, uh, just how difficult uh, many uh, of their lives are made by, and you have addressed um, uh, some of their issues um, and ones that are critical. So I'm hopeful that we will uh, make your amendment in order. Uh, but I, I again, uh, uh, say that if we do not, then please follow that standard. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Spratt. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. <clears throat> Ms. Pence, please join us. Welcome. We have prepared remarks. We'll be happy to make them part of the record without objection, and uh, we would welcome a summary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief. I want to thank you and the members of the committee for uh, your uh, yeoman's work. I'm sure we'll go many more hours today. I, I come before you today on the issue, very simply, of whether reconstruction costs in Iraq should take the form of a grant or a loan. A much celebrated debate in the other body and a debate that I hope we're able to join uh, in this end of the Capitol. Um, on this issue, I, I have considered the arguments of the administration carefully, Mr. Chairman, and the opinions more to the point of my constituents, uh, and have done so with great deliberation and prayer. Uh, and I've decided uh, ultimately to, to bring an amendment before this committee believing that it's appropriate for me to stand firm in my belief that a portion of the re reconstruction costs in Iraq should eventually be repaid by the Iraqi people to the people of the United States. I listened with great interest um, earlier in this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and to the remarks made by the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee, who pointed out one of the arguments against a loan uh, for reconstruction in Iraq is that, uh, to quote Chairman Young, quote, there is no authority in Iraq to whom we may make a loan, close quote, and that's a very legitimate point. I also uh, heard uh, the ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, Mr. Obi, make very thoughtful remarks about uh, the need uh, to move the debate beyond the pure grant versus pure loan debate, recognizing that there are short-term needs in Iraq and there are long-term needs and that what we need, as Mr. Obi said, was to have a, quote, rational balance uh, between the elements of reconstruction that represent a grant and those which represent a loan. And the Pence Amendment is very much forged in respect to both of those observations by both of those distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. I would offer uh, humbly that the Pence Amendment is truly a middle ground between the challenges of extending a loan to a nascent Iraq and the desire of the American people to see this oil-rich nation bear the cost at some point in the future of building a civil society. Uh, in addition to other arguments that they've made, the administration has focused on the issue raised by Chairman Young, most notably. that it's impossible to move forward with a loan because there is not an established government in Iraq. Uh, and that is a legitimate issue and represents a problem for anyone who believes in promoting a loan for reconstruction. In recognition of this reality, the Pence Amendment makes the first 50% of the funding available immediately as a grant. 
giving priority consideration to emergency purposes of security, electric sector infrastructure, oil infrastructure, public works, water resources, and other emergency needs. Once the administration, under my amendment, informs Congress that a democratically elected government in Iraq has been established, the balance of the funding would made be made available in the form of loans from the United States government under terms and conditions to be negotiated by the President of the United States. And after having addressed these logistical concerns by the administration, I, I believe if we can resolve this question of who we make a loan to, Mr. Chairman, that we ought to otherwise uh, defer to the consent of the governor. Uh, as was recounted in a, a national newspaper earlier this week, even in my conservative district all across heartland eastern Indiana, uh, the overwhelming majority of constituents that I met with over the last several weeks, and most notably this weekend, uh, support uh, some repayment of reconstruction costs. And I believe they, they do so because uh, of, a, of a common sense that this is an oil-rich nation. Mr. Lantos referred to the estimate of some $7 trillion on which the nation of Iraq floats, the second largest oil reserve for any single nation on the planet. And Americans know that, Mr. Chairman, and I believe that drives their sense. Even today, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Iraq's interim trade minister, Ali Alawi, announced uh, in uh, Canberra, Australia, that Iraq is planning to increase its oil production from the current 2 million barrels a day that they are currently producing to 3.5 million barrels in, quote, the medium term throughout 2004. Uh, this would result in, in most estimates, uh, given world prices for crude, uh, in, uh, in Iraq realizing in excess of $20 billion in revenue uh, before we get to the end of 2004 uh, from the sale of oil. It represents an extraordinary treasure, and I submit humbly that the American people uh, are driven in their desire that some portion of this be alone by that fact. I also believe that at a time of mounting federal deficits, making a portion of the reconstruction alone also reassures the American people that there is an end game strategy, financially speaking, in Iraq. Uh, I, I've, I've said many times in recent days, my constituents are not, despite the national media's best efforts, my constituents are not deeply troubled about a military quagmire in Iraq, but they are somewhat troubled about a financial quagmire. And by beginning the process of reconstruction through loans, we would signal a partnership with the people of Iraq in their own future. And lastly, I think, as has been said many times today, by making a portion of the infrastructure spending alone, Mr. Chairman, Congress would set an important precedent as we begin a partnership that we, we know will continue, there will be additional needs for reconstruction. And, and it seems to me altogether fitting that as we begin this project with the people of Iraq, that we would begin it as a new kind of thing than the direct investment. I close uh, as I respectfully request the committee waive certain points of order against my amendment. I close simply with the, the conviction that um, that, uh, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will support the final version of the Iraq Supplemental, uh, and I will support the rule of this uh, committee because of the importance of this legislation, because I'm anxious to support the President and support our troops. But nevertheless, I, I would offer the Pence Amendment with a firm belief that the United States should provide for the liberty and security of Iraq, but improvements in the civil society of Iraq should ultimately be borne by the Iraqi people. Thank you. I thank the chair. <clears throat> Ms. Hastings. Ms. Slaughter? No questions, but good effort, Mr. Bates. I wish you well. Ms. Merrick? No, I'd like to identify with your remarks. I have a district very similar to yours, and the people feel the same way. And um, I support your amendment. I also am going to vote for the final bill, but I would like to see your amendment get a waiver. Mr. McGovern? Well, I. I support your, your right to offer this amendment. I'm disappointed with your comment about that you will support the rule even if they don't make your amendment in order because the bottom line is they're not going to make your amendment in order. You need a, you need a waiver uh, for your amendment. And, um, and again, I mean, I, I think it, um, it would have been more powerful. I think you're, it might have enhanced your case if you would have uh, said that, uh, you know, that uh, just like we 
hope for democracy in Iraq. We'd like a little democracy here in the United States House of Representatives, and that all members who have good ideas and thoughtful ideas, like the one that you have proposed here, you should have an opportunity to be able to debate this on, this, on, your, on the floor. I mean, it's not just your constituents in Indiana who are concerned about the cost and who's paying for it and where the money's coming from. My constituents in Massachusetts, constituents in California and, and New York and all over the place, uh, you know, have the same um, um, have the same concerns. And um, so I, uh, you know, I again I, I I'll support your right to offer it, but um, don't hold your breath that this committee is going to give it to you. And especially since you're not going to stand up and oppose a rule that doesn't uh, that doesn't uh, give you a, give you a waiver. Let me just ask you one question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you, you talk about a democratically elected government in Iraq. Uh, when do you expect that to happen? I know the administration has uh, given a deadline for in mid-December. Uh, we were told in the International Relations Committee uh, for the implementation of a plan to move towards the formation of a constitution and elections. Um, uh, but it, I, I think it, it uh, uh, the sense that I've had is that that is something that is hoped for and expected within the next year to 18 months. But if there's no democratically elected government in Iraq uh, for the foreseeable future, then as we continue with these, this piecemeal approach to more and more, because this is not the last one, we'll be back here next year. There'll be some more money. There'll be another another request. Wh whoever gets elected in the future is bound by all these loans that we're giving now, or how does how does this work? Well, in in the Pence Amendment, we try and make sure that the terms and conditions uh, are negotiated by the President of the United States, and and. Uh, um, without trying to micromanage what might be built into those arrangements given different exigencies, particularly if it takes longer to make the transition uh, to a democratic uh, government in that country. Well, I appreciate your testimony. Again, I just urge you to, to reconsider. I mean, if, if, if you're not given the respect to be able to offer your amendment, I, I would hope that you'd vote against the rule. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Hastings. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Pence. Um, uh, pretty obviously, you're making a conscientious effort to do what um, uh, many members of the U.S. Senate uh, have done in different forms, or uh, even stronger uh, than uh, you suggest with the half-and-half -half approach. I, I, I seriously question why you leave it in the hands of uh, 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 the President to do that negotiation. I heard you say so as how to avoid micromanaging, but it seems to me not so much uh, President Bush. He may not be the president at such time that a loan would come due or be made payable. It may be 20 years from now. As a matter of fact, rather ironically, on the floor, um, either uh, passed or uh, to be voted upon is a measure offered by uh, one of our colleagues in the majority uh, suggesting that Russia, France, and Germany forgive their debt. That's on the floor today as we speak. So uh, the history of um, loans after war is a good. Russia never paid us. I could go on and on and on. And I would hope uh, that what we would be doing is trying to cinch this thing if it was that these people were to pay back some portion. Now, why, why the president and why take away oversight powers that Congress can and rightly ought have? It's a very legitimate question, and uh, I appreciate the gentleman for asking. Uh, in, in, the, in the Pence Amendment, and I didn't emphasize this in my remarks, but would ex uh, recommend it to your attention, actually, sentence two requires the President to prepare and transmit to the Committee on Appropriations of the House of Representatives and the Senate a report in writing that describes the programs, projects, activities that have been financed uh, by such initial funds and includes a detailed analysis of the extent of such programs. Uh, to your point raised earlier in this very same hearing, I, I feel very strongly that the Congress has an oversight obligation. And part of what I contemplate in drafting the Pence Amendment is to facilitate uh, that relationship between the executive and the legislative branch by actually requiring a report. I have to understand that the first 50 percent that you make or in your amendment a grant, is it your thinking or as a part of your thinking that for force protection and everything else, that is needed and needed right away? But is there anything to stop us uh, from having that kick over at some point into a loan? In other words, we're going to give you something to jumpstart you, then we're going to make you a loan to jumpstart you some more. 
is what you're saying. I, it, why not just make it all or nothing at all? Well, the biggest reason, uh, if the gentleman will yield, yes, is, um, has to do with the uh, what I think is a very legitimate point by the administration that um, it is problematic to extend a loan to a government that. Uh, is in its nascent form or even non-existent at this point. We have the Iraqi Governing Council, but we don't know what the people of Iraq will choose in the form of a government or a constitution. And so, but there are very urgent needs. I spoke to Ambassador Bremer today uh, for over a half hour in Baghdad. There are very urgent needs that are very real, and I, and I am loath uh, to support uh, uh, any effort to, uh, uh, that, that would result in those resources not making their way. Uh, to Iraq, but but it's about meeting those needs on the front end, uh, while at the same time giving the American people some assurance that it, that six months to a year to 18 months from now, when the balance of the funds uh, are extended uh, to Iraq, that those would be in the form of a loan. I understand your point. I hope it's made in order because I certainly think uh, the House should work as well on <coughs> uh, something as serious as you presented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. The next um, person on the list is Mr. DeFazio. Please join us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I come before the Please. esteemed and powerful rules committee. Uh, Peter, push that button. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to say that again, Doc? <laughs> um, I come as uh, did. Uh, a number of the members before me asking uh, that the committee make uh, in order an amendment so that the uh, House can work its will. Uh, you know, the President feels very strongly, as do apparently a number of our colleagues, uh, that uh, substantial investment in uh, Iraq's economy and infrastructure is necessary in order to begin and develop, uh, you know, a democratic and civil society there. Uh, I, you know, would note that I think that in order to maintain one, you need some of the same sorts of investments, and that's here in the United States uh, with record high unemployment in my state, and we heard from uh, Mr. Manzullo and others, uh, high unemployment in their districts, that uh, the needs uh, are very similar in many of our congressional districts. The, um, I would further note that much of the uh, nearly, it's, it's a, a total is over $20 billion, despite the reductions in this bill when you add in the first. Uh, emergency supplemental for Iraq, and this one, the, the civilian reconstruction, civil reconstruction or construction of Iraq is over $20 billion. Much of it is not reconstruction, uh, and a lot of people are under the impression that we're repairing damage caused by the war. No. We are paying to update their infrastructure, which has been neglected, as uh, Chairman Lewis said earlier on the floor, horrible neglect of their infrastructure. They have outmoded, outdated. Uh, boilers for their steam generators for their electrical system. So the United States of America is going to borrow money uh, on behalf of its uh, taxpayers to give them, com you know, combined cycle turbines, state-of-the-art generation, and update their system. I don't know that that is clearly our responsibility. I would certainly support any of these amendments that would make uh, those subject to loans, but apparently that's not in the cards. But absent all that, uh, then I would like my amendment to be made in order, which is to make the point that these needs are mirrored in the United States of America. We've had blackouts in the East and the West in the last couple of years. We need investment in the electrical grid. Uh, the ports in my district and other districts are being threatened uh, with zero funding for dredging because uh, the administration says there's not enough money to dredge them, yet we're about to put the second $50 million into the already very functional port in Iraq to give them a state-of-the-art container facility. Well, I'd really like to have one of those uh, in Coos Bay in my district. Uh, we're, uh, Mr. Bremer is appalled that water is supplied to Basra through open but lined canals. Uh, one of the larger cities in my district receives its water through open but unlined canals, a project that was uh, built 120 years ago. Uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, um, Iraqis are going to be paid, as they have been paid, for no-show jobs, jobs in the civil service or jobs elsewhere that don't exist, but they'll be paid to show up or not show up with money borrowed on behalf of the American taxpayers in order to maintain civil order. Well, things are getting a bit uncivil in my district with the fact that we can't draw down on the unemployment trust fund taxes already paid on account to extend unemployment benefits. And I know in Washington State, uh, there's some of these same problems are reflected. 
uh, with a very high un persistent unemployment and elsewhere in the country. So uh, my amendment is simple. It would just say that we, the Congress, would match uh, dollar for dollar the investments that are going to be made in building the infrastructure of Iraq, roads, bridges, highways, water systems, sewer systems, ports, electrical grid, health care, schools. Those same needs uh, would be funded here, matched dollar for dollar. And I, I suppose some people are going to then object and say, oh my gosh, you, you know, you'd increase the deficit. Well, I, I, we would be, if we borrowed the money, borrowing the money to invest in our country, which I think a lot of our constituents would be a bit more supportive of, providing the jobs, an estimated 40 to 50,000 jobs per billion dollars of investment. This could be over a million jobs uh, with borrowed money. Or we could spend down the Unemployment Trust Fund, the Highway Trust Fund, the FAA Trust Fund, and accomplish most of the match uh, without borrowing any money, uh, but again, uh, benefiting American workers, American, uh, uh, you know, American society, and stimulating the economy here in order to create a civil and democratic uh, society with uh, everybody who wants to work working, or at least uh, being made whole in a bad economy. Uh, there are over 100. Uh, this was introduced in slightly different form separately as the American Parity Act by myself and Mr. Emanuel. We have over 100 co-sponsors uh, and uh, would ask respectfully that the committee uh, just allow us an up or down vote. And if you get the votes to beat us, fine, but, you know, just give us a chance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Hastings? Ms. Slaughter? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Hastings? I appreciate that, Mr. DeFazio, and I support you as you. Mr. Chairman, I support the gentleman's amendment. I don't have any uh, uh, questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You Chairman. Much. Thank you for being here. Next witness will be Mr. Tanner from Tennessee. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please turn on your uh, microphone for us, John. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't impose on the committee very long. I recognize the fact that the bill will not be split into two parts, those supporting the military provisions and those uh, dealing with the reconstruction of Iraq or the construction in Iraq. I also recognize that the political will to pay for this is unfortunately not uh, present in the Congress. And so I'm offering a one-sentence amendment that I'm afraid uh, my buddy Mr. Hastings won't agree to, but it just says this. None of the funds made available in the bill for Iraq reconstruction may be provided in a form other than loans leaves complete discretion to the administration as to how, when, where, what, and so on, but it's based on a very simple premise that people that are benefiting from the uh, loan ought to, uh, uh, from the loan proceeds, ought to pay for it. Uh, somebody's got to borrow $20 billion. Now, should it be the American taxpayers and our children, or should it be the people who benefit from loan proceeds? Uh, which are the Iraqi people. And uh, this basically leaves to the administration the, the, the fine points, but it just is based on the simple notion that the people who benefit from loan proceeds ought to be the ones borrowing it. Thank you. Mr. Hastings? Ms. Slaughter? Ms. Myrick? Mr. McGovern? I just want to say I, I, I will certainly vote to make the gentleman's amendment in order, and. Uh, I hope that if it's not made in order, he'll vote against the rule. <laughs> he will. All right. Good. Thank you. Mr. Hastings? Well, that can pretty much guarantee you voting against the rule. I understand. Look, Mr. I Mr. Tanner, I, I'm really open-minded uh, on the subject. I don't think your amendment is a, a bad amendment. My concern um, uh, is Congressional placing it in. And I understand that, yeah. but I, this is offered out of desperation. We can't split it up. We can't pay for it. So maybe. Uh, something will go off in people's head that people who benefit from the loan proceeds ought to be the ones borrowing it. Yeah. We're going to borrow. Somebody's going to borrow it. It's either yeah. going to be us or them. They get the proceeds. Why shouldn't they be the ones borrowing it, not us? Well, I thought that, Mr. Pence, before you, at the very least, and perhaps you might want to consider amending, uh, to say when they do get uh, a government ostensibly well, they don't a, have one and he did take that into consideration well, got a government now they're uh, representing themselves at this uh, conference in the far east in you mean uh, the, the provisional government the one in the, at the donor conference uh, that's coming up in well, spain it's the one or one that's now. going on now in the far east it has well, to do they I, made a statement they don't want the turks to come in to help us uh, yeah so there's some kind of government over there right but but they have not been recognized by the United Nations as a, a they government. They had some uh, recognition extended to them, I think. 
Well, I just well, want you. Or not, I want Iraqi. you to know that I want the American taxpayer to be able to receive um, all their money. I also want the American taxpayer to know how their money is it's being spent, spent. Well, so and uh, that's uh, a principal concern. Before we thrust ourselves into grant loan or any other environment, I'd like to know what we this did. This is with the most benign form of language I could think of. I understand. To try to make the point <laughs> I, that again, that the people who benefit from a loan ought to be the ones born. I money. thank the gentleman for his thoughtful amendment, and I hope it's made in order. Thank you, thank Mr. you Mr. Chairman. Ms. Waters, welcome. Mr. Chairman, members, I thank you for the opportunity to come before you today to um, uh, impress upon you that um, the bill be considered under an open rule and that waivers be granted on my amendments and those of Mr. Obey and those of many of my colleagues so the House can work its will on the many issues that are, are raised. Uh, by involvement in Iraq, uh, so that the world can understand the apprehension and concerns that many of us have about the Iraq Supplemental Appropriations Bill. As Chairman and members, uh, I was in a press conference today with the members of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, where we basically unveiled our strong opposition uh, to the Supplemental Appropriation. Uh, I have known, well, actually, I've been alarmed um, since I first heard about the President's request for $87 billion. It's a lot of money. Uh, I was alarmed because, as was mentioned here today, we don't know what has happened to the $79 billion uh, that we appropriated. Uh, and I, I'm happy I was in here today, and I sat and I listened while uh, Mr. Hastings raised the question of uh, our committee chairman, Appropriations Committee chairman, and the ranking member and ask them if they knew uh, what had happened to the money that we have appropriated in the past. And both had to admit that they don't know. And that's what the American people are asking us. Uh, we have to represent uh, our constituents. And I've seen both Democrats and Republicans coming here today uh, attempting to represent their constituents. They don't have any answers. Uh, as a matter of fact, we are alarmed not only about the amount of money that is being requested, but we've been so misled uh, by this administration about why we went to war, uh, still no weapons of mass destruction, uh, the drones that were supposed to be able to dispense chemical and biological warfare, uh, the um, lack of uh, uh, documentation of the request, so-called request by Saddam Hussein uh, for yellow cake or uranium in Nigeria uh, all turned out to be uh, untrue. Uh, we had Colin Powell uh, testify before the UN and show pictures of buildings and sheds where supposedly biological and chemical warfare was being manufactured. Turned out not to be true. And to add insult to injury and further undermine um, their own credibility, um, the action that was taken by someone high uh, in this administration that outed um, someone uh, in the CIA, the wife of Ambassador Wilson, uh, just absolutely puts us in a position uh, where we must not only raise the questions, but deny uh, our vote in support of this $87 billion. There are a lot of uh, a lot of amendments that you're going to hear about. My first amendment is simply an amendment that says that not one dime, even if uh, the members are of a mind to support $87 billion, that not one dime should be spent without an exit strategy. You know, the chairman uh, who was here today said, well, you know, we don't have an exit strategy anyplace else. We don't have this kind of a commitment anyplace else. We're not asking for $87 billion anyplace else. And it's not too much to ask for a plan. What are your ideas? What are your thoughts? What are your vision for when we will get out of Iraq? Uh, to simply ask for an exit strategy is not too much. And I think it would show some respect for the members of, uh, of this House by saying you at least thought about it, and these are your thoughts. Uh, we have been disrespected enough by Mr. Rumsfeld, and even though there's some attempt uh, to change the messenger 
uh, the message has not changed. Uh, this administration still stands behind all of the misrepresentations. They still stand behind the request without an exit strategy. They still stand behind the request without, um, without telling us um, how much more money they're going to need, and they'll be back again uh, for another enormous sum, sum of money in the very near future, still with no answers. So my First Amendment would simply ask that there be an exit strategy uh, before one dime uh, of uh, this request could be spent. My Second Amendment would require competitive bidding on all contracts awarded for activities in Iraq. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, I talk about uh, the fact that uh, this administration lacks credibility. It is shameful uh, that this administration blatantly sole source contracts uh, to Halliburton. Uh, the company where our vice president served as CEO. You cannot make any American believe uh, that that was not a sweetheart deal. We don't want to continue to see that. As a matter of fact, it raises speculations about why we're there and who's benefiting from this war. Uh, and we don't want to see this kind of thing continue to happen. Now, I know that there may be a reason why you want to expedite the competitive bid process. So my amendment uh, would allow for an expedited process uh, that could take place uh, within 30 days rather than something that would be dragged out for months or years. But it would include in it uh, certain criteria uh, in this expedited process uh, that you could do for a competitive bid. You'd have to consider the cost. You'd have to consider the diversity of personnel. Uh, you would have to consider uh, whether or not consideration was built into the contract uh, for language and cultural um, uh, considerations so that uh, these uh, response to this request for proposal uh, would be uh, a competitive bid uh, response uh, with certain kind of basic criteria built in uh, in an expedited period, but it would, in fact, be a competitive bid. This sole sourcing has got to stop. Um, you know, the Vice President of the United States claims he has no connection to Halliburton, uh, but he just forgot to tell us uh, that he had uh, some delayed uh, compensation uh, that he was continuing to collect. The American people don't like this. And Mr. Chairman, I come from California, and people have shown us how angry they can get about uh, deficits, about uh, lack of jobs, about a failing economy, and about not being told the truth and not being engaged in what is going on. And that is what is happening to us now. And both Democrats and Republicans are going to pay a price. I know that I'm not the only one here that's concerned about this $87 billion. And I'm not trying to pretend that I'm holier than thou and I care more about the soldiers than anybody else. But I tell you, we have to demonstrate uh, I care and concern in some way. For all of those people who are afraid or intimidated or feel that someone's going to think that they're unpatriotic if they don't support the $87 billion, they're going to have to pay a price. And so I am here to simply say I care and I want to demonstrate that I care uh, simply by having these amendments and I would ask that they be made in order. My third amendment is designed to preserve and protect the assets of the Iraqi oil industry so that the Iraqi people will benefit from the fair value of these assets. All that we know now is that oil is the most important natural resource that Iraq has. The administration has said repeatedly that our efforts in Iraq are designed to preserve the assets for the Iraqi people until a democratically elected government is in place and that the Iraqi people can make their own choices about whether to sell Iraqi oil assets to foreign entities. If we intend to act as a fiduciary to protect the assets of Iraq from plundering through transfers to third parties on terms that do not fairly reflect the value of these assets, then this bill needs language that will protect Iraqi oil assets from such plundering to ensure that Iraqis will receive the full benefits from Iraqi oil industry assets 
My amendment would require that the President make certain that not more than 35 percent of the assets of Iraqi's oil industry are sold to foreign entities, that is, non-Iraqi entities, until a democratically elected government is in place in Iraq. Once such a government is established, the Iraqi government may act to remove this cap if it so desires, but only after a constitution has been adopted, elections have taken place, and the constitutionally elected president has been in office for at least one year. To further ensure that the Iraqi people are not taken advantage of, during this transition period, my amendment requires that prior to the transfer of Iraqi oil industry assets, the Controller General certify the value of the oil industry assets proposed for such transfer and determine that any foreign company purchasing such assets is paying fair market value for the assets subject to the transfer. I believe that requiring such fairness uh, um, is necessary to ensure that no company takes advantage of the chaos and confusion inside Iraq or a sweetheart relationship uh, with the administrator of Iraq to purchase Iraqi oil assets at fair uh, sale prices. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, while we're asking the American taxpayers uh, to spend money on the reconstruction of Iraq and pay for retrofitting um, the oil industry and all of that equipment, I know that there are many in this administration who will turn around and talk about privatizing the oil industry, and that's what I'm trying to protect against. We should not ask the American taxpayers to spend their dollars uh, to rebuild this industry, to retrofit this industry, and then turn around and privatize it to the same uh, oil companies that will be in position to take control of it. And I think you know what we're talking about as we look around the world and see the American oil companies that are in other countries in control of, uh, of oil assets. I would ask that my amendments be made in order, and I thank you for your patience, thank Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Hastings? Ms. Slaughter? Thank you. Mr. McGovern? Thank you. I thank the gentlelady for her amendments and for her testimony for continuing to ask the tough questions. Um, I mean, uh, and um, I, uh, I certainly support both of her amendments in, in committee. Mr. Hastings. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Waters knows that I support all three of the amendments, and in the interest of time, I won't belabor it at this point. Thank you. No. Thank you, Ms. Waters. Thank you. Mr. Deutsch. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, um, I come in front of this committee as someone who. If you have a prepared statement, we'll make it I, part of the I record. I do not. Um, you can summarize. Thank you. Um, I come in front of this committee as someone that voted for the use of force in Iraq. I, I think it was the right decision then. I still think it was the right decision. I come to this uh, proposal, this uh, supplemental appropriations, um, as a separate issue and, and uh, give us each an opportunity to look at what is going on in a very specific light. Uh, before the war in Iraq, uh, Iraq was part of OPEC. Iraq is part of OPEC today. Um, after any reconstruction efforts that occur, uh, by all indications, um, Iraq will be part of OPEC. Uh, the reality is that we talk about large numbers as an $87 billion supplemental. We talk in large numbers about multi-hundreds of billions of dollars of tax cut. There is a tax that is being assessed on the American public to the tune of hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars. And that's a tax, and that is a tax by the monopoly power of OPEC. And there is nothing more important that this Congress can do and this country can do to get rid of that tax. And we have the ability to do it. And to not use this ability, this moment in time to do that, I think would be a historic mistake for this Congress, for this committee, and for each of us. Iraq will be rebuilt uh, with more than likely, um, if amendments like this are not made in order, with American taxpayer dollars. 
Once that occurs, Iraq, as I said, has, by all indications, will continue to be part of OPEC, taxing us through monopoly power to the tune, as I said, of hundreds of billions of dollars, who will go to countries, including Saudi Arabia, who, by our best accounts at this point, are funding 50 percent of the terrorism that exists in the world today. And in fact, there's something wrong with the picture in this supplemental bill. And th what's wrong in this picture is that we are paying money to people who are taxing us to continue to tax us larger than the worst caricature of elected officials at their worst, to then give money to terrorists whose intent is to kill us. And that, in fact, is a circular situation that is presented in this supplemental. We need to break out of that. We need to break out of it, and the, the amendment that I'm offering gives us that opportunity. And I think it is a really a, a, a compromise of sorts at many levels. You know, there is a real effort, I think, amongst all of us uh, to make the rebuilding effort, the administration effort in Iraq, a multilateral effort. Um, there was a moment in time where it could have been a multilateral effort after the major military conflict ended. The President made a policy decision not to do that, which is a policy decision that I think all of Americans and, in fact, all people of the world, unfortunately, in hindsight, um, are living with today. But once that policy decision was made, I think we have the hindsight of recent history to say that it needs to be unmade. So we need to how to make this a multilateral effort. Well, the World Bank has the ability to do loans in international settings. And it is a forum in which a loan, in fact, can be done of a sizable amount, a $20 billion loan effort. So the amendment proposes that the reconstruction part of the supplemental be contingent upon the World Bank joining our efforts in rebuilding Iraq, but more specifically, in terms of Iraqi oil fields. The supplemental uh, provides uh, $2.1 billion in reconstruction efforts on Iraqi oil construction. Uh, that will, at best, be able to get Iraq to a production level of about 3 million barrels a day. Uh, there is the, Iraq is the second largest oil reserves in the world. We're no longer talking in the billions. We're talking in the trillions, if not tens of trillions of dollars that Iraq has in their oil reserves. And the question, be and, and physically, Iraq has the ability to produce at least six million barrels of oil a day. That really should be the goal of the Iraqi people, but it really should be the goal of the United States Congress and the United States to put Iraq in a position where they, in fact, can produce six million barrels of oil a day. And in fact, the loan that the amendment proposes through the World Bank would be used specifically for that. If Iraq were producing six million barrels of oil a day, OPEC as an entity would effectively cease to exist. Their monopoly leverage over United States taxpayers and over the world would, in fact, end. Um, I see no better way to help both the Iraqi people in terms of their reconstruction efforts uh, and the American people in terms of eliminating potentially a trillion dollars in taxes uh, than to support this amendment um, and uh, really, again, get out of the circular reason where we literally are giving terrorists money um, through monopoly power of OPEC, literally giving them money so that they then can kill us or attempt to kill us. Thank you. Mr. Hastings? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Stupak. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Welcome. members of the committee. I ask that my formal statement be made Without part of the record. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, seldom do I come before this committee with uh, five amendments like I do today, but this is a very controversial piece of legislation in my district, and I think we can see from the testimony we've heard thus far today, and you've sat through a lot more than I have, that uh, there's a lot of concern here on how we're approaching this, how we're doing this $87 billion on top of a $79 billion we did earlier this year. And like so many others, I also believe that any 
aid for reconstruction, not the military part. I think the $65 billion that the administration is asking for for military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, I dare say most members, if not all, would support that request. But we want to separate out that other $20 billion that really seems to be the controversy, not only amongst members and certainly amongst our constituents. So my First Amendment would be to provide $18.6 billion reconstruction, not as a handout, but again, a loan, and that all reconstruction funds provided in the bill be provided in a form of a repayable loans, not grants, and then to secure those loans, we'd use the Iraqi oil as collateral. In June of this year, I went back and double-checked this figure, that CRS estimated Iraqi oil revenue could generate 50 to $60 billion annually. I see no reason why we cannot see, use one half of one year's total as collateral for this loan. The Second Amendment would require that Iraq or from any other source, world source, any other European nations, to provide at least a 50% matching fund for any security, relief, rehabilitation, and reconstruction for Iraq. It is hard to go back home, explain to my constituents, not only every federal program that comes back to the states and the local communities, they always say there's all kinds of strings attached and there's always a matching fund. If we're going to reconstruct Iraq, and we have so many needs in this country, everything comes with a matching some kind of formula. Why can't we apply some kind of formula here? If we're going to do 50% grant in the U.S., why don't we do 50% grant with Iraq, 50% loan? I understand both of these amendments uh, may not be appropriate, so I'm asking for a waiver, and my formal statement sets that forth a little more than, than I am here today. Also, another amendment I'll be offering, or would like to offer today, would prohibit funds in the bill from being used to purchase foreign steel for reconstruction of Iraq. As you know, there's a large steel caucus. We've been fighting for the last three years to try to bring in, or, or I should, should say, uh, help out the steel industry after years of illegal dumping by other countries in this country to drive down the price of steel and shirt my iron ore miners up in northern Michigan and the steel industry throughout the United States. So what we're saying, look, we're going to spend all this money to rebuild Iraq, and we have been, whether well, it was a $79 billion earlier, now $87 billion. Let's at, ease, at least use American-made steel. And by that, we mean steel that's melted and poured here in the United States. Those are key words. So if you make that amendment in order, just make sure melted and poured here in the United States is in it. Uh, this certainly would support this industry. Uh, last but not least, and, and this is the amendment I really came to testify and, and to spend some time on, is, and I've been talking about it for some time on the floor, taking to the floor, a $1,500 bonus for the men and women who have served under Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. Now, if we can afford $87 billion, 18.7 in it was uh, in the supplemental for reconstruction, we certainly can afford $265 million to give every man and woman who served in Iraq and Afghanistan a bonus. Uh, it's a small when you look at the whole picture, but it's a very meaningful bonus to help our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. Not since Vietnam have we deployed our troops for such a long period of time without a break. This puts pressure on our troops and their families at home. When this war started, there were our reserve and guardsmen and other who were in Iraq were only going to be there for six months at most. Now they're going to be deployed there for a year. And again, just last week, they started to give a two-week break for some of these people so they could at least see their families. They've been deployed for a year. The pressure we're putting on the family of these servicemen and women in this country is tremendous. The least I think we could do was offer them some kind of bonus. Uh, we've lost well over 300 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and they've suffered nearly 2,000 injuries. Uh, the gravity of our commitment is, is enormous, and I think the least we should do is put forth a bonus. Now, parliamentarian says you can't do a straight bonus, so what my amendment really says is increase the basic rate of military pay for service men and women deployed under Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom during fiscal year 2004. So we'd have to make it the basic rate of military pay. We also tried to make it exempt from federal taxes so it could truly be a bonus. Again, uh, parliamentarians said you'd be going too far. The way we have it written now, they said it would fit within the Rules Committee. It would be germane. There no, should not be a point of order made against it. So my proposed increase of $265 million to the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, and all Reserve and Guard component personnel would amount to a $1,500 bonus for all persons who have been deployed for any length of time 
and according to the Congressional Budget Office, that's $265 million. Uh, now, we could just leave it there and increase this appropriation by $256 million to get that uh, bonus for each service member. And so I said, well, rules can be many times like offsets. So we did our last amendment would say, let's do an offset. And we looked at the $900 million listed in the committee report to provide Iraq with petroleum imports. It has been talked about a lot here today. A lot of us have difficulty understanding why the world's second largest, you know, or the world's with the second largest oil reserves need $900 million to import oil into Iraq. Uh, so I think uh, we could use this to offset from the $900 million for import petroleum products. We could take 265 out of there to pay for this bonus. Uh, you know, as members of Congress, you've seen today we may disagree on different ideas on how we should rebuild Iraq. We can all disagree on how we ever got there in the first place, but we're there. And I think our servicemen and women deserve our sincere recognition for their courageous efforts. $1,500 will not only help boost morale, but it will send a strong bipartisan message to our troops that Congress has unified behind them. In the coming year, we will have an estimated 150,000 young men and women who will not see their families because they'll be in Iraq. A record number of reservists and guardsmen and women will put their private sector opportunities and jobs on holds because they're going to have to go to Iraq. And thousands of children in every part of America will pray for their parents' safe return because they're in Iraq. In these extraordinary times, we deserve extraordinary measure, and I urge you to support this amendment that would help our troops by at least providing some bonus for the great work they do for us in representing this country day in and day out in Iraq and Afghanistan. Thank you very that, much. Mr. Chairman, that's a summary of my amendments. Did you, did you see the last amendment you were talking about was vetted by the parliamentarian and found it not to need a waiver? Correct. Both of them, the, the bonus one and the offset one, he said, would not need a waiver. I'm sure it'll be in order then. Mr. Price? Yeah, Mr. McGovern. I just want to say I support all, <clears throat> all, the, all of your amendments and um, appreciate the one in particular that supports our men and women in the armed services. I also uh, would just say to you that uh, what your constituents are concerned about is what I think all of our constituents are served, uh, concerned about. Uh, you know, whether or not people supported going to war in Iraq or opposed uh, going to war in Iraq, I, I think they want to make sure that now that we're there that we're not getting ripped off. I mean, that's basically, I mean, to kind of put it bluntly, I mean, and one of the frustrating things that I feel right now is that, you know, as, we, as we're debating this $87 billion package, that very little discussion is going to be um, or very little is going to be made in order uh, to talk about how this should be paid for, whether through uh, uh, through uh, repealing tax cuts for millionaires or whether it should be loans or you know or partial loans or what what have you. But it seems to me that that's a that's a central issue. Um, and you know, as I said before, the president gave his speech asking for this um, in early September. You know, it's October 15th today. We've had plenty of time to coordinate with other committees to try to figure out how best to do this. Uh, the fact that we're going to the floor and we're being told, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta take it as we, as we present it or, you know, or, or not. I mean, I just don't think that's, that's a reasonable thing to expect members of both parties to have to deal with. You know, I went down to White House, was invited down with a small group and we talked about it. And uh, <laughs> when you ask about the loans or use their oil as collateral, we've been told, well, they don't have the local resources to do that. And uh, they already have loans out rest of the country. I mean, the rest of the world. Iraq has 200 billion in, in loans to other countries that have to be taken care of. You know, with all due respect, as I had to say at the White House, that day they just turned down my district uh, $100 million for disaster relief. We had a big flood go through in May. We've been trying to get disaster relief. We've been turned down twice because they kept saying we had enough local resources. Well, the state of Michigan, like most of the states in this country, are in pretty tough financial shape. Our local communities are always facing revenue sharing from the state, cuts in revenue sharing. So we have no local resources, and the state really doesn't, but yet we can find it here at home. And, and my folks are saying, why are we just giving grants and 100% to the Iraqis for whatever it is? So it's, it's not I mean, going over real well. I mean, if we don't figure out how to pay for this or how to you know, offset it in a way that doesn't disadvantage our, our, you know, our, our own people, I mean, we're going to see more firefighters laid off, more cops laid off less money going back to our states and our cities and towns, uh, more cuts in education. I mean, we all talk about our commitment to education, but yet we, we don't, we, we, we're always told we don't have the money to fully fund No Child Left Behind. I mean, so it's, uh, so I, I appreciate you, you raising these issues and, um, 
and I hope before this bill actually goes to the floor that there will be some uh, reevaluation of the current strategy by the leadership here to allow for there to be more amendments uh, to deal with the issue of, of how this is going to be paid for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hastings? Hastings? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Shays? Welcome. Even if prepared statements have been made part of the record without objection, we welcome a summary. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the Rules Committee, uh, Jim Cooper and I have an amendment. Our amendment is uh, relatively simple, and its language is nearly identical to the language that was inserted in the Appropriations Committee by Steny Hoyer. Our amendment requires a quarterly report from the General Accounting Office on our reconstruction efforts in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, our efforts to win the peace. A description of our progress or lack thereof will highlight our efforts relating to public safety, law enforcement, critical infrastructure, including energy, water, sewer, roads, telecommunications, medical and hospital services, private sector development, and our efforts towards holding free and fair elections in Iraq. Uh, I'd say to you on a scale of 1 to 10, our effort to win the war in Iraq was an 11. Our effort to win the peace uh, is somewhere in between. Uh, it's uh, something we need to do a better job. And I think that uh, our effort to have a better accounting of it would be helpful to members of Congress. Also, I think uh, to the general public at large. I've been to Iraq twice. I'm a strong supporter of this aid uh, bill. Uh, so I, I want to be on record on that. Uh, I think that the money spent on rebuilding is even more important than the money sent to our troops, because ultimately the money sent to rebuild will enable our troops to come home sooner. So I hope that um, my rule uh, would be, uh, excuse me, our amendment would be allowed under the rule and uh, uh, that we would have a chance to debate it and argue for its passage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Price? Mr. McGovern? I just said to the gentleman, I strongly support his amendment. I think it would be helpful for, you know, those of us who, you know, have very differing views on what, uh, whether it was appropriate for us to invade Iraq or not. And I think, uh, I think the General Accounting Office would, is the right, uh, right uh, institution to do this, and um, I would certainly support his, his amendment. Thank you. Hastings? Hastings? Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you, members. Mr. Phelan of Egg. welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members nice of the have you here. committee. My uh, amendment is uh, quite simple, and I sense that perhaps but in the process of drafting the provisions of H.R. 3289, there's been a, an oversight in the, in the matter. And I address this amendment that I'm proposing specifically to address the question of uh, reimbursement of airfare costs for our men and women who are on leave, an official leave. And uh, according to my readings, it currently is to provide uh, this benefit is to provide it only for those traveling within the United States. And uh, my amendment proposes to include our commonwealths and the territories. I believe it is just as much for the Army and the other branches of the armed services to recruit uh, our men and women in the military from our commonwealths and territories, and certainly we ought to be able to afford to allow them the same benefit, uh, those of our men and women who live within the continental United States. That's all my amendment addresses, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Price? Thank you. Thank you. I support the gentleman's amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support the gentleman, Mr. Chairman, but the surprising thing is that we keep doing legislation that doesn't contemplate uh, uh, the territories in the Commonwealth, and I just wish there was some way we could have an automatic proviso that includes them. Perhaps Mr. Falamio and Ovega and I will look at something like that. I, I appreciate the gentleman's yeah. uh, comments, uh, but uh, that's the problem with becoming a territory. And, yeah. uh, Mark? Well, I thank the gentleman well, for his comments. If, if any of the members have been to American Samoa, <laughs> as I have, they would be more than uh, uh, proud uh, uh, to do that. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Hastings? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'll testify from here. No problem. And I ask unanimous consent that my full statement be made a part of the record. Without objection. I have two amendments, Mr. Chairman. I'll be exceedingly brief. Uh, one, uh, the first of them, deals with educational facilities in Iraq and Afghanistan funded by the bill 
calling for them not to discriminate against students on the basis of religion, national origin, race, color, or gender. I'm not going to get into further particulars, save the fact that one very important part of that amendment allows that educational materials purchased or, or with of these funds may not promote anti-Semitic, anti-Western, or anti-democratic values. Too often we see this showing up in the educational materials of children uh, in uh, certain countries, and we would not want, once there becomes a legitimate government in Iraq, uh, to have our funds funding that. The Second Amendment, Mr. Chairman, um, is an amendment that does what I think uh, all of us agree ought be done. No matter the administration, the constant hue and cry has been, where is the post-conflict strategy? The Clinton administration met this matter previously. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't learn from history. Uh, the fact of the matter is, for those that are historians, uh, the Marshall Plan was some 700 pages and was very actively in progress uh, before the end or even the known determination of uh, the Second World War. Too often, uh, we ignore those uh, kinds of situations. So what I'm asking uh, for is, uh, in this instance, uh, that we set out our post-conflict strategy, and that, as a part of accountability, is simply not too much to ask, particularly when we are asking funds as we are in this reconstruction uh, uh, effort. We need to develop a clear, strategic plan of action uh, to make sure uh, that we know uh, when uh, we are likely to be able to exit um, and pass off uh, to either the international community or others or the responsibility, more specifically, others meaning Iraqis, to take care of uh, Iraq. With that, Mr. Chairman, I ask the committee to waive any points of order that may be rega uh, raised regarding either of the amendments, uh, so that the supplemental reflects Congress's concerns, or uh, that the executive branch um, uh, formulate uh, and put forward a clear post-conflict strategy and not use funds to discriminate on the basis of race, color, or gender. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions on this side? No questions. Mr. Hastings or Ms. Myrick? Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Our next witness will be Ms. Maloney from New York. Thank you very much. <coughs> Ms. Mr. Chairman, I, I have a I respectfully request uh, that the committee make in order three amendments uh, that I am offering to the emergency supplemental appropriations legislations. Uh, two <coughs> amendments uh, would benefit Iraqi and Afghan women, and one would uh, ensure transparency and improve uh, contracting with respect to Iraq. Uh, it, would, uh, it is modeled after legislation that I've submitted called the Clean Contracting in Iraq Act, uh, named uh, also for General Petraeus, who has been so effective in Iraq in uh, managing contracts. This uh, would uh, this this bill first uh, would uh, prohibit sole source contracts unless a, a waiver under existing law is approved by the director of OMB. It would also call for for full and open competition in order to get the best uh, deal for the taxpayer. The amendment would also require U.S. agencies that enter into a contract to develop a plan to minimize cost to the U.S. taxpayer by using, if possible, Iraqi contractors and subcontractors that can perform the work at lower costs. And this is uh, very important in terms of rebuilding Iraq and providing jobs to the Iraqi people, but also in saving uh, taxpayers' dollars. When I was in Iraq, uh, along with uh, Chairman Davis of the Government Reform and Oversight uh, Committee over the August uh, recess, we met with uh, General David uh, Petraeus, who oversees contracting in northern Iraq. He uh, told us this story, uh, that a, a contract was let for $15 million to an American contractor to build a cement factory. They were very slow. He needed the cement to uh, repair the buildings. So in desperation, he used money that he confiscated from Saddam Hussein. So it didn't cost taxpayers anything. 
did a competitive bid with the Iraqi business people and let the contract for $80,000. The cement factory is up and running, people are employed, and he saved the American taxpayer a considerable amount of money. And I, I feel that we should follow this uh, model of General Petraeus whenever possible in order to uh, save taxpayers' dollars. I think it's tremendously important. My, my second amendment uh, contains language and, and is really uh, uh, a bill that I've worked uh, with uh, Judy Biggert on, uh, and, and I've been to many uh, meetings with Deborah Price, uh, with the Iraqi women who have told us their stories. I understand she's going back to Iraq to, to meet with the women soon, and I congratulate her for, for taking this as a prime interest. It should be one. And, I, and it, it would, uh, this would direct the administrator of the Coalition Provisional Authority to work to ensure that a substantial number of women are included in drafting the Iraqi Constitution. And, and it would also require the administrator to report to Congress about his progress, including the safeguards to ensure that women's rights are protected, particularly the right to stand for office, to vote, and to have equality of opportunity in education, health care, and family matters. And I firmly believe that if uh, a, a country progresses only to the extent that the women are involved and are part of the economic growth and participation of that country, it would be an incredible disaster if we spent treasure and blood to go to Iraq and did not improve the rights of women. Uh, this country has done such an incredible job in so many other countries in, in building them after, at rebuilding them after wars. And I would like to cite the testimony last week of Beate Sirota Gordon. Uh, she testified before the Government Reform Committee. She was the woman who wrote the women's rights section in the Japanese Constitution. Uh, she said, if you do not get into the Constitution, you will never pass it by legislation. She drafted 34 provisions for women's rights in Japan. She was assured that the other provisions would pass in law. It never did. Only the one she got in the Constitution was the one that remained. So I, I feel that this Congress should take a position in, in a, speaking our voice that we support women's rights, we support women in being part of drafting the Iraqi Constitution, and we certainly support the right to vote and the right to equality of education. My, my third uh, amendment would devote, it, it concerns Afghani women, and it would devote a portion of the 872 million already devoted to reconstruction in Afghanistan. It would devote 20 million for programs that, that specifically target women and girls. Again, uh, protecting them, encouraging them, and supporting them in, in, in their country and in their constitution. Additionally, my amendment would uh, specify that out of the 90, 95 million already devoted for education in the underlying bill, that 47 million um, be directed towards education for women. This is tremendously important. Every day we read another press report about uh, Afghanis that are bombing and uh, destroying schools for girls. We need to send a strong statement that we support education for women, and we support their protection. And the only way we can do that is by making sure that the dollars that are appropriated, I'm not asking for additional dollars, but directing portions of the dollars that are there to the education of women, to the economic uh, protection and security and advancement of opportunities for women. A similar bill passed uh, in the authorizing bill, and it was supported by Chairman Hyde, and it is also similar to legislation uh, that uh, Ms. Biggert and I have put forward in a bipartisan way. So I respectfully request uh, that the committee remember the women and uh, manage the uh, taxpayer dollars uh, so that they are stretched to the farthest extent to help the Iraqi people and to help our own uh, country. And I urge you to follow the Petraeus model that has worked so successfully in Iraq. Thank you. Ms. Any Price? questions? I have no questions. Um, yep. Thank you. Mr. McGovern. 
I want to thank you for your testimony. I su certainly support all, all of your amendments. Uh, I, th I think that the example that you gave regarding uh, Major General Petraeus uh, and, and how he managed to uh, uh, to get that cement plan for run running for $80,000 versus what was originally projected to be $15 million, I think is, is really sobering. And one of the things that I hope that we can figure out before this thing goes through is a way to ensure that, uh, again, the American taxpayers are not paying more for things than they should be. And clearly that's an example where they would have been if it wasn't for the ingenuity of, of, of uh, General Petraeus. Um, I mean, it's bad enough that um, we can't figure out a way to pay for all of this, that this whole thing is going to be just put on our national credit card and our kids and our grandkids are going to pay for it. But at, at a minimum, I would hope that that amendment would be made in order so that the American people are not being forced to pay more than they should. So I thank you for all your amendments and I appreciate you being here. I thank uh, Mr. McGovern for his uh, wise statements and for his support of, our, of, of my amendment. Uh, one way to save the, the taxpayers' dollars is by including the Petraeus Amendment, which I have put forward for the committee today in the, in the draft going forward. We'll still, certainly do also, we Mr. McGovern, remember the ladies. I, I'm not we certainly forgetting need to uh, make sure that they are emboldened and, uh, and uh, given the support to be part of the Constitution and to be part of the educational system in their countries. That's the least that we can put forward. If we don't put that forward, uh, I think this uh, Congress. I, I will guarantee you that all three of your amendments will be uh, brought up uh, before this committee, and we will do what we can to try to make them in order. Thank you very Thanks. much. Hastings, Washington. Hastings, Florida. I have no um, um, uh, questions. I'd like to make a statement to Ms. Maloney that. Uh, just before you offered your amendments, I offered one dealing with gender problems in education as well, trying to make sure that in either case, Iraq or Afghanistan, that uh, that's not in included. But you know, I don't know who the people are uh, that made the decision uh, to develop the Iraqi uh, governing or uh, provisional council. But just a good example of a part of their thinking was that of the 25 people, only one of them was a woman. It would have been just as easy to have 30 people and have five women uh, as a part of it. But uh, sometimes that thinking is pervasive uh, throughout uh, our entire system, and it manifested itself again there. Might add, uh, tragically, she's one of the persons that was set upon um, uh, most um, uh, by uh, the people that uh, continue to want to do harm, not just to her, uh, but to the entire provisional council. Thank you for your thoughtful amendments. I support. I, I thank uh, Mr. Hastings for his support and, and for his, um, his amendment on, on uh, fair and open uh, competition in contracting. And I, I must say that when I went to Iraq, we uh, were informed of the various governing councils that are being set up across the country. They're similar to our city councils. And there is an effort to include women in these councils. We must also make an effort to have them part of the Constitutional Drafting Committee. Uh, General Odinero told me that the way they got them on the governing councils was that the generals were given, the American generals, uh, several appointments that they could use for these governing councils. And it was through the appointment process that the women became part of the governing council. I applaud. Uh, the American generals who have appointed women to these governing councils. And I call upon Congress uh, to call upon the governing councils and uh, the American uh, leadership to make sure that the women are included on the drafting committee and that the right to vote be part of the intent of this Congress and the right to education and, and health care. It's the least that we can do. Marek? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next witness will be Mr. Scott from Virginia. Welcome, Bobby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have two amendments, and I'll be, um, I'll be very brief. I think they're pretty well self-explanatory. The first is what I call the extended uh, deployment assistance um, for National Guard and reservists, particularly when you're put on these one-year extended deployments. Uh, that, that can pretty well ruin a lot of situations. USA Today had an article that showed that certain many people who are uh, activated uh, lose money when they're on active duty. They did not anticipate the 12-month deployments, 
if you're in school and get yanked out in the middle of a sem middle of a semester, you lose the whole next year and probably too late when you get back to uh, register for classes. If you're a lawyer or, or a professional, uh, I don't know what you do with your office. You, you can s probably struggle for six months, uh, not a year. And uh, some employers are covering people's uh, difference in people's salaries. They might do it for six months, but it's unlikely that anybody would do it for a year. And so, um, and so, Mr. Uh, Chairman, this, this amendment would increase a person's uh, uh, pay by $1,000 for each month after the six-month period that they stay over, um, over in Iraq. Now, the cost of this can't be very much because you've got about 150,000 people over there. If at any time a third of them are on this extended deployment, that would only be $50 million a month. Uh, 12 months at $600 million. This is an $87 billion bill. Uh, that would be less than 1% of it. And of course, it wouldn't cost anything if we wouldn't uh, uh, subject these people to the uh, uh, anything more than six months deployment. And that would be in addition to whatever else they get. It's not inconsistent with uh, the other, uh, other amendments that may be offered. Uh, that's the first amendment, Mr. Chairman. The second um, would require uh, the administration to get help from some of our allies for the Relief and Reconstruction Fund and would prohibit expending any money until such time as we've at least gotten a one-to-one -one match for whatever we want to spend. The Persian Gulf War, Mr. Chairman, cost us less than $8 billion. The total cost of the war, of course, was 60 to $80 billion, but our share, because we had allies, was less than $8 billion. The go-it-along strategy that we have uh, right now in Iraq means that we're paying 100 percent of the cost, not 7 to 10 percent of the cost. This amendment would require the administration to work with the international community so that they can contribute some of the cost. If this amendment doesn't pass, we're not going to have any meaningful effort to get international help. It will be the 100 percent strategy. This will require, um, uh, this will require the match. Now, many of us were disappointed that we didn't get assistance and support from the UN before we attacked, and um, uh, we're just uh, paying 100 percent of the of the costs in terms of cash and in, uh, uh, and also in casualties. Uh, I believe it's uh, this would be one way that we could require the um, this administration to get some help from the other nations. I strongly support both the gentlemen's amendments. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Rayson. are very thoughtful, and I support both of them, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Wynn, you've been a very patient man. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you. I will be brief and summarize three amendments and uh, submit uh, full statements for the record. I would, I would begin by asking uh, for the appropriate waivers uh, to allow my amendments to be uh, uh, in order. Uh, let me say at the onset that uh, I supported the resolution authorizing use of force. And whenever possible, I like to find areas where we can have common ground as between Democrats and Republicans. I hope my amendments fall into that category. The first deals with the question of the welfare of our troops, as has been discussed at length, some length today. Uh, our troops are suffering considerable hardships as a result of their service. My First Amendment would uh, basically extend the period of foreclosure protection under the Soldiers and Sailors Civil Relief Act of 1940 from the current three months to 12 months after the release uh, of a member of the armed services from active duty. Basically, we now protect our servicemen from mortgage foreclosure for three months. Uh, given the circumstances in Iraq, as my colleague Mr. Scott talked about, much longer periods of service. Uh, the likelihood of mortgage foreclosure increases. It seems to me this would be an appropriate area where without substan any cost to the government, we could extend this protection. It does not forgive uh, the mortgage. It only uh, says that you, will not, you could not be foreclosed upon within the 12 months after your release, giving the soldier an opportunity uh, to get his financial affairs in order and protect his home mortgage. I think this is an amendment that uh, deserves favorable consideration. My second amendment uh, goes to the question of bundling. It is a concept in which 
contracts are consolidated into huge contracts. And my concern is that these huge contracts eliminate the opportunity for uh, small businesses to compete. Uh, there have been a lot of jokes about Halliburton, but on a very constructive note, my sense is that if we had a requirement to review these contracts in advance to ensure that there was uh, a minimum of bundling uh, and that the maximum amount of unbundling occurred, that we would create more competition and save money. The amendment basically authorizes the Small Business Administration to review pr proposed contract solicitations prior to their being awarded or uh, prior to their being announced. Uh, for compliance with existing requirements to maximize unbundling. I'd like to share in just a moment with the committee uh, from the testimony of Angela Stiles, who's the administrator for the Office of Procurement uh, Policy for OMB. And she said in her testimony before the Small Business Committee that on March 19, 2002, the president unveiled a small business agenda that made several proposals to increase the access of small businesses to federal contracting opportunity. The agenda called upon the Office of Management and Budget to develop a strategy for unbundling federal contracts. My amendment would basically apply that strategy, which is a strategy of reviewing contracts, to see that they are unbundled to the maximum extent possible. Uh, my third amendment deals with our existing uh, goals for the participation of small disadvantaged businesses. This includes veterans-owned businesses as well as women-owned businesses and hub-zoned businesses and uh, Section 8 businesses. We currently have procurement goals in each of these areas. This amendment would simply say that the funds must be used in compliance with these existing uh, goals. Uh, this seems to be an approach that would make sense, again, creating more competition through participation of small and minority businesses. Uh, it would also help uh, provide opportunities for small disadvantaged businesses disabled veteran businesses, as well as women-owned businesses. Ms. Slaughter, who's not here right now, has previously indicated that she would be interested in co-sponsoring both of these amendments as ways to increase competition and create increased diversity in our contracting practices. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I would ask your favorable consideration. Thank you very much for your... Mr. Hastings? Mr. McGovern? I support the gentleman's amendments. Thank you. Ms. Myrick? Mr. Hastings? I support all three of his amendments, Mr. Chairman, and in keeping with uh, the earlier portion of my comments, we are now up to the 80th amendment by our colleagues, suggesting that this matter obviously has serious import for all of us. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you very much. Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Who else? Welcome. Welcome. Good evening and greetings to good friends. Um, I am here, Mr. Chairman and members, um, to uh, request that uh, the amendment I have proposed uh, be made in order. Uh, I understand that it requires a waiver. I understand that that is something this committee is reluctant to do, but I would hope that in my case, in the case of others who have appeared before you, you would try extra specially hard uh, to make some of these amendments in order because uh, this one and many others that I've heard described here um, are intended to uh, help get the job done in Iraq, but also uh, help us be fiscally responsible. Uh, and that is certainly what my amendment um, is uh, uh, intended to do. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, I have always been a strong supporter of our nation's defense and of our nation's intelligence community. I have supported and still support the goals of our intervention in Iraq, regime change and dismantling the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, like uh, everyone here, I am concerned about the future stability and security of Iraq and the region as a whole and also want to ensure that um, any uh, weapons of mass destruction which may exist um, uh, are found promptly and uh, are found even if they have been transferred to other hands. Um, I am troubled, however, uh, by the fact that, in my view, this supplemental asks us to write a second blank check uh, to an administration um, without any assurance that these funds will be well spent and that uh, we will get to a point where we will know the total costs of our efforts uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so my amendment is designed to require the President um, uh, 
as part of his regular budget submission next year in February to include a five-year wartime budget. Uh, I picked five years because I think it will take that long to do uh, certain things. One is to fully fund and win the war on terror. Uh, another is to fully fund uh, the stabilization um, and reconstruction efforts uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and uh, so my amendment requires him to tell us what these costs will be on a five-year basis and obviously to tell us, because they will be part of his budgeting, uh, how they will be offset through spending and tax policies uh, necessary to achieve a balanced budget by a date certain. Um, I am one, and I know you're another, Mr. Chairman, who has long supported uh, a balanced budget. Uh, we made tough choices in the 90s. Um, a lot of people didn't like us because of the choices we made, and we took it because we knew we were being responsible. A lot of people won't like it if we have to make additional tough choices, but I am prepared to make them, and I think that the American people are prepared to make them. Uh, consistent with the goals of um, finishing the job we started in Iraq. So the amendment I offer asks the President to lay out a more detailed, longer view plan for prosecuting the war against terrorism and the reconstruction of Iraq and Afghanistan, and it asks him to help Congress and the American people understand the difficult choices ahead. Uh, while we also ensure a fiscally responsible course of action. I ask that my amendment be made in order, and uh, I would hope uh, that uh, tomorrow uh, we can do the right thing and the fiscally responsible thing, and those will be uh, on the same azimuth. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Price. I have no questions. I appreciate the gentleman's argument. Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I, I just want to thank the, uh, the gentlelady for appearing before us and offering this very thoughtful amendment. Um, quite frankly, I think we should have had this amendment tied to uh, be, be, uh, passed before we even went to war uh, in Iraq. Um, you know, one of the things that still frustrates me is the fact that when you look back, this House of Representatives spent a total of one day on the House floor debating the resolution on whether to go to war in Iraq or not. One day. I mean, parliaments around the world spent more time debating and they didn't even, they weren't even direct participants. And we, we spent one day, uh, quite frankly, with not a lot of questions asked. Um, and uh, we go into this war. Uh, we, we, we passed $79 billion to pay for the first part of this war. The chairman of the Appropriations Committee, in response to a question by Mr. Hastings earlier, when asked, can you tell us how this $79 billion was spent, said no, <coughs> which I thought was an astonishing statement for the chairman of the Appropriations Committee to have to concede before this committee. And so, you know, I mean, anybody who's watching this on C-SPAN has to be saying, well, how, if you don't know how it was spent or whether it was spent wisely and whether it was spent appropriately, we've heard testimony uh, earlier today about uh, cases where uh, American taxpayers have been overcharged for things uh, in Iraq uh, because of the way we've approached some of the reconstruction efforts. I mean, to, to require that we have a plan, that we know the cost, that we know how they're going to offset these costs, that we know who's going to pay for all of this, um, and that what programs domestically are going to suffer. I don't think that's unreasonable. And I don't understand why it is so difficult to get the leadership of the majority of this House to allow us to at least be able to bring amendments like yours to the floor, you know, and vote them up or down. I don't know what, what the controversy is over kind of letting the sun shine a little, little bit and knowing what the plan is, knowing where we're going to go so we can plan accordingly. Um, and, you know, uh, so, I mean, I, I strongly support your amendment, um, and, and we'll fight for it uh, in committee here, but uh, we should have been asking these questions a long time ago. Um, and at the, very, at, a very minim at, a, at the very least, I hope we can pass your amendment to, uh, to force the administration to answer those questions now. Uh, thank you. Mr. Hastings? Mr. Hastings of Florida. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mine is not in the form of a question. It is meant simply to uh, compliment Ms. Harmon for uh, this uh, a very thoughtful amendment, but to also add to the fact uh, that um, when Jane Harmon uh, uh, comes uh, uh, to the position of seeking accountability, it's with a great deal of thought, as is the case with uh, our membership, but I have the good fortune of working actively with her uh, in pursuit of accountability, 
um, on yet another of our, our, our committees in Congress. And I just uh, take this opportunity to thank her for her thoughtfulness and ask uh, the committee to make appropriate uh, waivers in order that this particular amendment uh, be allowed to have the House work its will. Ms. Myrick, thank you very much. Happy thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. May I just say one thing in response sure. to the comments Absolutely. just made? And that is that um, many of you and I are all classmates in this uh, institution. Um, Ms. Price and I are, Mr. Hastings and I are. Uh, Mr. Hastings and I uh, served together on the Intelligence Committee where he is a, uh, a very valued and thoughtful member. Um, and I see others in the, in the room too. Um, I don't think that uh, uh, the, the points I've made are partisan in any sense. I think they are intended to be bipartisan. They are intended to seek better policy and to seek accountability, which is part of the uh, requirement that this institution should impose on the executive branch. I just don't think we have enough accountability. And if I could just close with this, Mr. Chairman, um, yesterday I was very troubled to read in the Washington Post that uh, the Army has not yet been able to spend uh, $300 million that we have already appropriated for inserts into flak jackets that our troops are wearing in the field, our troops are under daily assault from um, um, assault weapons, and these inserts protect them from penetration by the um, these weapons. Um, only 80 million uh, of the 300 million has been spent, and lots of our troops don't have these inserts and won't have them apparently until late November or December. Uh, this is, uh, um, you know, enormously irresponsible, and I worry. Uh, that if we aren't, if, if, if the executive branch is not accountable for funds already provided, that they won't be accountable adequately for these funds. And that is why my amendment is trying to force them to take responsibility uh, on a path to, you know, a balanced budget uh, for funds that we all know uh, will ultimately need to be spent. Thank you, Thank Mr. You very Chairman. Much. Ms. Jackson Lee. Welcome to the Rules Committee. I hope you'll summarize and anything you have prepared will be part of the record without, op without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I thank the committee. I think Mr. Hastings uh, said it all, is that this is a very important matter uh, for us. So I hope that you will indulge me, Mr. Chairman. I will do my best to summarize, but I think this is important enough, and I thank the members for their indulgence. I believe um, if you would ask the question uh, whether or not uh, we should help rebuild Iraq, uh, there would probably be a resounding yes, uh, as well as a resounding yes for helping to rebuild Liberia and Haiti. Uh, and I believe at the same time you'd hear the question or the answer that there should be a resounding status on accountability, on the utilization of the prior funds, and how we plan to use the funds uh, prospectively. Uh, in the last 24 hours, I had the opportunity to have a town hall meeting uh, with members of my community from all walks of life. And those were the two uh, singular questions. The other question was, should we do it alone? And should we not do it in collaboration with partners? And so my amendments fall in uh, two specific areas with a divide along the procedural process. Uh, one of my amendments speaks to the question of separating the vote. The vote for the amount of monies that are necessary to support our troops uh, and the monies that are necessary to help rebuild Iraq. I believe it is also important to take into consideration that in about seven days there will be the Madrid, Madrid donor conference. And there has been some representation by the administration, maybe the Congress is moving quickly because of that, that we need to move with this vote so that we can express to the world what we are planning on doing. I think it is the complete opposite, Mr. Chairman. And my amendment would delay the vote on the monies for the Operation uh, Iraqi Rebuild so that we could collaborate with the donors as to how they would contribute to a unified plan. And it is well recognized that the United States will be a partner in that plan. But the one unique aspect of the Marshall Plan uh, as we sought to rebuild Europe is we had, if not partners, we had consensus. And I believe it is important for us to have consensus at this point. 
And as I said, if we are to have a structure that is to work, we must have accountability. So I'd like to speak to two points. Uh, after I've already mentioned the idea of the separate vote, I will have an amendment of that. And I'd like to uh, suggest to my colleagues to have the appropriate waiver points of um, waivers to the points of order on the basis of my amendments. Number one, the quality of life issues dealing with the troops. And I had the opportunity to visit with a number of troops who were on R&R &R that have come in from Iraq. Some of them were National Guard, some of them were reservists, uh, many of them enlisted personnel who had experienced uh, the first hand of dangers of being attacked and of the loss of vehicles. My First Amendment indicates uh, that we would prohibit the funds to be used uh, before we meet all of our financial obligations to our Reserve and National Guard personnel. Might I say, Mr. Chairman, that I would be interested in working with the Rules Committee uh, to have that uh, detailed as procedures. What I found in talking to the troops is that many of those who are in the National Guard and Reserves had not had the mechanics of getting paid working properly. And so many were still not being paid uh, because of the uh, inadequacies of the processes for them to be paid. And I think that is crucial to the quality of life issues. Second Amendment would uh, prohibit funds from being used uh, until we ensure that no members of the armed forces or government employees are being required to be stationed in Iraq continuously for a period greater than six months. You have many who are there, who are seven months, eight months, and nine months, and on, but they are not with any details as to how many months they will have to stay. And I believe that we have the capacity, maybe not the number of troops, to be able to give a time certain. And I think it's appropriate uh, for this committee to assess that responsibility and to have procedures in place so that at least the troops can be notified of the time that they would uh, be able to depart. I think there should also be uh, the responsibility of one of my amendments that indicates that there should be an exit strategy uh, and a projected timetable for withdrawing the United States forces from Iraq, which is crucial to many Americans. I believe America has been loyal to the troops, to the president, to the mission, even though members of Congress disagreed on the initial vote on going to war in Iraq. I happen to be one of them. But certainly the American people have been steady in their support. But when you speak to military families, you will hear them say, uh, when will our troops come home? Not when will we abandon Iraq, but when will our troops come home? I think it is vital that we uh, engage them in that. The second aspect of my list of amendments uh, involves the idea of quality of life, democratization, human rights. And might I also add my appreciation to Congresswoman Price, who is going to be going back in the all women's mission. Uh, and uh, I appreciate very much uh, her leadership on women's issues uh, and, of course, the rebuild question. I notice I co-chair the Congressional Caucus on Afghanistan, and I notice uh, the monies uh, to be expended are $800 million. So one of my amendments is to shift $20 million from the Iraq budget uh, toward Afghanistan to be used for development of electricity generation and transmission infrastructure, because I think the dollars do not connote the damage or the necessity in the amount of monies that are required. My other amendment in Afghanistan deals with the question of Afghan women's programs, women's programs uh, particularly uh, educational programs. It proposes an earmark of $10 million for Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission and $24 million for the Ministry of Women's Affairs. We must provide direct support to help strengthen those women-led permanent Afghan institutions whose mission it is to promote women's rights and human rights. These are funds already authorized in the Afghan Freedom Support Act of 2002, but which still, for the most part, have not been appropriated. Some girls have gone back to school in Afghanistan, but the majority have not because there are not enough schools, and those that do exist are in very bad shape. The Asian Development Bank estimates that an additional 13,851 primary schools need to be constructed, but the administration's request is only for 275 schools. Some 40 percent of schools in Afghanistan were completely destroyed during the war, and another 15 percent were heavily damaged, and in many areas of the country there were no schools for girls at all. Let me cite this quote for the committee members. There are flyers being distributed at the site of one of the first attacks that read, stop sending your women to offices and daughters to schools. It spreads indecency and vulgarity. Stand ready for the consequences if you do not heed the advice. Some families are heeding the advice and they're afraid to send their daughters to school. And I would think that we would need more dollars to assist uh, in making sure 
uh, that these uh, Afghani have the human rights, the political rights, the women empowerment, and to allow their girls to go to schools. Finally, I would say this, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman. Um, I noted that the President last week asked Dr. Condoleezza Rice uh, to head uh, the collaboration effort in his administration between the parties dealing with the aftermath of Iraq. Uh, I certainly found that to be constructive, uh, that the administration would speak from one page and with one voice. But I note in the legislation that we have before us that there is language that suggests that only a Senate-confirmed individual would be allowed uh, to influence utilization of funds. I think that is a complete conflict uh, with the announced position that has been given to Dr. Rice and to a certain degree hypocrisy and to a certain degree ineffective in terms of her position. Uh, she is a national security advisor. I would imagine that she would comply with the rules of the House, the rules of the Senate, as it relates to accountability and with the responsibility she would be able to come before congressional committees to report on her duties. I am uh, offering an amendment to strike that language as it comports with the new position and responsibilities that that individual would have in coordinating and collaborating with the cabinet officers on the aftermath of Iraq. I would hope that uh, my amendments could be considered, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I would finally conclude by saying that uh, I had an opportunity to speak with uh, one of the deputy foreign ministers of our Arab NATO, uh, Qatar, and indicated um, the interest or suggested uh, the opportunity for there to be an Arab-U.S. summit in that region to discuss the participation of those donors in the aftermath and the rebuild of Iraq. Uh, to my pleasant surprise, the Deputy Prime Minister agreed and thought that was a positive step. I would hope that the supplemental that we have and the efforts that we're making will also encourage the administration to engage in a collaborative effort so that if we have the opportunity for a summit uh, with uh, those in the Arab region and to work with donors around the country and the world in particular, that we would be able to do so. Some of my amendments speak to that very point. I support the general amendments. Mr. Hastings? I support the amendments, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Ms. Barbara Lee, who has been patiently sitting here for a couple of hours. Welcome. If you have a prepared statement, be happy to make it part of the record. We welcome a summary. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. First of all, let me just say uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today to request that uh, my amendment be made in order under the rule that this committee will issue governing the debate of H.R. 3289, the Iraq uh, Supplemental Appropriations. Now, my amendment is uh, very simple, Mr. Chairman and members. What it does is add $1 billion to the Supplemental Appropriations Bill and provides for an offset of funds to come from the money designated by the President for the reconstruction of Iraq. This $1 billion is for the uh, HIV AIDS initiative, which we authorized uh, this year. Now, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I believe that if the President, uh, if the President can ask us to pass um, a blank check really for uh, $87 billion for the life of me, I don't know and I'm not certain why he didn't ask for this $1 billion that has already been promised uh, to Africa as it relates to the HIV AIDS initiative. The amendment does not specify which terms within, uh, which items, excuse me, which items within that account will be subject to the offset, but it does protect certain accounts, including Iraqi border enforcement and enhanced security communications and the appropriation for the Iraqi National Security Force and the Iraq Defense Corps. If my amendment passes, the administration will then have 30 days to decide and notify Congress and the appropriate committees which accounts would be reduced in order to pay for the $1 billion for the Global AIDS Initiative. This amendment really should be made in order because I believe it responds to the grave national security implications of the global HIV AIDS pandemic, which is a disease that uh, our Secretary of State Colin Powell has repeatedly described as something far worse than terrorism. 
And the Congress authorized uh, $3 billion, not $2 billion this year, to be spent each and every year until we reach the $15 billion. The President went to Africa and made many promises. Um, so I think that this amendment should be in order because this will enable the Congress and the President to uh, live up to the promises already made. This committee and the entire Congress, I know, uh, you know the situation very well. Today, over 42 million individuals are living with HIV and AIDS worldwide. The vast majority, over 95 percent, live in the developing world. And already, AIDS has claimed the lives of over 25 million people. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the worst hit region, AIDS has contributed to the destabilization of entire communities, tearing at the very fabric of society by killing mothers and fathers, teachers, farmers, health professionals, business persons, soldiers, and undermining the governing authority and political stability of entire nations. In short, uh, AIDS is uh, creating chaos, and it is a national security issue and crisis. Some people uh, say that that's an overstatement, but our own National uh, Intelligence Council has already concluded that a wholesale political, social, and economic collapse is very likely to occur, particularly in those countries where already nearly one in three individuals are living with HIV and AIDS. The level of prevalence of HIV among foreign militaries and law enforcement uh, forces is particularly most telling uh, in terms of those individuals who preserve really the ability of government to maintain law and order. The incidence of AIDS is enormous in those uh, professions and sectors. In many African countries, the disease burden among military forces is higher than among the general population. According to a recent study uh, by the Rand Institute, some military units in South Africa have infection rates as high as 90%. So can anyone uh, doubt that the importance of the funding for global AIDS when figures like these uh, really have become very common throughout Africa? The consequences could be very dire if we fail to scale up our level of support. According to the National Intelligence Council of the CIA, the number of HIV-infected individuals in five of the world's most populous nations could reach an estimated 75 million by 2010. Mr. Chairman, um, I will conclude by saying that at the very least, I believe we must ensure that the House has the opportunity to add the funding that the President promised, not only here but in Africa. Again, if, if we can find $87 billion, I think we can find $1 billion uh, to save millions of lives which really depend on this. So this amendment does provide the opportunity for that, and I ask this amendment to be considered in order, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ms. Price. Mr. Chairman, may I just mention there's sure, a technical uh, error I'd like to call to your attention on line 14, uh, item B, where it says offset. It says each amount, that should uh, change to say the total amount appropriated yes. under Title II. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McGovern. I want to thank uh, the gentlewoman for her thoughtful and persuasive testimony, and I certainly support her amendment. Thank you, Mr. McDowell. I support the amendment. I have no questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I Welcome. have uh, many amendments to offer, most of which will be in order if you report out an open rule. We will have a fairly open rule. We've submitted uh, several amendments, and uh, as I understand it, the deadline for submitting more uh, has not yet elapsed, and we will have several. But in order to demonstrate that hope uh, springs eternal, I have drafted three amendments that not only needed, uh, that would not be fully in order unless you would also grant them protection, just as you have protected from points of order many aspects of the underlying legislation. Which is what we routinely do. Yes, and uh, what could be, uh, what could, well, what, what could restore my faith in America to an even greater degree than if you would also protect these three amendments? The first deals with providing eighty-seven billion dollars of revenue. Uh, we all say that we support the troops, but this bill is not we support the troops. The underlying bill is we support having our grandchildren support the troops through deficit financing. 
And I know that uh, uh, our colleague uh, Mr. Lantos was here with an amendment, and I would hope that either my amendment or his designed to provide revenue as a component part of this bill so that it's really our generation that is supporting the troops uh, is, uh, is something that the House can work its will on. Uh, the second amendment deals with government contracting. There have been story after story and concern across this country as to which corporations are getting the contracts to rebuild and to oversee rebuilding in Iraq. And so what my amendment would do is simply require regular order in the contract letting procedures. No waivers, no, uh, no bid contracts, do it by the book. This is particularly important because these expenditures are being made far away from the prying eyes of members of Congress. I know we can go over there and see a few things, but if you have a no-bid contract in Michigan or Florida, it is, you've got the press, investigative reporters, members of Congress, American citizens all watching what's going on. When you have a no-bid contract in Iraq, it simply creates a, uh, an era of um, uh, or an aura, rather, of, uh, super of, of uh, suspicion here in the United States. Finally, and most importantly, I have an amendment to deal with the one issue that all of America is talking about. And this is an issue where the House should work its will. And that is whether these $18 billion should be in the form of a loan or gift. We're talking about the second largest oil reserves on the planet. <coughs> We're talking about a country that will have surplus revenues by 2008 or 2010 or 2012. And so the question is, will those surplus revenues come back to the United States? We're told that we can't do that because that hurts Iraq's balance sheet, makes it less credit worthy, because that balance sheet already has $100 billion of debt on it. Well, what is that debt? 25 billion to Saudi Arabia, 17 billion to Kuwait, 25 billion to other Gulf states. Do these oil-rich nations really need a piece of Iraq's future oil revenue because Kuwait and Saudi Arabia don't have enough on their own? Also 4 billion uh, to, uh, to France. Uh, what we need to do to clean up the balance sheet is to encourage the Saudi, um, to encourage the Iraqi Council to disclaim Saddam's debt. Hitler's creditors weren't paid. Mussolini's creditors weren't paid. And you never came to with a Marshall Plan to the Congress and said, this is General Marshall's plan. We have to put all this money into Germany to make sure Hitler's creditors get paid. We're not going to get any of our money back. The first step in rehabilitating Germany was to disclaim Hitler's debts. But for some reason, we are told that we must make sure that this hundred billion of Saddam's debts is repaid, uh, or maybe a few, few billion will be shaved off if we beg the creditors to uh, relieve some of the debt. What we instead need to do is put the council in a position where it should disclaim all of Saddam's debt. Now, I know there's a donor conference. Maybe at that donor conference, other nations might have put in a few hundred million dollars. Maybe they'll do so as a loan instead of a gift. But what does that matter? Europe has, um, has pledged $200 million. If they want to put that in as a loan, fine. Maybe they'll put in $300 million if they can do it as a loan. Why not create a circumstance where the surplus revenue generated by Iraq in five years or ten years goes to the people and entities that help Iraq get back on its feet? not those who lent money to support the brutal regime of Saddam Hussein. Let the House work its will, provide a, an amendment with protection on the floor, and uh, the greatest issue that America is talking about will be one that we actually get a chance to vote on. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ms. Price. I have no questions, thank you. Ms. McGovern. I just want to thank the gentleman for his amendments. I, I, I appreciate the one on the uh, insisting that there be no, normal competitive bidding because I don't think there's a person in this country who doesn't think the current system stinks, um, and uh, you know, and, uh, and and wants this done fairly and not just 
handoffs to companies like Halliburton that seem to be benefiting the most. But I also want to commend you for, like others before you, for raising the issue of, of how to pay for all this. Uh, that's a big. That's a big issue. Uh, you know, if you if uh, if you came before this committee and you wanted to build one new school in this country, you would have to find an offset. You know, if if you came before here and wanted to, uh, you know, uh, add money for veterans health care, they would insist mm -hmm. that you find an offset. But here we come with this enormous request for. $87 billion, and uh, there's no offsets. And when you ask how we're going to pay for it, uh, where's, where's the money going to come from, they look at you like, well, you, you know, like, wh why are you asking this? You know, we, we shouldn't be talking about those kind of details. Well, we should have been talking about those details a long time ago. And here we are with the second installment. $79 billion is already gone, no questions asked, and, 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 we, and we don't even know how that money was spent. And now another $87 billion, uh, and uh, again, you know, people uh, one after another are coming up uh, in a bipartisan way saying, you know, there needs to be some accountability. We need to make sure this is paid for properly. It's not enough just to pass it on as debt to our kids and our grandkids. So I want to thank you for your amendments. I, uh, you know, we're certainly going to fight to make them in order. I think they deserve to be debated on the House floor, uh, as do a whole bunch of other amendments that have been offered here today. Thank you. I have no questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for Thank being you. here. Um, next, gentlemen, Mr. Reyes, welcome. We'd be happy for you to summarize your statement, and we'll make yes. the full statement part of the record. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, I'm here to ask that my uh, amendment be considered in order. Uh, this is a uh, very forward amendment that, uh, straightforward amendment that is designed to address some serious shortfalls in two different areas that are critical to our national security, foreign language proficiency and diversity in the workforce and the intelligence community. Specifically, my amendment will cut five million from the general intelligence community management account and it will add five million for programs designed to increase language proficiency and workforce diversity in the intelligence uh, community. As you know, Mr. Chairman, success in the global war on terrorism and in Iraq demands that our nation have the best intelligence collection and analysis possible. Officers with only a marginal understanding of the language and the culture of intelligence targets will only be marginally effective. To address these critical needs, my amendment will provide funds for training in the critical foreign language languages and language maintenance and awards programs. It will also fund scholarship programs, recruit uh, recruitment efforts, and other non-traditional programs designed to enhance the recruitment and the retention of a diverse uh, workforce in, in a critical area such as the intelligence uh, uh, community. So uh, I've been, uh, uh, as a member of the intelligence uh, committee and as a member of the armed services committee, this has been one of the, uh, uh, I think, one of the pivotal issues in uh, since 9-11 that has come out in the 9-11 uh, investigation and in uh, hearings uh, uh, both in, in both committees. So I hope that the committee uh, uh, rules that uh, this is an important amendment and rules that in order. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Price? Thank you. Mr. McGovern? Ms. Myron? Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. No, no problem. I'm Apologies. extremely supportive of Mr. Reyes's amendment. It is a critical matter um, uh, for our nation and the regret is that he's not really asking enough and likely won't get an amendment made that will allow for any. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Sanchez, are you together? Are you, are you senior to her? Yeah, no, sir. Uh, Combat seniority, is that correct? Yes. Okay, I'm going to check. I got it written down wrong here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the uh, I want to ask that uh, this particular amendment be made in order and not be allowed. And there's a glaring omission right now on, on the present proposal. We have neglected uh, once again to provide resources for our veterans. I'm going to be asked that uh, we transfer 1.8 billion from Iraqi Relief Construction Fund to, uh, to our Veterans Health Administration. That 1.8 billion is not additional dollars. That's for existing, just to keep up with the existing care. One of the things that we fail to recognize is that in healthcare, we have 
uh, the inflation rates and, and, the, and the cost is, is almost over 7%. So just to keep up, uh, you know, we need to add that, and that 1.8 billion is the resources that are needed. I've had the pleasure of coming before this committee one other time. The previous time was on the other part of, of the resources on the war on terrorism in Iraq, uh, where we dished out a good 79 billion for that. Uh, and I asked you during that time, when we allocated 2 billion for health care for Iraqis, that you consider 1.8 billion for our own veterans. At the present time, 10 veterans on almost on a daily basis uh, come in uh, with some injuries from Iraq. Uh, and uh, there's an estimated close to 1,000 veterans that have been injured, uh, one injury or another, in terms of severity. So I would ask that you seriously consider uh, this proposal. Uh, we have a, a problem in that we have not responded to the number of veterans. And there seems to be a feeling out there uh, in the part of uh, some of the members that believe that fuzzy math that was presented by the administration. Uh, and I cannot be more forthright than to tell you that when the administration proposed that $3 billion increase for veterans, I was elated. But then I was disappointed to hear that of that $3 billion, $1.2 billion was additional money that our own veterans had to come up as a co-payment. And that $1.8 billion was additional resources that was for co-payment to, to, for them to come up on, on prescription drug coverage. So that we got to make sure that we take care of our veterans. And now this administration, once again, has chose to, to cut off priority eight and priority seven veterans. Uh, and, and so I gather that if we don't put this 1.8 billion, we're gonna go down the line to uh, the other priority veterans and cut them off. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask that you really look at, at this amount of resources. It's 1.8 billion to keep the existing programs the way they are uh, and be able to fund that. Uh, and I ask your support. Thank you. Ms. Price. I have no question. Thank you. Mr. McGovern. I support the gentleman's amendment, and I ask unanimous consent that I um, that we can insert in the record a statement by Congressman uh, Michaud of Maine in support of the Rodriguez amendment. Without objection. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hastings. I have no questions, but I really think it's a good amendment, and I support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members who Welcome. are still here. <laughs> I would like to offer an amendment that reflects the changing nature of the missions of the reserves in the National Guard. The mobilization of the reservists in the aftermath of September 11th is at the highest level ever that we have seen. Almost 164,000 National Guard and reservists are on active duty, and some have faced deployments or are facing deployments of 18 months or better. When a civilian is called up to active duty, the reservist civilian salary is placed on hold and they get a paycheck from the military. But there's a discrepancy many times between what they were earning before and what they will earn through the military. As a result, they may suffer from the pay gap that often has disastrous, long-lasting effects on their family's financial stability. And according to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs, an estimated 30 percent of reservists are impacted by the pay discrepancy. And while 30 percent may seem low to us, it equates to tightened budgets, to unpaid bills for thousands of reservists, and to their families who are making really extraordinary efforts in this time of war. Many of our National Guard and reservists who are defending freedom and fighting terrorism around the globe are falling behind on their financial obligations, racking up credit card debt, and they're facing the prospect of losing their businesses. <laughs> this amendment would help alleviate that burden. It has basically two parts, and it would affect federal, state, and local employees. If this amendment is approved, the nearly 36,000 affected federal employees, almost 25,000 of them are already Department of Defense employees, but they're civilian who are called to active duty for more than 30 days in one year as a National Guard or Reserve reservist would receive a payment from their federal agency that will reflect the difference or the pay gap between what they now earn and what the military would pay them. And state and local governments would be encouraged to continue or initiate paying a portion of the salaries of their employees called up to current or active duty. State and local governments would be able to request an appropriate secretary to reimburse states using the, fo the following formula. For the first nine months of activation, 
the reimbursement would cover 50% of the cost of paying the employee the difference or the pay gap. And after nine months, the reimbursement would rise to 100%. So it doesn't start right away. It's not about the six months that people were thinking. It's really about these long lasting uh, calls that we are making on our reservists and our National Guards and how we protect them from financial instability. It is important to note that this isn't additional money to our reservists or to our National Guardsmen. And we know that um, we, they are, we're placing incredible challenges on them but they also are making some of the most ultimate sacrifices for our country. Since October 4th, 48 members of the National Guard and Reserve have died in this conflict in Iraq. We also know that we're going to have to continue to rely on them as time goes on. Some of us have been talking about end strength or increasing our regular active service. Well, there was a study that was done that said, well, even if we started today, it would take us five years to ramp up uh, some more uh, service members. And we know that if this war in Iraq goes on, it's not going to be by actives. In fact, we're rotating in National Guardsmen and reservists more and more every day. So if we're relying on our, our National Guardsmen and we're relying on our reservists, What's to keep them from re-upping or continuing to be in that category if financially we're crippling them? And so I think this is a very important issue for us to take up. Um, Mr. Chairman, I need to request that this committee grant the amendment the protections that are required to get it onto the floor. But I think it's a very important amendment to show our, not only our active, but our reservists and our National Guardsmen that we mean business, we want to help them, we want to keep them whole, and that we understand that they and their families are making sacrifices. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gus, you have any questions? No questions, thank you. I want to thank you for your important amendment, and, um, and also, and which I clearly support, and I also want to thank you for uh, your patience in waiting here so long to be able to give your testimony. Thank you, Mr. McGovern. Hastings? Clearly put forward by Ms. Sanchez, and I'm uh, extremely supportive of the amendment and uh, hope that the committee gives her the necessary waiver. Uh, we talk a good game about the National uh, Guard and the Reserve, but when it comes to putting our money where our uh, mouths are, we don't do it well. I'd urge you, Ms. Uh, Sanchez, also to look at the amendment that Mr. Spratt offered. It doesn't cover in detail the way you do, but it covers many of the aspects uh, uh, that I think all of us should be mindful of regarding the National Guard and the Reserve. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Chairman, sure. um, over the next five years, CBO scored this for us, and it would be a total of $162 million. That's less than two-tenths of 1% of the $87 billion request. Two Thank tenths you. of one percent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Holt. Thank you for your patience, too. You've been here a long time. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, I'm pleased to be here to uh, ask your consideration of two amendments. I will probably introduce some other amendments, but I'm advised by the parliamentarian that. Uh, uh, that they will be in order, and I needn't take the, the committee's time, but there are two that I particularly wanted to bring to your attention. Um, as a member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, uh, with the chairman and others, uh, it's become clear to us that our intelligence community is grossly lacking professionals with linguistic skills uh, in critical foreign languages. Uh, the joint uh, inquiry on the 9-11 attacks, as well as the Hart-Rudman report and a number of other reports have called this to our attention. We all know that uh, terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda are operating around the world uh, in countries where there are dozens of different languages spoken. And yet, uh, here in our universities, there are more people studying ancient Greek than are studying Arabic, Korean, Farsi, Pashto, and a number of other languages put together. So we need to do more to make sure that our intelligence community uh, has the language professionals necessary to deal with our national security. Dr. Kay uh, commented when he was presenting his interim report recently that he is hampered uh, by the shortage of skilled linguists. 
Well, there exists and has existed for some time the National Security Education Program uh, within the Department of Defense. It was created in 1991. And despite its clear su success, and I won't go through the, the, the successes it has had, uh, Congress has not appropriated a single new dollar for the NSEP since 1992, despite this uh, apparent, immediate, urgent national need. Um, so, if, uh, uh, so I have an amendment that uh, would uh, put $10 million into this NSEP to expand its national flagship language initiative um, and to provide for uh, students, uh, particularly in science and technology fields, to have uh, intensive language instruction. It's my understanding that this does not need a waiver, that it would be in order, but uh, I uh, wanted to bring that to the committee's attention because I think it fits very much in the, uh, in the spirit uh, as well as in the letter, I think, of, the, uh, of what is intended with this supplemental appropriations. Um, I would also like to draw attention to uh, another matter, and this has been discussed at, uh, at some length already today. Uh, we feel, I think Americans feel, that we need a certain uh, measure of transparency and, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, forthcoming uh, intentions uh, to report to the Congress and the general public about the awarding of contracts uh, for the rebuilding and reconstruction of Iraq uh, and for the support of our troops in this war-torn country. Uh, the, the level of skepticism is so great that there are some, certainly in my district and probably in every district represented here, that, uh, that there are many, too many Americans who believe that there have been sweetheart deals cut and that the contracts will go to, uh, uh, to, to insiders and to, to buddies. Uh, we, we mustn't allow that perception to continue. So uh, my... Uh, uh, amendment, the second amendment that I'm talking about here, would be a straightforward amendment to avoid the perception uh, and any reality of contracts being let on a non-competitive basis. Uh, quite simply, um, it would uh, allow for contracts to be awarded on a non-competitive basis if and only if the President certifies that doing so is in the national security interest of the United States. Uh, I think this balanced approach, this moderate approach, would allow the executive branch to do what is necessary to support our troops and to help with the reconstruction of Iraq. Uh, but it will help, I think, maintain public support for those purposes among American taxpayers by assuring them that their dollars are being spent efficiently. Uh, I ask, I believe uh, this may require a waiver, and should it require a waiver, I ask that uh, from the committee. Uh, there are other questions about the uh, $87 billion that uh, I and others will raise, but at the moment, I, these are the two items that I place before thank the committee. Much. Mr. Goss? No, I, I thank you very much for uh, pointing out the uh, concerns about the uh, language uh, insufficiencies, uh, which we all know I appreciate you bringing attention well, to. Well, and if I, if I may say, Mr. Chair, uh, there is an opportunity to deal with this um, this authorized program exists, uh, and I would argue that this is very appropriate use of the money in, that is uh, spoken of uh, in this $87 billion. Thank you. Uh, uh, to follow on what Ms. Sanchez said, this would be about one hundredth of one percent of, uh, uh, of the amount that we are talking about here. Mr. McGovern. That's it. I support the gentleman's both amendments, and I thank you for being here. Thank you. Mr. Hastings? Mr. Hastings? I have no questions, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to try and finish this before we have to vote. Would all three of you come to the table at one time and, and summarize? <laughs> Mr. Larson, to begin. Well, with. thank you, Mr. Linder. I re uh, request permission to summarize my remarks and uh, introduce whatever extraneous information. And, uh, Without objection. Thank you. I have uh, four amendments, and I'll summarize them uh, 
briefly before the uh, committee. Uh, many of these amendments have been, uh, uh, or proposals similar to these amendments have been discussed before the committee earlier today, but I want to associate myself with the remarks of Mr. McGovern and make a sincere plea uh, that just as we're fighting to provide uh, freedoms for the Iraqi people, I hope that we in Congress are going to be allowed the same kind of democratic freedoms to get our message and take that message to the floor of the House of Representatives and get an up or down vote. And to those ends, I uh, know that my amendments will need a waiver and uh, seek that support uh, from the committee. Four amendments that I am uh, introducing first deal with the practical reality of how we pay uh, for this endeavor. Um, my first amendment uh, addresses the reality that in all likelihood, even though we've heard great testimony about the need for loans and there's been much, much discussion here, my humble estimation, uh, ultimately that probably won't reach the floor. And so therefore I think that it only incumbent that we seek to pay for that $87 billion. The point has been made repeatedly about the need to sacrifice. The only people sacrificing for this country currently are the men and women who wear the uniform. Further burden shouldn't be placed upon them and their children, both incurring more deficit and having uh, this nation uh, pay for this by increasing uh, the already burdensome national debt. I therefore propose that we roll back a percentage of the tax cut, especially the tax cut afforded the nation's wealthiest 1 percent, to allow us to pay for this concern on an ongoing basis. It's straightforward, it's clear, would only mean about 0.7 percent of the Americans would be impacted uh, by this, and even then not really calling upon them to make much of a sacrifice at all. Uh, my Second Amendment uh, deals specifically with dividing this issue as it relates to monies that are going directly to the troops, where it's greatly needed. I had a woman in my district step up the other evening uh, whose son is serving over in Vietnam. She came forward and provided the money herself to get a Kevlar vest for her son over there. That's simply wrong, but many people apparently have done that across this nation as we're some 40,000 vests short. Part of this amendment would call for a reimbursement of those monies to make sure that people who have expended those monies out of pocket themselves to protect their loved ones get reimbursed to, by the government. Further, what this amendment would do is provide accountability and incentives and it would fence off the money that's going for the reconstruction of Iraq and giving it a minimal amount of money first and then having the accounting first in, with regard to troop levels, deployment and rotations, but also very importantly with accountability and whether those be contracts or whether it be the timely reporting basis that this body should demand is entirely appropriate. My uh, third amendment deals with a study by GEO that cuts to the heart of uh, these deployments and the reason that we're there, a whole new policy that has been embarked upon that embraces a new doctrine of preemption and unilateralism needs the in-depth study by this Congress and the extent of which that has had a direct impact on our deployment, on troop readiness, on rotation cycles as well. And as I indicated, uh, Mr. Chairman, my final amendment, which there are copies of that that are coming, uh, deals again specifically with the outlay of capital on behalf of parents and grandparents and loved ones uh, for members in the armed services who lack the appropriate uh, protection that they've needed. And I feel very strongly and hope minimally that the administration and that the committee will take this into consideration and deem it in order. Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can summarize as well. <clears throat> uh, Thank you. I come before you today to speak on behalf of the 130,000 troops that we have in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan at present time, who at some time, hopefully during their service, will be granted R&R, &R, rest and recuperation, return to their families for about 15 days. Mr. Chairman, I filed on October 1st a House Resolution 387, which simply says that we should do the whole job and not just provide partial transportation back to this country, to Baltimore, for example, but all the way home, and our government should pay for that. We have 115 co-sponsors, Republicans and Democrats, on this resolution. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm Including just asking. Me. I'm sorry. Including me. Yes, sir. And I'm just asking that we 
as a Congress support our troops. We talk so much about values and supporting our troops, and we just need to do this. It's the right thing to do. And if this needs an exception, Mr. Chairman, I ask that we grant an exception. In fact, the Senate made an exception last week and voice voted this, and so we should do the same thing here. There are two or three other members who have similar resolutions. Uh, I think we're all working towards the same goal. In fact, our office has been in contact with Mr. Ramstead, who I believe intends to testify this evening or maybe has. But I hope that we can do this and put aside all the partisanship and just support our troops here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Uh, I'm offering an amendment that builds upon the reporting, reporting requirements that are already in the underlying bill. It requires a survey of security and infrastructure needs in Iraq, an estimate of estimated funding levels to meet those needs, and an estimate of troop level projections. The amendment also requires the President's fiscal year 05 budget request and any additional fiscal year 04 supplemental request to reference the quarterly reports required in the bill, explain how the requested funds will meet the needs in the reports, and finally, what budgetary changes will be required. I think everyone in this body was a little surprised by the $87 billion number. This amendment will be a little more forward-thinking in terms of estimating needs, and I think we can do a better job of, of, as members of Congress if this amendment is approved. Thank you for your time. Ms. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment seeks to reduce the uh, appropriation by $532 million. $407 million of those funds will be redirected to domestic accounts. So the amendment would reduce funding for police recruiting and training by $135 million. These funds would be redirected to the Office of Domestic Preparedness for training and recruiting of local law enforcement. $135 million is the difference between the funding levels in the House and the Senate for the ODP in fiscal year 2004. The House has earmarked uh, $3.5 billion for this purpose, and the Senate has $3.63 billion for the same. Uh, it would reduce funding for Iraq Witness Protection Program by $50 million, and uh, the fiscal year four House number for witness security in the United States is $51 million. And so we just feel, I just feel that uh, Iraqi, uh, Iraq spending twice what the United States spends for witness protection is somewhat out of balance. It would also reduce funding for investigating crimes against humanity by 75 million. It would reduce funding for improving sewage services by 272 million and shift this amount to EPA's clean water state revolving funds. The 272 million is the difference between last year's funding level for clean water state revolving funds and the amount appropriated this year by the House. And um, the underlying bill does an extravagant job of funding Iraqis' infrastructure needs. And uh, we have needs that are neglected, so the amendments seek not to neglect the needs, but it also shows comparable needs here in the United States, and I think it would be better use of the taxpayers' dollars. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, do you have any questions for any of the four panelists? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, if I could also uh, offer an amendment uh, on behalf of Mr. Edwards of Texas, who can't be here. It's amendment number 70. Without uh, objection. Uh, it's the Armed Forces Tax Fairness Bill, that, the exact bill that passed the Senate, and it is totally paid for that if we want to help our armed forces, this is one way we could do it right now. And let me just say to all the panelists here that, uh, you know, I, I, I hope that you have an opportunity to be able to offer your amendments on the floor. I think every member every member's voice should be heard on something this important. And uh, you have thoughtful amendments. I apologize that it's, you're coming at the end of all of this, but we can't really discuss it uh, in great detail because of votes. But I appreciate your testimony, and we will certainly work with you to try to get your amendments made in order. Thank you. Ms. Price? No question. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I echo the sentiments of uh, Mr. McGovern, who is agonizing now uh, that the Red Sox are behind. Ms. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not over until it's over. Thank you all very much. The um, hearing portion of this committee action will be terminated, and the committee will be in recess upon the call of chair. Which is likely to be after the vote. Yeah. Yeah. Subject to recall, chair. Subject to the call of chair. <laughs>
While this meeting takes a break, a chance to tell you that House floor debate continues later this morning on that spending bill for Iraq and Afghanistan, including consideration of some of the amendments that you've been watching the Rules Committee consider. The U.S. House is live at 10 Eastern here on C-SPAN. The Senate's also considering its own version of that spending bill. Live coverage at 9.30 a.m. Eastern on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. Now back to that House Rules Committee meeting on the Iraq and Afghanistan spending bill. This final portion's just over a half hour. Committee will come to order. We know that we have uh, a score of uh, seven to six right now, but uh, we're between the seventh and eighth innings. The New York Yankees are leading the uh, no, Boston, Boston Red Sox. I'm sorry, the Boston. Well, I know that was a turnaround. It was, and uh, we, um, in the in the uh, great spirit of bipartisanship, our colleague Ron Lewis has just given me some marvelous pecan thing. So I'd like to begin oh, by offering you. it to, uh, and Louise, one's for you too. And we'll split one between Elsie and Jim, okay? Ice cream. No, you all. Ice cream. After ice cream, I figured we should top it ice off, everybody. And we, we've got a, we've got a Republican canister of them uh, as well, which we are uh, going to uh, provide for everyone. Actually, no, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna share. Porter, one of these is for you. They're very very good. Ron Lewis, uh, I guess, made them and just sent them up to us. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Linder, I see, is not here. I want to, especially in his absence, then I guess thank him for presiding over the uh, hearing, which uh, provided a a wide range of interesting uh, proposals for us. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, this is uh, further consider of HR 3289. And so we'll begin by saying that the chair will be in receipt of a message. Uh, excuse me, a message. I'm not presiding. It's a message, and the message is uh, a motion. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, I move the committee grant HR 3289, the Emergency Supplemental Appropriations Act for Defense and for the reconstruction of Iraq and Afghanistan. An open rule providing one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. Rule waives all points for order against consideration of the bill. The rule waives points for order against provisions in the bill for failure to comply with Clause 2 of Rule 21, prohibiting unauthorized appropriations or legislative provisions in an appropriations bill, except as specified in the resolution. The rule authorizes the chair to accord priority and recognition to members who have pre-printed their amendments in the congressional record. And finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instruction, so move, Mr. Chairman. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Let me just say that um, as we discussed at the outset of the hearing from, with our testimony that came from <laughs> Chairman Young and Mr. Obie, um, and as Mr. Goss has just explained, this is uh, an open rule, which is the standard procedure around which uh, these uh, measures are uh, considered for a supplemental appropriation bill. And we um, hope very much that we'll be able to uh, take this to floor and move expeditiously. Are there any amendments? If not, the vote yes, Mr. Oh. Mr. Frost, do you have an amendment? Oh, I have several. Oh, okay. I have several. And as the chairman knows, this is only technically an open rule because uh, there are a number of amendments that people would like to offer, but uh, those amendments require waivers and they have not been granted by the majority. Um, Mr. Chairman, I do have a question before I offer mm -hmm. the amendments. If I understand correctly, uh, and this has been conveyed to me by staff, and I assume it is entirely accurate, um, that Mr. Lantos can offer his amendment as a limitation. Uh, that is, uh, no funds um, in this bill shall be used as a grant. That, and if that passed, then that would require that they be uh, made as a loan. Uh, that is correct, providing that it does not provide, uh, impose any kind of additional duties on an officer who is overseeing right. it. I mean, it has to comply well, I understand what the with, rules, yeah. yeah, it has to comply with the rules. And based on the, the way Mr. Lantos has drafted it, uh, we understand that he will uh, be able to uh, have it considered. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I move the uh, committee make in order the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Representative Obie and ask that the substitute be given the appropriate waivers. The OB substitute would take $4.6 billion 
from Iraq's reconstruction accounts and put it into U.S. military accounts. The extra military funds would be used to increase the size of the Army by 20,000 troops, improve health care for those called to active duty and for returning reservists, increase family support services for military personnel, and take other steps to enhance the quality of life for U.S. troops and their families. The OB substitute would reduce the reconstruction package to $14 billion, allowing immediate expenditure of half of the funds, but converting the other $7 billion to loans via the World Bank. The funds would be contingent on a match of 50% from our allies. Finally, the OB substitute is completely paid for by returning the tax rate for individuals in the top bracket to the level that existed in January 2001. These individuals would continue to benefit from the rate reductions on income at lower levels and would still receive tax breaks as large or larger than taxpayers at any other income level. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Let me just say that uh, it is a very interesting proposal. However, it does fall within the jurisdiction of the Tax Writing Ways and Means Committee and therefore uh, would not be germane. And uh, Mr. Obi has on seven of the last ten appropriations bills that have been reported out of this committee offered uh, similar language on the, uh, on the uh, tax side, which would, as we all know, impose a, a tremendous tax burden on the small business sector of our economy, which is beginning to emerge and uh, become uh, more vibrant. And so I would urge a no vote on the Frost Mr. Amendment. Mr. Chairman, Mr. of Frost. course, uh, we should uh, have great crocodile te tears for those people making over $300,000 a year, the only ones who would have any change in their uh, Many of whom are small tax. business uh, men and great women. Great crocodile tears for those taxpayers making $300,000 and above. Many of whom are small business men and women. Um, any further discussion? Mr. If, Chairman. Uh, Mr. McGovern. Yeah, you had mentioned that, um, you know, this is a standard rule uh, and this is a standard It's an open rule is what it is. Uh, well, this is not a um, your everyday ordinary standard bill. I mean, the fact of the matter is, right. this is quite an, an extraordinary uh, supplemental. And that's why in offering an open amendment, in offering well, an open right, amendment but, process, but one would hope, given the 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 amount, which is eighty-seven billion dollars, that uh, that you would uh, that there'd be some flexibility. Will we allow an open rule. Well, there'd be some flexibility in allowing members who feel that this should be paid for, that it should be offsets, to be able to offer their amendments. The President announced this package on September 7th. It's now October 15th. Uh, the leadership of this House has done nothing from September 7th to October 15th to even contemplate how you might pay for this bill so it's not thrust on the backs of our kids and our grandkids. I think if you don't want to vote for the um, OB amendment on the floor, then members don't have to vote for it. But for those of us who feel that it's fiscally responsible, to do such, to, to be able to pay for this, I think uh, you know this is such an extraordinary bill that uh, uh, that you should have some more flexibility in the rules. Well, I thank you for that, and you can rest assured we won't be voting for the OB amendment on the floor because we won't be considering the OB amendment on the floor because it's in violation of the rules of the House and falls within the jurisdiction of the Ways and Means Committee. Vote occurs on the motion of the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Frost. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion the chair. Those having those ever. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Goss. No. Mr. Linder. No. Ms. Price. Hastings of Washington? No. Mrs. Meyer? No. Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Reynolds? No. Mr. Frost? Aye. Mrs. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings of Florida? Yes. Mr. Chairman? No. And the clerk will report the total. And the motion is not agreed to. There further amendments. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Frost. I move the committee make and order the amendment offered by Representative Edwards of Texas and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The Edwards Amendment would add the Senate passed version of the Armed Forces Tax Fairness Act to the Iraq Supplemental. These non controversial items, giving capital gains, tax relief to our soldiers, and an above the line deduction for the travel expenses of the National Guard are essential for our nation's military and should be part of any military assistance package. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the Frost Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I'll bring the chair. Roll call, the Mr. Clerk, Chairman. call the roll. Mr. Goss. No. Mr. Linder. No. Ms. Price. No. Mr. Diaz. No. Mr. Hastings of Washington. No. Mrs. Meyer. No. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Reynolds. No. Mr. Frost. Aye. Mrs. Slaughter. Aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. Hastings of Florida. Aye. Chairman. No, and the clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. And the motion is not agreed to. There are further amendments. Mr. Ms. Chairman, Frost. I move the committee make and order the amendment offered by Representative Waxman and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The Waxman amendment would cut $250 million from the supplemental in the area of fuel importation into Iraq. That is the amount that contractors are suspected 
to have overcharged the U.S. government for gasoline importation. For the motion of the gentleman. Any uh, discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the Frost Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those aye. opposed, no. Aye. The chairman knows that. Roll call, Mr. Chairman. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Goss. Mr. Linder. Mr. Bryce. Mr. Diaz Miller. No. Mr. Hastings from Washington. Mrs. Myrick? No. Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Reynolds? No. Mr. Frost? Aye. Mrs. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. The clerk will report the total. Four yeas. And the motion is not agreed to. Before we uh, proceed with the next amendment, I'd just like to, now that Mr. Linder is here, state uh, what I did for the record. And I just want him to hear, just in case he might not have a chance to glance at the record, how much we appreciate his presiding over the uh, very lengthy hearing this afternoon. Are there further amendments? Uh, Mr. Linder gets the Iron Pants Award. For yes, we can, that's basically what I was congratulating him for, and we're very happy to do that. No further amendments? Mr. The, Chairman, oh, I, Mr. I Frost, move the committee make in order the amendment offered by Representative Spratt and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waiver. Uh, the Spratt Amendment would make a number of quality of life improvements for the armed services. Uh, some of these improvements would include a permanent increase in imminent danger pay, an increase in the family separation allowance, and an increase in hardship duty pay. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the Frost Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Pin the chair. The clerk, Chairman. call the roll. Mr. Goss, no. Mr. Linder, no. Ms. Price. Mr. Diaz Miller? No. Mr. Hastings of Washington? No. Mrs. Meyer? Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Reynolds? No. Mr. Frost? Aye. Mrs. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings of Florida? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. The clerk reports the total? Four yeas, nine yeas. And the motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mrs. Slaughter? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the committee make in order the amendment offered by Representative Kirk and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The Kirk Amendment would require the executive branch to inform Congress of no-bid contracts before they are awarded. You've heard the motion of the gentlewoman from uh, Rochester. Any discussion? If not, the I vote occurs. Is, Mr. Uh, Frost. As I said, when uh, Mr. Kirk, a member of your party, appeared before the committee, I think that is an excellent it's amendment. Right. And uh, if I understand correctly, it would even apply to contracts already in place with people like Halliburton and Brown and Root. True. Uh, Thank it is an excellent Let me thank you uh, very much for that and say again that we're uh, considering this bill under an open amendment process and if uh, language could be uh, crafted that would comply with the uh, rules of the House under an open amendment process, certainly would be made in order. Vote occurs on the slaughter amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those aye. opposed, no. I'm the chair. The noes have it. The noes have the motion. Please, Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Goss. No. Mr. Linder. No. Ms. Price. No. Mr. Diaz Valor. No. Mr. Hastings of Washington. No. Mrs. Murray. Session. No. Mr. Reynolds? No. Mr. Frost? Aye. Mr. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings of Florida? Yes. Mr. Chairman? No. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. And the motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mrs. Slaughter? Mr. Chairman, uh, I move the committee make in order the amendment offered by Representative Maloney and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The amendment expresses the sense of Congress that there should be universal suffrage and universal education for males and females. You've heard the motion of the gentlewoman from New York. Uh, any discussion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hastings. Mr. Chairman, I had a very similar mo mo motion dealing with uh, uh, gender uh, subjects. And I, I really, I don't know if, you know, we, we, are, we are understanding the dynamics um, as, as all of us should uh, that Women have a very difficult time in Afghanistan and Iraq and in other uh, uh, parts. And in this instance, uh, Ms. Maloney very clearly pointed out that at the very least, um, uh, have this embedded in uh, uh, the framework of the Constitution. I think it's so important. And uh, it, it, it's not enough that she'll be able to get up tomorrow <laughs> on the five minute rule and say something. Uh, this is something that ought to be a part of the consideration. And I uh, would strongly urge the members uh, to take into consideration what they do to women by voting against this. Ms. Chair. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Price. Ms. Thank, Price, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, I've been working with Ms. Maloney on some of her amendments. And we, um, at this very late hour, have been downstairs talking to the Appropriations Committee. And I think that they're very willing to take a look at this in conference, but they were uh, caught off guard with the nature of it and weren't ready to, 
give the okay today. So we will continue to work together. I think it's uh, mm -hmm. very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just say uh, for the record that uh, many of these amendments that are being offered are amendments which we are supportive of. And I think that the idea of crafting language that would allow Ms. Maloney and Ms. Price to work together in a bipartisan way, we are all very supportive of making sure that the rights of women in Afghanistan are addressed in an appropriate way and uh, in Iraq as well and everywhere in the world, if you want to know the truth, everywhere in the world. And uh, so uh, it's my hope that we'll be able to uh, see this uh, addressed, if, if not directly on the House floor by way of this amendment, in conference, as Ms. Price has said. And I will say that on, on a wide range of these other amendments, I think it's important for us to note that as well, that we're complying with the rules of the House by providing an open amendment process. And I'll say again, if on any of these creative proposals that members are offering, if they can be crafted in language that complies with the open amendment process, which is made in order under this rule, they can be offered. That's why we'll have a full day tomorrow, and many members will be doing Mr. Chairman, that. Yeah. Mr. Hastings. Mr. Mr. Chairman, one very good way we it could do that. I mean, this is the rules right. committee. It would be to make Ms. Maloney's amendment right. in order. Know, so of that course, it could be I understand. That, I understand that. And Ms. Price has just said that she and Ms. Maloney are working with the appropriations committee. They're hoping that they'll be able to address this in conference when it comes back. If it is part of the bill, I can assure you that we will consider it as we do in other conference, uh, other conference reports, and we would provide protection for a provision such as that, which would be considered included in the final bill. Uh, the vote occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from New York. Uh, those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those aye. opposed, no. No. The finisher, the noes have, the noes have, the motion is agreed. There are further amendments. Mr. McGovern. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's interesting. That it, we, I'm glad we have cameras here because this open amendment process, I mean, people who are watching this must be scratching their heads wondering why every amendment that's being proposed is being uh, voted down. The but gentleman would yield. I'll I'd explain. I'd be happy to yield to I the I thank gentleman. my friend for yielding, and I will explain once again, as I think I have, not just uh, for our television audience, but maybe, having said it, members of the Rules Committee don't understand that. We have here an open amendment process, which means that any amendment that complies with the standing rules of the House is made in order and can be, uh, can be considered. By that, I mean limitation amendments, cutting amendments. That is the way it is done through the appropriations process, and we are complying with that. There are a wide range of very creative proposals that, if they can be fashioned within the strictures of the rules of the House, they will be able to be considered and voted on on the House floor. And I thank my friend would for the, yielding. Would the I would yield? be happy to yield to my colleague uh, from Texas. I have in front of me, Mr. Chairman, the description of the rule uh, handed out by the majority staff. And um, under uh, point four, this description says, uh, waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. Under point five, the rule waives points of order against provisions in the bill for failure to comply with clause two of rule 21, prohibiting unauthorized appropriations or legislative provisions in an appropriation bill, except as specified in the resolution. So if I understand correctly, we're waiving all these points of orders for the majority, but we're not waiving any of them for the minority, and that's the point that, let me, let me just, that, uh, if, that uh, Mr. McGovern is trying would to make. Would the gentleman yield? Um, I'm happy to I, yield to the I, uh, I will say that, uh, again, what has happened here is, is, as is traditionally the case, when the Democrats were in the majority, and it's been the case since the Republicans have been in the minority, protection is provided for the measure which was reported out of the committee. That bill enjoyed bipartisan support, the support of Democrats and Republicans, and we know Mr. Frost, in fact, has said that he'll be voting for this bill when it does uh, come to the House floor under this open amendment process. Uh, item 5 mentioned here is a Budget Act waiver, which is also uh, something that is traditionally allowed here. So, Mr. The gentleman, I, I, since the gentleman mentioned my name, um, I just, I just so remember since, you saying at the opening the hearing that you were planning name, to Happy to uh, yield. It's clear that my position is that this bill could be greatly improved if the minority were permitted to offer amendments. And it's quite and possible. There were, and, the, and there will be a number of uh, minority members who will vote for this uh, bill, but it is far from perfect, and it could be much better if the majority would permit the minority to offer amendments And the, on the, the floor. minority is going to be permitted to offer amendments on the floor. We're going to have a full day of amendments being offered on the floor, many of which will come from members of the minority. And, of course, the minority has been systematically denied to offer very key amendments here in the committee tonight. No, no, and, those the, the, are, and those amendments will not be offered the, on the floor. The members of the minority have not been denied anything. We are simply complying with the rules of the House and the standard procedure for consideration of an appropriations bill. Are there further amendments? Except as to the granting waivers to we, the majority. Yeah. We, have, we protect the bill. Right. 
the, report it out in a bipartisan way. And, the, and this committee has the authority under the rules of the House to grant waivers, and it chooses not to. Of course it does. So I mean, we're I, the rules committee. We yeah, do have the authority well, to do that, but we're considering this well, in the same manner in which the well, Democrats. Well, Representative well, Maloney had, had another amendment, which I'd like to. Uh, see whether the committee would make an order. General Given the fact that the amendment. chairman said that we're, we're, we're for protecting the rights of women all over the world, maybe we're for the, protecting the rights of women here in the United States House of Representatives. So I move that the committee make an order the amendment offered by Representative Maloney and that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The Maloney Amendment specifies that $20 million of the $872 million of the Economic Support Fund be used to support programs specifically targeting women and girls in Afghanistan. This amendment further specifies that $47 million be used to support education programs specifically targeting women and girls in Afghanistan. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the McGovern Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those aye. opposed, no. I'm the chair. The noes have it. The noes have it. The motion is agreed Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Linder. Mr. Price. Mr. Diaz-Guard. Mr. Diaz-Guard. Mr. Hastings of Washington. No. Mrs. Meyer. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Reynolds. No. Mr. Ross? Aye. Mrs. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings of Florida? Aye. <coughs> Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. The clerk report the total. <coughs> Four yeas, nine nays. The motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Absolutely. Mr. McGovern. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, move that the committee make an order the amendment offered by Representative Manzullo and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The Manzullo Amendment would require that monies for Iraq relief and reconstruction be spent to the greatest extent possible for U.S. raw materials and manufactured goods and for services provided by U.S. labor. Requires a report to Congress of how the monies were spent uh, due 60 days after passage and every 60 days thereafter until appropriation is expended. Thank you for that. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the McGovern Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I pin the chair. The uh, noes have it. The noes have it. The I ask for a roll call. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Goss? Mr. Linder? Ms. Price? No. Mr. diaz Bullard? No. Mr. Hastings of Washington? No. Ms. Meyer? No. Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Reynolds? No. Mr. Frost? Aye. Mrs. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings of Florida? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Clerk, report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. And the motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. McGovern. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee make and order the amendment offered by Representative Shays and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. This amendment would re require a quarterly GAO report on reconstruction uh, efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan in an attempt to try to get some straight answers uh, since we're not getting them from the administration. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Any uh, discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the McGovern Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. I'm pin the chair. The noes have it. The noes have it. The motion is agreed to. There further amendments. Oh, clerk, call the roll. Mr. Goss? No. Mr. Linder? No. Mr. Price? No. Mr. Diaz Blair? No. Mr. Hastings of Washington? No. Ms. Meyer? No. Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Reynolds? No. Mr. Frost? Aye. Mrs. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings? Aye. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hastings of Florida, did you get his record? I heard an aye. He said Mr. Hastings of Florida voted aye. Aye. I just want to make sure this conversation right now. Did you check the house and vote? I don't know. The clerk will report the total. And the motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. McGovern. I move that the committee make an order the amendment offered by Representative DeFazio and Representative Emanuel and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The amendment would require that the dollars appropriated for Iraq be matched by an equal number of dollars spent on infrastructure and social services here at home. And the rationale for this amendment is uh, based on the fact that a lot of us, when we go home and talk to our constituents, they're wondering why we're not adequately funding education and health care and infrastructure and roads and bridges, but we seem to have unlimited monies for Iraq, so I would urge a yes vote on this. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Any uh, discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the McGovern Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, aye. no. I'm pin the chair. The noes have it. The I ask for a roll call, Mr. Chair. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Goss? No. Mr. Linder? No. Mr. Price? No. Mr. Diaz-Miller? No. Mr. Hastings of Washington? No. Mrs. Meyer? No. Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Reynolds? No. Frost? Aye. Mrs. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings of Florida? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. And the clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. And the motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Yes. 
Mr. Chairman, I Mr. have. Mr. McGovern. I move that the committee make an order the amendment offered by Representative Brown of Ohio and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The Brown Amendment would ban corporate expatriates from receiving any contracts <coughs> for the reconstruction of Iraq. And um, by, by way of discussion, I would simply say that, you know, uh, I think most Americans would be outraged if they thought that uh, companies that uh, open up P.O. boxes in Bermuda to escape paying U.S. taxes would benefit from U.S. defense contracts or any other contracts uh, uh, with regard to this war in Iraq and the reconstruction of Iraq. And I would urge uh, my colleagues to make the Brown Amendment in, uh, in order. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Any uh, discussion? Yes, Mrs. Mr. Slaughter. Mr. Chairman, I would. I, I am following along what Mr. McGovern said. I think the people in America are pretty upset that some of the companies building the visitor center out here fall under that same category of people whose address of the United States is a post office box. It sure okay. offends me. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Any further discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the McGovern Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those aye, opposed, aye. no. Pin the chair. The no's have it. Those have roll call, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Goss? No. Mr. Linder? No. Mr. Price? No. Mr. Diaz-Lar? No. Mr. Hastings of Washington? No. Mrs. Meyer? No. Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Reynolds? No. Mr. Frost? No. Aye. Mr. Slater? No. Mr. Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings of Florida? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. And the clerk reports total. Four yeas, nine nays. And the motion is not agreed to, Mr. Mr. Frost. Um, I understand that the uh, majority has a, a, a substitute rule that it wishes to offer uh, with a minor change to reflect uh, right. uh, an objection, an objection from a committee chairman. For us to consider while we oppose the rule on merits, we certainly have no objection to your offering the substitute rule at this time. Well, thank you very much, and we clearly will do that. Before I do that, I think it's important to Mr. note... Mr. Chairman, I have not had an opportunity to offer oh, yeah. amendments. Oh, I, I and we're certainly looking forward to that. Yes. I, don't worry. I mean, I will mm -hmm. assure my friend that I would always Not a problem. His I rights. thought you were just moving ahead. I just, I to make well, sure. we are moving ahead with something very important. As I sit here uh, under the portrait of Mr. Moakley, I think <laughs> that at the top of the ninth inning, it's important to report that the score is 7-6. to six. The Boston Red Sox are leading the New York Yankees. <laughs> and so... Um, and how do you had, think Gerald Solomon would take that? Sir, uh, I don't know that Solomon. I don't know that Solomon was a Yankee fan. I mean, maybe he was a what was he a Glens Falls? Was there a baseball team in Glens Falls? I, I didn't uh, remember that. A hockey team, hockey team in Glens Falls. Thank you, Celeste. Mr. Chairman, would you like me to make this motion? Or? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we were going to wait until the end of consideration of this. We were going to wait until the end of consideration of That's it, but uh, Mr. Frost would like us to proceed with it right now, and so you know what? Let's proceed with it right now. The chair will be in receipt of a motion from the gentleman from Atlanta. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee the amend the rule to expose the following sections to a point of order for violating Clause 2 of Rule 21, which prohibits author unauthorized appropriations or leg legislative provisions in the Appropriations Bill, Sections 3005 and 3006. You've heard the uh, motion of the gentleman, and uh, let me just explain that, as you know, under our protocol, what we've done is a letter has been received by the chairman of the Judiciary Committee uh, raising an objection to a provision that's included in the bill, and for that reason, we will actually be uh, striking that provision. But the amendments that have been offered clearly will apply to this rule as well. So are there further amendments? Mr. Hastings. Mr. Chairman, about that then. Oh, the I, I suppose we should vote on that. <laughs> yeah. Question is on the motion of the gentleman from Atlanta. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. I'm pretty sure the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. So, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Hastings. Mr. Sensen Brenner's letter then is a, uh, an official part of the record. Or should we? You just made it that without objection. Uh, Mr. Hastings consent. is submitting Mr. Uh, right. Sensen Brenner's uh, letter explaining just his objection as part the of the majority, record. Mr. Chairman, Very so kind of you, Mr. Hastings. Right. You have no idea how much we appreciate that, and Mr. Mr. Sensen Brenner, I'm, I know, will appreciate uh, it as well. I would now like to make amendments to the uh, now approved uh, substitute amendment. Uh, um, um, rule uh, measure. Uh, with that, um, I move the committee make in order the amendment offered by Representative Sanchez and ask uh, that her amendment be given the appropriate waivers. Ms. Sanchez's amendment uh, would provide compensation to members of the reserve components who suffer discrepancies between their military and non-military compensation as a result of being ordered to serve on active duty for a period of more than 30 days. Now, Mr. Chairman, by way of discussion, very briefly, um, uh, uh, Ms. Sanchez was very clear in what she offered. Most of us have constituents that we have spoken with uh, that have been called up um, uh, uh, and have, have been in Iraq now 
way more than six months. Uh, I, the, the longest standing that I know um, is one that was in Iraq 15 months, a young man that uh, died in Mr. Meek's district uh, a lot, week before last, and uh, he had been there uh, 15 months. Uh, that said, um, we shouldn't be asking uh, our people uh, uh, to suffer uh, discrepancies when we ask them uh, to leave their small businesses and their jobs. So I thought this amendment, uh, I don't understand all of the uh, uh, technicalities. She'll be able to present it, then it will, it will be made out of order, and um, again, people will be in Iraq longer than six months and suffer discrepancies uh, when they come home with, re with reference uh, to compensation. We ought to be able to do better. Well, you've heard the motion of the gentleman. Let me say again, we're very sympathetic with this, and if it could be crafted in such a way that it would be able to comply with the rules of the House under the open amendment process, um, I think that, uh, you know, it would be certainly fine and worthy of consideration. Yeah. Maybe she'll be able to fashion in That's such a way. That's awful language, this, Mr. Chairman, but it doesn't I, satisfy my I, requirements. I, uh, I, I understand. If we had a closed uh, rule, would it be in order? Um, you've heard, uh, did, did, did the gentleman ask Mr. Hastings oh, to yield? Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, does the gentleman have a question that you'd like to make? No, that's all right. Okay. Uh, the uh, vote occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings. Those in favor will say aye. Those aye. opposed, no. I'm putting the chair the nose have it, the nose have it. The chairman, I have one other amendment. I'm not asking gentleman, for a vote on that one, although gentleman I think from it's, Florida. It's, gentleman it's from particularly Florida. important. I move the committee make in order the amendment offered by Representative Harmon and ask uh, that her amendment be given the appropriate waivers. Um, uh, the Harmon Amendment would limit the further obligation of funds until the President uh, has submitted a five-year wartime budget. I don't know how much more clear um, uh, it could be uh, for us to undertake our, our responsibilities. If we keep doing this by supplement, um, we really are making ourselves little bitty rubber stamps around here, and we aren't giving uh, true impetus uh, to our requirements with reference uh, to the budget especially in wartime, where the War Powers Act, for whatever it is or was, um, has been substantially uh, uh, dissed uh, by previous administrations uh, and this one. I think we are heading um, in a very bad way, and Ms. Harmon has tried to bring, I thought, or some bipartisan reason uh, to the matter. This one, Mr. Chairman, I would ask for. You have uh, heard the motion of the gentleman. Let me just respond by saying that, uh, as you know from the testimony that we had from Chairman Young, uh, when we began at 2 o'clock this afternoon, was very clear that major modifications have been made by the Appropriations Committee in consideration of this supplemental. And tomorrow, with the open amendment process that we'll have on the floor, it's quite possible that other modifications might be made in order because we're expecting a very full day on that. Mr. McGovern. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I too would uh, urge some of uh, my colleagues to consider voting for this amendment. Uh, 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 when, when Ms. Harmer was up here, I mean, basically what she pleaded for is that um, we kind of define a strategy and we define what we're up against and what we should expect in terms of cost and in terms of, uh, and in terms of what, what our plan is. Um, when the uh, chairman of the Appropriations Committee testified here, here this, this, after, this morning, Mr. Hastings asked him a question about the $79 billion that we had previously appropriated and asked him point blank whether he knew um, how that money was spent, whether all that money is accounted for. And he said very frankly, no. And it seems to me that based on that answer, um, we need to kind of take a step back and make sure that we're doing this right. Yeah. Ms. Ms. Harmon supported uh, the resolution authorizing war in Iraq. I oppose it, but I think whether you support it or, or oppose the war, I think this, this is a common sense measure that could give comfort to, to uh, members on both sides of the aisle that we're actually proceeding cautiously and wisely and carefully. I thank my uh, friend for his uh, contribution. And while we will, um, I don't believe he's making this amendment in order, um, it is important to note that the, uh, the Boston Red Sox are now ahead 9 to 6 uh, in the uh, ninth inning. There's some so good news tonight. I would urge a, exactly. I would urge a no vote on the Hastings Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those aye. opposed, aye. no. Pin the chair, the no's have it. I ask for a roll call. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Dawson. Mr. Pender. No. Mr. Price. No. Mr. Diaz-Bullard. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Sessions. Yeah. No. Mr. Reynolds. No. Report total. Four yeas, nine yeas. And the motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? If not, the vote occurs on the motion of the uh, gentleman from Sanibel. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. Bring no. the chair. The ayes have it. Ayes have it.
You all want a roll call? Absolutely. Clerk, call the roll. On a, a roll call, you're going to vote no on an open amendment for roll call. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm just trying to figure out why. Clerk, call the roll. This is like California, no debate. Yes. Mr. Linder. Aye. Mr. Bryson. Aye. Mr. Diaz Miller. Yes. Mr. Hastings of Washington. Aye. Ms. Meyer. Aye. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Mr. Reynolds. Aye. Mr. Frost. No. Mrs. Slaughter. No. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings of Florida. No. Mr. Chairman. Aye. And the clerk will report the total. Nine yeas. And the motion is agreed to, and this will be handled on the floor tomorrow morning by the gentleman from Pasco, Mr. Hastings, for the majority. And I'll be handling it. And Mr. Frost for the minority. Thank you all very much. That'll complete our uh, work for this week. And Mr. Hope Mr. Everyone... we're going to get this urgent matter to the floor of the house. Absolutely, right? we're going to move to the floor just as expeditiously as possible to make sure we take care of our troops. Good work by the rules committee. Can you explain Now an update on the $87 billion spending request for Iraq and Afghanistan from a Capitol Hill reporter. Stephen Dynan of the Washington Times, as Congress takes up the supplemental, how's the debate going? Let's start with the House. The House is, uh, is in the middle of his debate.